Before we get going on the next course, I want to say a big congratulations. You've made it all the way to the final course of this program. It's been quite a journey, but look at the progress you've made. You've learned all the fundamentals of IT. We're now at the last course, the one that will round out your foundational knowledge. I'm talking about security. Without it, all of the processes you've learned so far can fail, and no IT gal or guy wants that. Before we dive in, I'd like to reintroduce myself. We met way back when in the first course when we talked about the history of the internet and the internet of things. My name is Gian Spacuza, and I'm a program manager in Android security. I help protect Android's 2 billion plus devices by managing and driving new security features for each Android dessert release or versions of Android. As early as I can remember, I've loved technology. I've worked in IT since I was 16 years old, and I'd fill my time reading books about new tech and building servers from old computer parts down in my parents' basement. I was never a very good test taker, and my grades definitely reflected that. But I didn't let it stop me from pursuing my career. I worked as the one-person IT crew for three nonprofits while I was getting my education. It was really stressful being responsible for everything from configuring and administrating databases to showing new employees how to access email and internal tools. Now, looking back, this experience was invaluable. And of course, security was an essential part of my IT work. Now, I work directly with hardware manufacturers, app developers, and engineering teams within Google to create the most secure experiences for our users. For many of them, their cell phone is the only connection they have to the internet. And I feel such a sense of fulfillment knowing that my work can have a major impact on people all over the world who rely so heavily on their devices. To be successful at cybersecurity, sometimes you need to put yourself in the mindset of an attacker and always be one step ahead. So are you ready to do good by thinking bad? Let's jump right in. In this module, you're going to be learning all about security, how people attack it, and how to defend against these attacks. By the end of the module, you'll be able to define and recognize security risks, vulnerabilities, and threats. You'll also be able to identify the most common security attacks. And finally, you'll understand how security revolves around the CIA principle and what the CIA principle is. When you think of security, what's the first thing you think of? It's probably physical security. Stuff like making sure your belongings are safe from potential thieves, locking your front doors at night, and putting your valuables in a safe place. In today's digital world, your money isn't just in your wallet. Your cash is also stored inside online bank accounts, accessible with the right password. Some of us don't carry credit cards at all, and those who do don't just have them in their wallets. They're stored on their favorite websites so that they can make purchases more easily. It's not just money we care about. Most of our entire personal world lives on mobile phones. Our text messages, photos, personal data, application logins, and more are all kept right inside the devices we have in our pockets. Unfortunately, we live in a world where there are people and organizations that try to steal data from companies, from governments, and even from people like you and me. Don't let movies warp your perception of these digital thieves. They aren't as glamorous or professional as you may think. Digital thieves don't have a team of hackers in dark hoodies furiously typing into computer terminals all day, hoping to break into multi-billion dollar companies. That's not to say that it doesn't happen, because we all know it does. But most of the time, the average internet attacker is someone who looks just like you or me, a regular person who happened to stumble upon a hole in your security system, and then took advantage of it. It could have been something as simple as figuring out that you use your dog's name as your password. When the only thing securing your bank account is the word FIDO, you're in trouble. But just like we have physical security alarms to deter potential burglars, we also have many methods to prevent our digital security from being compromised. By the end of this course, you'll gain a deeper understanding of computer security. You'll learn how to prevent the most commonly used computer attacks. You'll understand the various security protocols and mechanisms that we use on our machines, in the web, and on our networks. You'll also learn more about cryptography, authentication, and access mechanisms, which are important skills for any IT support specialist. We'll wrap up the course by giving you the necessary tools to assess the security of an organization and decide on the best security preventative measures. Today, just about every business or industry relies heavily on technology to conduct day-to-day -day business. Can you imagine a company, large or small, operating without email, without functional computers or internet access? Take the case of a small company. It needs some technology if it wants to be able to access credit cards. 
Recent attacks like the WannaCry crypto worm and large-scale attacks using the Mirai botnet highlight the scope and scale of how security affects us all. It's something we need to take seriously. Because of our widespread dependence on technology, digital security is more important than ever before, and it's going to continue to have a growing impact on all industries and aspects of our lives. So let's make sure you're armed with the right tools to keep yourself and your future clients safe. Throughout this course, there will be one key acronym to keep in mind, the CIA. No, I'm not talking about the US Central Intelligence Agency, although they do have a lot to do with national security. When I say CIA, I'm talking about confidentiality, integrity, and availability. These three key principles are the foundation for what's widely referred to as the CIA triad, a guiding model for designing information security policies. These three principles will help you develop security policies in the workplace and for your own personal environments. Let's start with confidentiality. Confidentiality means keeping things hidden. In IT, it means keeping the data that you have hidden safely from unwanted eyes. One particular method of confidentiality that you probably use every day is password protection. Only you, maybe your partner, should know the password to gain access to your bank account online. For confidentiality to work, you need to limit access to your data. Only those who absolutely need to know how to gain access should. The I in CIA stands for integrity. Integrity means keeping our data accurate and untampered with. The data that we send or receive should remain the same throughout its entire journey. Imagine if you downloaded a file off the internet, and the website you're downloading it from says the file is 3 megs. Then, when you download it, it turns out to be about 30 megs. That's a red flag. Something happened during the download, something potentially unsafe. An unwanted file may now be living on your hard drive. As you'll learn in a later lesson, this happens all too often. Last but not least, let's look at the A in CIA, which stands for availability. Availability means that the information we have is readily accessible to those people that should have it. This could mean many things, like being prepared if your data is lost or if your system is down. Security attacks are designed to steal all kinds of things from you. Time, material things, your dignity. Some steal the time that you'll need to spend to get services back up and running. Some security attacks will hold your system hostage until you pay a ransom for it. Sounds scary, and it is, but that's why you're here, to learn how to stop these types of attacks from happening. Going through this course, you'll see how every aspect of security revolves around these three key principles, confidentiality, integrity, and availability. Before we dive into things like bringing down digital thieves, let's get some of the terminology out of the way. We'll be using these terms throughout the entire course, so you should know them inside and out before we get started. The first one is risk, the possibility of suffering a loss in the event of an attack on the system. Let's say that you buy a new phone. One security measure you can take to protect your device is to set up a screen lock using a password or pattern that you add to prevent others from accessing your info. A screen lock is a security feature that helps prevent unwanted access by creating an action you have to do to gain entry. If you choose not to add a screen lock to your phone, the risk that you take is that someone could easily gain access to your phone and steal your data. Even adding something as simple as a passcode or a screen lock can help you protect your personal or company data from getting into the wrong hands. Next up is the term vulnerability, a flaw in the system that could be exploited to compromise the system. Vulnerabilities can be holes that you may or may not be aware of. Maybe you go away for a long vacation and lock every door and window in your house before you leave, but you forget to lock the bathroom window. That bathroom window is now a vulnerability that burglars can use to break into your house. Another example is when you're writing a web app and enable a debug account for testing during development, but forget to disable it before launching the app. You now have a vulnerability in your app that an attacker can potentially discover. There's a special type of vulnerability called a zero-day vulnerability, or zero-day for short, which is a vulnerability that is not known to the software developer or vendor, but is known to an attacker. The name refers to the amount of time the software vendor has had to react to and to fix the vulnerability, zero days. 
Another key term is exploit, software that is used to take advantage of a security bug or vulnerability. Attackers will write up exploits for vulnerabilities they find in software to cause harm to the system. Let's say an attacker discovers a zero-day vulnerability. She decides to take advantage of the previously unknown bug and writes a zero-day exploit code. That code will specifically target and take advantage of this unknown bug to gain access and cause damage to systems. Not cool. The next term to know is threat, the possibility of danger that could exploit a vulnerability. Threats are just possible attackers, sort of like burglars. Not all burglars will attempt to break into your home to steal your most prized possessions, but they could, and so they're considered threats. Next up, hacker. A hacker in the security world is someone who attempts to break into or exploit a system. Most of us associate hackers with malicious figures, but there are actually two common types of hackers. You have black hat hackers who try to get into systems to do something malicious. There are also white hat hackers who attempt to find weaknesses in a system, but also alert the owners of those systems so that they can fix it before someone else does something malicious. While there are other types of hackers, these are the two main ones and the most important for us to understand right now. The last term to know is attack, which is an actual attempt at causing harm to a system. It's super important to be aware of possible threats and vulnerabilities to your system so that you can better prepare for them. The sad reality is that there will always be attacks on your system, but before you start searching for an underground bunker to spend the rest of your days in, remember that there are ways that you can detect and mitigate attacks, and we're here to help you learn how to do just that. In this module, we'll be talking about some of the common attacks you'll encounter at home and in the workplace. Throughout the course, you'll learn how to harden your systems against these attacks. Turns out there are hundreds of ways that your system can be attacked, but there are also hundreds of ways that you can prevent them. We won't talk about all of them, but we will cover the major ones. So abandon the bunker idea and prepare to dive in, because things are about to get real, real secure. Malware is a type of malicious software that can be used to obtain your sensitive information or delete or modify files. Basically, it can be used for any and all unwanted purposes. The most common types of malware you'll see are viruses, worms, adware, spyware, trojans, rootkits, backdoors, botnets. Oh my, I know, I know, it's a long list. But we'll go into detail about each of these and even learn about some real life cases. But for now, let's talk about the most common forms of malware. Viruses are the best known type of malware and they work the same way that viruses in your body work. When you get sick, a virus attaches itself to a healthy cell in your body, then replicates itself and spreads to other healthy cells in your body until bam, you're sneezing and wheezing and you're a mess. In a computer virus, the virus attaches itself to some sort of executable code like a program. When the program is running, it touches many files, each of which is now susceptible to being infected with the virus. So the virus replicates itself on these files, does the malicious work it's intended to do, and repeats this over and over until it spreads as far as it can. Scary, right? Well, hold on tight, we're just getting started. Worms are similar to viruses, except that instead of having to attach themselves onto something to spread, worms can live on their own and spread through channels like the network. One case of a famous computer worm was the I love you or love bug, which spread to millions of Windows machines. The worm was spread via email, Someone would email a message with the subject line of, I love you, and an attachment that was actually the worm disguised as a love letter text file. The text file was actually an executable file that, when opened, would execute many attacks like copying itself to several files and folders, launching other malicious software, replacing files, and then hiding itself after it was done. The worm spread by stealing email addresses that were in the victim's computer and chat clients. It then proceeded to send that email out to everyone in the address book. The love bug spread across the world and caused billions of dollars in damage. Not so lovely? This was just one of the many reasons why you should never open email attachments that you do not recognize. Adware is one of the most visible forms of malware that you'll encounter. Most of us see it every day. Adware is just software that displays advertisements and collects data. Sometimes we legitimately download adware, 
That happens when you agree to the terms of service that allows you to use free software in exchange for showing you advertisements. Other times, it may get installed without your consent and may do other malicious things than just display advertisements. In Greek mythology, there's a famous tale of the evasion of the city of Troy. The Greeks, who had been trying to gain access into the walled city, finally decided to hide themselves in a giant wooden statue of a horse under the guise of a gift. The Trojans allowed the gift inside, then, in the dead of night, the Greeks broke out of the statue and attacked the city. In computer security, we have malware that functions like a Trojan horse, and it's named after this exact thing. A Trojan is malware that disguises itself as one thing but does something else. Just like how the historical Trojan horse was accepted into the city by the citizens of Troy, a computer Trojan has to be accepted by the user, meaning the program has to be executed by the user. No one would willingly install malware on their machine. That's why Trojans are meant to entice you to install them by disguising themselves as other software. Spyware is a type of malware that's meant to spy on you, which could mean monitoring your computer screens, key presses, webcams, and then reporting or streaming all this information to another party. It's not good. A keylogger is a common type of spyware that's used to record every keystroke you make. It can capture all of the messages you type, your confidential information, your passwords, and even more. Ransomware is a type of attack that holds your data or system hostage until you pay some sort of ransom. Remember the availability principle we learned about in the first video? Does this attack sound like a way to decrease the availability of our security? Bingo. That's because it is. A recent case of ransomware was the WannaCry ransomware attack in May of 2017. The malware took advantage of a vulnerability in older Windows systems, infecting hundreds of thousands of machines across the world. Most notably, the attack shut down the systems for the National Health Services in England, causing a health-related crisis. The WannaCry ransomware attack devastated systems around the world. These types of attacks are becoming more common, and we need to be ready to fight them. So let's soldier on. Let's pick up where we left off, with malware. So far, we've covered some of the major types of malware that can be found on a system, including malware, viruses, worms, adware, spyware, and ransomware. What if our attackers could not only do malicious things like steal our data, but they could also steal our computer's resources, like the CPU? Well, I'm sorry to tell you that actually exists. There is malware out there that can utilize someone else's machine to perform a task that is centrally controlled by the attacker. These compromised machines are known as bots. If there are a collection of one or more bots, we call that network of devices a botnet. Botnets are designed to utilize the power of the internet-connected machines to perform some distributed function. Take mining Bitcoin, for example. Mining Bitcoin requires a machine to perform some computation that takes up your machine's resources. At the end, you may be rewarded with some amount of Bitcoin. A popular attack has been creating botnets to do stuff like mine Bitcoins. So instead of having one computer run computations, attackers can now have a thousand computers running computations and raking in more and more Bitcoin. A backdoor is a way to get into a system if the other methods to get in a system aren't allowed. It's a secret entryway for attackers. Backdoors are most commonly installed after an attacker has gained access to your system and wants to maintain that access. Even if you discovered your system has been compromised, you may not realize that a backdoor to your system exists. If it does, you need to lock it up before more damage can be done. Another form of malware that can be particularly problematic is a rootkit. A rootkit, by its name, is a kit for root meaning a collection of software or tools that an admin would use. It allows admin level modification to an operating system. A rootkit can be hard to detect because it can hide itself from the system using the system itself. Sneaky little sucker. The rootkit can be running lots of malicious processes, but at the same time, those processes wouldn't show up in Task Manager because it can hide its own presence. A logic bomb is a type of malware that's intentionally installed after a certain event or time has triggered, it will run the malicious program. There's a popular logic bomb case that happened in 2006, where an unhappy systems administrator at a bank 
set off a logic bomb and brought down a company's services in an attempt to drop their stock prices. The former employee was caught and charged with fraud, then sentenced to eight years in prison. Not the most logical logic bomb. A network attack that is simple in concept but can cause a lot of damage is a DNS cache poisoning attack. You probably remember from the bits and bytes of computer networking course that DNS works by getting information about IP addresses and names to make it easier for you to find a website. A DNS cache poisoning attack works by tricking a DNS server into accepting a fake DNS record that will point you to a compromised DNS server. It then feeds you fake DNS addresses when you try to access legitimate websites. Not only that, DNS cache poisoning can spread to other networks too. If other DNS servers are getting their DNS information from a compromised server, they'll serve those bad DNS entries to other hosts. Several years ago, there was a large-scale DNS cache poisoning attack in Brazil. It appeared that attackers managed to poison the DNS cache of some local ISPs by inserting fake DNS records for various popular websites like Google, Gmail, or Hotmail. When someone attempted to visit one of those sites, they were served a fake DNS record and were sent to a server that the attacker controlled, which hosted a small Java applet. The user would then be tricked into installing the applet, which was actually a malicious banking trojan designed to steal banking credentials. This is an example of the real-world damage DNS cache poisoning attacks can pose. You can learn more about it in the next supplementary reading. A man-in-the-middle attack is an attack that places the attacker in the middle of two hosts that think they're communicating directly with each other. It's clearly a name that needs some updating. Men aren't the only hackers out there. The attack will monitor the information going to and from these hosts and potentially modify it in transit. A common man-in-the-middle attack is a session hijacking or cookie hijacking. Let's say you log into a website and forget to log out. Now, you've already authenticated yourself to the website and generated a session token that grants you access to that website. If someone was performing a session hijacking, they could steal that token and impersonate you on the website. And no one wants that. This is another reason to think about the CIAs of security. You always want to make sure that the data that you are sending or receiving has integrity and isn't being tampered with. Another way a man-in-the-middle attack can be established is a rogue access point attack. A rogue AP is an access point that is installed on the network without the network administrator's knowledge. Sometimes, in corporate environments, someone may plug a router into their corporate network to create a simple wireless network. Innocent enough, right? Wrong. This can actually be pretty dangerous and could grant unauthorized access to an otherwise secure network. Instead of an attacker having to gain access to a network by plugging directly into a network port, they can just stand outside the building and hop onto this wireless network. A final man-in-the-middle method we'll cover is called an evil twin. It's similar to the rogue AP example, but has a small but important difference. The premise of an evil twin attack is for you to connect to a network that is identical to yours. This identical network is our network's evil twin and is controlled by our attacker. Once we connect to it, they will be able to monitor our traffic. I wonder if Fred Weasley ever did this to George. Probably not. They were wizards. They could just magic their way out of problems. Must be nice. A denial of service, or DOS attack, is an attack that tries to prevent access to a service for legitimate users by overwhelming the network or server. Think about how you normally get on a website. Most major websites are capable of serving millions of users. But for this example, imagine you have a website that could only serve 10 users. If someone was performing a denial of service attack, they would just take up all 10 of those spots and legitimate users would have been denied the service because there's no more room for them. Now apply that to a website like Google or Facebook. DOS attacks try to take up those resources of a service and prevent real users from accessing it. Not a pretty picture. The ping of death, or pod, is a pretty simple example of a DOS attack. It works by sending a malformed ping to a computer. The ping would be larger in size than what the internet protocol was made to handle, 
so it results in a buffer overflow. This can cause the system to crash and potentially allow the execution of malicious code. Another example is a ping flood, which sends tons of ping packets to a system. More specifically, it sends ICMP echo requests, since a ping expects an equal number of ICMP echo replies. If a computer can't keep up with this, then it's prone to being overwhelmed and taken down. Not cool, ping flood. Not cool. Similar to a ping flood is a SYN flood. Remember that to make a TCP connection, a client sends a SYN packet to a server it wants to connect to. Next, the server sends back a SYN ACK message. Then the client sends an ACK message. In a SYN flood, the server is being bombarded with these SYN packets. The server is sending back SYN ACK packets, but the attacker is not sending ACK messages. This means that the connection stays open and is taking up the server's resources. Other users will be unable to connect to the server, which is a big problem. Since the TCP connection is half open, we also refer to SYN floods as half open attacks. Sounds messy, right? It is. The DOS attacks we've learned about so far only use a single machine to carry out an attack. But what if attackers could utilize multiple machines? A much scarier scenario. They'd be able to take down services in greater volumes and even quicker rates. Even scarier, attackers can absolutely do that. A DOS attack using multiple systems is called a distributed denial of service attack, or DDoS. DDoS attacks need a large volume of systems to carry out an attack, and they're usually helped by botnet attackers. In that scenario, they can gain access to large volumes of machines to perform an attack. In October of 2016, a DDoS attack occurred when the DNS service provider Dyn was the target of a DDoS. Fake DNS lookup requests, along with SYN floods that botnets were performing, overloaded their system. Dyn handled the DNS for major websites like Reddit, GitHub, Twitter, etc. So once it went down, it also took down its customers, making those services inaccessible. Don't get between people on their Reddit threads or Twitter feeds. I know from experience, it's not pretty. We've talked a lot about security attacks that target victims directly, but they aren't the only type of attacks that occur in the web. One day, you may find yourself in software development or software engineering, and you'll need to know about these other types of attacks in order to ensure the security of your work. A common security exploit that can occur in software development and runs rampant on the web is the possibility for an attacker to inject malicious code. We refer to these types of attacks as injection attacks. So how do injection attacks work? Great question. For simplicity's sake, we won't get into the details of the code implementation, but imagine a car. You keep your car running by putting gas in it. Now, consider someone who wants to do something malicious to that car. That person could inject your gas tank with a strawberry banana milkshake. While that may sound delicious, it could also ruin your car. So how do you fight against that? A hypothetical method to prevent this is adding a mechanism to your car that only accepts gasoline and no other liquids. Injection attacks in websites work the exact same way, except without the mouth-watering strawberry banana milkshakes and without having overly complex solutions. Injection attacks can be mitigated with good software development principles, like validating input and sanitizing data. Is anyone else getting hungry? Milkshake break? No? OK, we'll move on. Cross-site scripting, or XSS attacks, are a type of injection attack where the attacker can insert malicious code and target the user of the service. XSS attacks are a common method to achieve a session hijacking. It would be as simple as embedding a malicious script in a website and the user unknowingly executes the script in their browser. The script could then do malicious things, like steal a victim's cookies and have access to a login to a website. Mmm, cookies. Another type of injection attack is a SQL, or SQL, injection attack. Unlike an XSS that targets a user, a SQL injection attack targets the entire website if the website is using a SQL database. Attackers can potentially run SQL commands that allow them to delete website data, copy it, and run other malicious commands. Now that that's out of the way, it's snack time. There's no getting around it. 
Passwords are the most secure, common safeguards we have to prevent unauthorized account access. Unfortunately, our passwords may not be as secure or strong as they should be. A common attack that occurs to gain access to an account is a password attack. Password attacks utilize software like password crackers that try and guess your password. And they work extremely well, so don't try to reuse that FIDO password. It didn't secure your bank account, and it's not going to work here. OK, moving on. A common password attack is a brute force attack, which just continuously tries different combinations of characters and letters until it gets access. Since this attack requires testing a lot of combinations of passwords, it usually takes a while to do this. Have you ever seen a CAPTCHA when logging into a website? CAPTCHAs are used to distinguish a real human from a machine. They ask things like, are you human? Or are you a robot? Or are you a dancer? In a password attack, if you didn't have a CAPTCHA available, an automated system could just keep trying to log into your account until it found the right password combination. But with a CAPTCHA, it prevents these attacks from executing. Another type of password attack is a dictionary attack. A dictionary attack doesn't test out brute force combinations like ABC1 or capital ABC1. Instead, it tries out words that are commonly used in passwords like password, monkey, football. The best way to prevent a password attack is to utilize strong passwords. Don't include real words you would find in a dictionary, and make sure to use a mix of capitals, letters, and symbols. Without any fail-safes like CAPTCHAs or other account protections, it would take a typical password cracker application about one minute to crack a password like sandwich, but substantially longer to crack something like what you see here. Spelled S, ampersand N, capital D, W, H, the number 1, C, then another H. See how that's the same, but also way harder to crack? Get ready, because we're about to dive into one of the least technical, but most disturbing attacks that can be done, social engineering. Social engineering is an attack method that relies heavily on interactions with humans instead of computers. You can harden your defenses as much as you want. You can spend millions of dollars on state-of-the-art security infrastructure. But if Susan, the systems administrator, has all the access to your system and gets tricked into handling over her credentials, there's nothing you can do to stop it. As we've learned from the greatest sci-fi movies, humans will always be the weakest link in life and in your security system. Social engineering is a kind of con game where attackers use deceptive techniques to gain access to personal information. They then try to have a user execute something and basically scam a victim into doing that thing. A popular type of social engineering attack is a phishing attack. Phishing usually occurs when a malicious email is sent to a victim disguised as something legitimate. One common phishing attack is an email saying your bank account has been compromised. It then gives you a link to click on to reset your password. When you go to the link, it looks like your bank's website, but it's actually a fake website. So you're tricked into entering your current password and credentials in order to reset your current password. Another variation of phishing is spear phishing. Both phishing schemes have the same end goals, but spear phishing specifically targets individual or group. The fake emails may contain some personal information, like your name or the names of friends or family, so they seem more trustworthy. Another popular social engineering attack is email spoofing. Spoofing is when a source is masquerading around as something else. Think of an email spoof. This is what happens when you receive an email with a misleading sender address. You can send an email and have it appear to come from anywhere you want, whether it exists or not. Imagine if you opened an email you thought was from your friend Brian. Brian's real email address is in the from part, and the email says that you have to check out this funny link. Well, you know Brian. He's pretty awesome, and he always sends super funny emails, so you click on the link. Suddenly, you have malware installed, and you're probably not feeling so awesome about Brian right now. Not all social engineering occurs digitally. In fact, one attack happens through actual physical contact. This is called baiting, which is used to entice a victim to do something. For example, an attacker could just leave a USB drive somewhere in hopes that someone out there will plug it into their machine to see what's on it. But they've just installed malware on their machine without even knowing it. Another popular attack that can occur offline is called tailgating, which is essentially gaining access into a restricted area or building by following a real employee in. In most corporate environments, building access is restricted through the use of a key card or some other entry method. 
A tailgater could use social engineering tactics to trick an employee into thinking that they are there for a legitimate reason, like doing maintenance on the building or delivering packages. Once a tailgater is in, they have physical access to your corporate assets. Pretty scary stuff we've covered so far, huh? I bet you didn't realize that there were so many ways to compromise security. Hopefully, you've gained a better grasp on the common attacks out there and signs on what to look for. Now that you've been exposed to the fundamental types of security threats, we'll dive deep into best practices for security and how to create technical implementations for secure systems. But first up, we're going to test your knowledge with a quiz covering the different attacks we've talked about in this module. When you were little, did you and your siblings ever communicate in a secret language around your parents? It didn't really matter what you were talking about, as long as your parents didn't know what it was. That was the fun part, right? It may have seemed like a fun game when you were younger, but for as long as humans have been around, we've created ways to keep messages secret from others. In this lesson, we'll cover how this plays out through symmetric encryption, asymmetric encryption, and hashing. We'll also go over how to describe the most common algorithms in cryptography and learn how to choose the most appropriate cryptographic method in any given scenario. But before we dive into the nitty-gritty details of cryptography, the various types that exist in our applications, let's go over some terminology and general principles that will help you understand the details later. The topic of cryptography, or hiding messages from potential enemies, has been around for thousands of years. It's evolved tremendously with the advent of modern technology, computers, and telecommunications. Encryption is the act of taking a message, called plaintext, and applying an operation to it, called a cipher, so that you receive a garbled, unreadable message as the output, called ciphertext. The reverse process, taking the garbled output and transforming it back into the readable plaintext, is called decryption. For example, let's look at a simple cipher where we substitute E for O and O for Y. We'll take the plaintext, hello world, and feed it into our basic cipher. What do you think the resulting ciphertext will be? Hopefully, you've got Holly World. It's pretty easy to decipher this ciphertext, since this is a very basic example. There are much more complex and secure ciphers or algorithms that we'll cover later in this section. A cipher is actually made up of two components, the encryption algorithm and the key. The encryption algorithm is the underlying logic or process that's used to convert the plaintext into ciphertext. These algorithms are usually very complex mathematical operations, but there are also some very basic algorithms that we can take a closer look at that don't necessarily require a PhD in math to understand. The other crucial component of a cipher is the key, which introduces something unique into your cipher. Without the key, anyone using the same algorithm would be able to decode your message, and you wouldn't actually have any secrecy. So to recap, first, you pick an encryption algorithm you'd like to use to encode your message. Then, choose a key. Now you have a cipher, which you can run your plaintext message through and get an encrypted ciphertext out, ready to be sent out into the world, safe and secure from prying eyes. Doesn't this make you feel like an international person of mystery? Just wait. Given that the underlying purpose of cryptography is to protect your secrets from being read by unauthorized parties, it would make sense that at least some of the components of a cipher would need to be kept secret too, right? You can make the argument that by keeping the algorithm secret, your messages are secured from snooping third parties, and technically, you wouldn't be wrong. This general concept is referred to as security through obscurity, which basically means if no one knows what algorithm we're using, or general security practice, then we're safe from attackers. Think of hiding your house key under your doormat. As long as the burglar doesn't know that you hide a spare key under the mat, you're safe. But once that information is discovered, all security goes out the window, along with your valuables. So clearly, security through obscurity isn't something that you should rely on for securing communication or systems, or for your house for that matter. This overall concept of cryptography is referred to as Kirchhoff's principle. This principle states that a crypto system, or a collection of algorithms for key generation and encryption and decryption operations that comprise a cryptographic service, should remain secure, even if everything about the system is known, except for the key. What this means is that even if your enemy knows the exact encryption algorithm you use to secure your data, they're still unable to recover the plaintext from an intercepted ciphertext. 
You may also hear this principle referred to as Shannon's maxim, or the enemy knows the system. The implications are the same. The system should remain secure, even if your adversary knows exactly what kind of encryption systems you're employing, as long as your keys remain secure. We already defined encryption, but the overarching discipline that covers the practice of coding and hiding messages from third parties is called cryptography. The study of this practice is referred to as cryptology. The opposite of this, looking for hidden messages or trying to decipher coded messages, is referred to as cryptanalysis. These two fields have co-evolved throughout history, with new ciphers and cryptosystems being developed as previous ones were broken or found to be vulnerable. One of the earliest recorded descriptions of cryptanalysis is from a 9th century Arabian mathematician who described a method for frequency analysis to break coded messages. Frequency analysis is the practice of studying the frequency with which letters appear in ciphertext. The premise behind this type of analysis is that in written languages, certain letters appear more frequently than others, and some letters are more commonly grouped together than others. For example, the most commonly used letters in the English language are E, T, A, and O. The most commonly seen pairs of these letters are TH, ER, ON, and AN. Some ciphers, especially classical transposition and substitution ciphers, preserve the relative frequency of letters in the plaintext, and so are potentially vulnerable to this type of analysis. During World War I and World War II, cryptography and cryptanalysis played an increasingly important role. There was a shift away from linguistics and frequency analysis and a move towards more mathematical-based analysis. This was due to more complex and sophisticated ciphers being developed. A major turning point in the field of cryptanalysis was during World War II when the U.S. allies began to incorporate sophisticated mathematics to aid in breaking Axis encryption schemes. This also saw the first use of automation technology applied to cryptanalysis in England at Bletchley Park. The first programmable digital computer, named Colossus, was developed to aid in this effort. While early computers were applied to breaking cryptography, this opened the door for a huge leap forward in the development of even more sophisticated and complex cryptosystems. Steganography is a related practice, but distinctly different from cryptography. It's the practice of hiding information from observers, but not encoding it. Think of writing a message using invisible ink. The message is in plain text, and no decoding is necessary to read the text, but the text is hidden from sight. The ink is invisible and must be made visible using a mechanism known to the recipient. Modern steganographic techniques include embedding messages and even files into other files, like images or videos. To a casual observer, they would just see a picture of a cute puppy. But if you feed that image into steganography software, it would extract a message hidden within the image file. What's not so secret is how fun it is to learn about all this spy stuff, don't you think? Stick around, because next we'll talk about specific cryptographic methods and systems. So far, we've been talking pretty generally about cryptographic systems and focusing primarily on encryption concepts, but not decryption. It makes sense that if you're sending a protected message to someone, you'd want your recipient to be able to decode the message and read it, and maybe even reply with a coded message of their own. So let's check out the first broad category of encryption algorithms and dive into more details about how it works, along with some pros and cons. When we covered Kirchhoff's principle earlier, do you remember which component of the cipher is crucial to keep secret? That's right, the key must be kept private to ensure that an eavesdropper wouldn't be able to decode encrypted messages. In this scenario, we're making the assumption that the algorithm in use is what's referred to as symmetric key algorithm. These types of encryption algorithms are called symmetric because they use the same key to encrypt and decrypt messages. Let's take a simple example of a symmetric key encryption algorithm to walk through the overall process of encrypting and decrypting a message. A substitution cipher is an encryption mechanism that replaces parts of your plain text with ciphertext. Remember our Hello World example from earlier? That's an example of substitution cipher, since we're substituting some characters with different ones. In this case, the key would be the mapping of characters between plain text and ciphertext. Without knowing what letters get replaced with, you wouldn't be able to easily decode the ciphertext and recover the plain text. If you have the key, 
or the substitution table, then you can easily reverse the process and decrypt the coded message by just performing the reverse operation. A well-known example of a substitution cipher is the Caesar cipher, which is a substitution alphabet. In this case, you're replacing characters in the alphabet with others, usually by shifting or rotating the alphabet a set of numbers or characters. The number of the offset is the key. Another popular example of this is referred to as ROT13, or ROT13, where the alphabet is rotated 13 places. But really, ROT13 is a Caesar cipher that uses a key of 13. Let's go back to our Hello World example and walk through encoding it using our ROT13 cipher. Our ciphertext winds up being URYYBJBEYQ. To reverse this process and go back to the plain text, we just perform the reverse operation by looking up the characters in the output side of the mapping table. You might notice something about the ROT13 mapping table or the fact that we're offsetting the alphabet by 13 characters. 13 is exactly half of the alphabet. This results in the ROT13 cipher being an inverse of itself. What this means is that you can recover the plain text from ciphertext by performing the ROT13 operation on the ciphertext. If we were to choose a different key, let's say 8, can we do the same thing? Let's check. Here's the mapping table for an offset of 8, which gives us the ciphertext of OLSSVDVYSK. If we run this through the cipher once more, we get the following output, VSZZCKCFZR. That doesn't work to reverse the encryption process, does it? There are two more categories that symmetric key ciphers can be placed into. They're either block ciphers or they're stream ciphers. This relates to how the ciphers operate on the plain text to be encrypted. A stream cipher, as the name implies, takes a stream of input and encrypts the stream one character or one digit at a time, outputting one encrypted character or digit at a time. So there's a one-to-one -one relationship between data in and encrypted data out. The other category of symmetric ciphers is block ciphers. The cipher takes data in, places it into a bucket or block of data that's a fixed size, then encodes that entire block as one unit. If the data to be encrypted isn't big enough to fill the block, the extra space will be padded to ensure the plain text fits into the blocks evenly. Now, generally speaking, stream ciphers are faster and less complex to implement, but they can be less secure than block ciphers if the key generation and handling isn't done properly. If the same key is used to encrypt data two or more times, it's possible to break the cipher and to recover the plain text. To avoid key reuse, initialization vector, or IV, is used. That's a bit of random data that's integrated into the encryption key, and the resulting combined key is then used to encrypt the data. The idea behind this is if you have one shared master key, then generate a one-time encryption key. That encryption key is used only once by generating a new key using the master one and the IV. In order for the encrypted message to be decoded, the IV must be sent in plain text along with the encrypted message. A good example of this can be seen when inspecting the 802.11 frame of a WEP encrypted wireless packet. The IV is included in plain text right before the encrypted data payload. In the next video, we'll explore symmetric encryption in more detail, illustrating some of the more popular algorithms and dive into the pros and cons of using symmetric encryption. In the last section, we cover the basics of what exactly symmetric encryption algorithms are and gave a basic example of the Caesar cipher, a type of substitution cipher. We couldn't possibly protect anything of value using this cipher, though, right? There must be more complex and secure symmetric algorithms, right? Of course there are. One of the earliest encryption standards is DES, which stands for Data Encryption Standard. DES was designed in the 1970s by IBM, with some input from the U.S. National Security Agency. DES was adopted as an official FIPS, Federal Information Processing Standard, for the U.S. This means that DES was adopted as a federal standard for encrypting and securing government data. DES is a symmetric block cipher that uses 64-bit key sizes and operates on blocks 64 bits in size. Though the key size is technically 64 bits, 8 bits are used only for parity checking, a simple form of error checking. 
This means that real-world key length for DES is only 56 bits. A quick note about encryption key sizes, since we haven't covered that yet. In symmetric encryption algorithms, the same key is used to encrypt as to decrypt, everything else being the same. The key is the unique piece that protects your data, and the symmetric key must be kept secret to ensure the confidentiality of the data being protected. The key size, defined in bits, is the total number of bits, or data, that comprises the encryption key. So, you can think of the key size as the upper limit for the total possible keys for a given encryption algorithm. Key length is super important in cryptography since it essentially defines the maximum potential strength of the system. Imagine an ideal symmetric encryption algorithm where there are no flaws or weaknesses in the algorithm itself. In this scenario, the only possible way for an adversary to break your encryption would be to attack the key instead of the algorithm. One attack method is to just guess the key and see if the message decodes correctly. This is referred to as a brute force attack. Longer key lengths protect against this type of attack. Let's take the DES key as an example. 64 bits long minus the 8 parity bits gives us a key length of 56 bits. This means that there are a maximum of 2 to the 56 power, or 72 quadrillion possible keys. That seems like a ton of keys, and back in the 1970s, it was. But as technology advanced and computers got faster and more efficient, 64-bit keys quickly proved to be too small. What were once only theoretical attacks on the key size became reality in 1998 when the EFF, Electronic Frontier Foundation, decrypted a DES encrypted message in only 56 hours. Because of the inherent weakness of the small key size of DES, replacement algorithms were designed and proposed. A number of new ones appeared in the 1980s and 1990s. Many kept the 64-bit block size, but used a larger key size, allowing for easier replacement of DES. In 1997, the NIST, National Institute of Standards and Technology, wanted to replace DES with a new algorithm, and in 2001, adopted AES, Advanced Encryption Standard, after an international competition. AES is also the first and only public cipher that's approved for use with top secret information by the United States National Security Agency. AES is also a symmetric block cipher, similar to DES in which it replaced. But AES uses 128-bit blocks, twice the size of DES blocks, and supports key lengths of 128-bit, 192-bit, or 256-bit. Because of the large key size, brute force attacks on AES are only theoretical right now, because the computing power required, or time required using modern technology, exceeds anything feasible today. I want to call out that these algorithms are the overall designs of the ciphers themselves. These designs then must be implemented in either software or hardware before the encryption functions can be applied and put to use. An important thing to keep in mind when considering various encryption algorithms is speed and ease of implementation. Ideally, an algorithm shouldn't be overly difficult to implement because complicated implementation can lead to errors and potential loss of security due to bugs introduced in implementation. Speed is important because sometimes data will be encrypted by running the data through the cipher multiple times. These types of cryptographic operations wind up being performed very often by devices, so the faster they can be accomplished with the minimal impact to the system, the better. This is why some platforms implement these cryptographic algorithms in hardware to accelerate the processes and remove some of the burden from the CPU. For example, modern CPUs from Intel or AMD have AES instructions built into the CPUs themselves. This allows for far greater computational speed and efficiency when working on cryptographic workloads. Let's talk briefly about what was once a wildly used and popular algorithm, but has since been proven to be weak and is discouraged from use. RC4, or Rivis Cipher 4, is a symmetric stream cipher that gained widespread adoption because of its simplicity and speed. RC4 supports key sizes from 40 bits to 2048 bits, so the weaknesses of RC4 aren't due to brute force attacks. But the cipher itself has inherent weaknesses and vulnerabilities that aren't only theoretically possible. There are lots of examples showing RC4 being broken. A recent example of RC4 being broken is the RC4 No More attack. This attack was able to recover an authentication cookie from a TLS encrypted connection in just 52 hours. 
As this is an attack on the RC4 cipher itself, any protocol that uses this cipher is potentially vulnerable to the attack. Even so, RC4 was used in a bunch of popular encryption protocols, like WEP for wireless encryption and WPA, the successor to WEP. It was also supported in SSL and TLS until 2015, when RC4 was dropped in all versions of TLS because of inherent weaknesses. For this reason, most major web browsers have dropped support for RC4 entirely, along with all versions of SSL and use TLS instead. The preferred secure configuration is TLS 1.2 with AES GCM, a specific mode of operation for the AES block cipher that essentially turns it into a stream cipher. GCM, or Galois counter mode, works by taking randomized seed value, incrementing this, and encrypting the value, creating sequentially numbered blocks of ciphertext. The ciphertext are then incorporated into the plain text to be encrypted. GCM is super popular due to its security, being based on AES encryption, along with its performance and the fact that it can be run in parallel with great efficiency. You can read more about the RC4 no more attack in the next reading. So now that we have covered symmetric encryption and some examples of symmetric encryption algorithms, what are the benefits or disadvantages of using symmetric encryption? Because of the symmetric nature of the encryption and decryption process, it's relatively easy to implement and maintain. That's one shared secret that you have to maintain and keep secure. Think of your Wi-Fi password at home. There's one shared secret, your Wi-Fi password, that allows all devices to connect to it. Can you imagine having a specific Wi-Fi password for each device of yours? That would be a nightmare and super hard to keep track of. Symmetric algorithms are also very fast and efficient at encrypting and decrypting large batches of data. So what are the downsides of using symmetric encryption? While well, having one shared secret that both encrypts and decrypts seems convenient up front, this can actually introduce some complications. What happens if your secret is compromised? Imagine that your Wi-Fi password was stolen, and now you have to change it. Now you have to update your Wi-Fi password on all your devices and any devices your friends or family might bring over. What do you have to do when a friend or family member comes to visit and they want to get on your Wi-Fi? You need to provide them with your Wi-Fi password or the shared secret that protects your Wi-Fi network. This usually isn't an issue since you hopefully know the person and you trust them. And it's usually only one or two people at a time. But what if you had a party at your place with 50 strangers? Uh, side note, why are you having a party at your home with 50 strangers? Uh, anyhow, how could you provide the Wi-Fi password only to the people you trust without strangers overhearing? Things could get really awkward really fast. In the next lesson, we'll explore other ways besides symmetric key algorithms to protect data and information. In the previous lesson, we covered one of two major categories that encryption ciphers fall into, symmetric key ciphers. In this next lesson, we'll cover the second class of ciphers, called asymmetric, or public key ciphers. Remember why symmetric ciphers are referred to as symmetric? It's because the same key is used to encrypt as to decrypt. This is in contrast to asymmetric encryption systems because, as the name implies, different keys are used to encrypt and decrypt. So how exactly does that work? Well, let's imagine here that there are two people who would like to communicate securely. We'll call them Suzanne and Daryl. Since they're using asymmetric encryption in this example, the first thing they each must do is generate a private key. Then, using this private key, a public key is derived. The strength of the asymmetric encryption system comes from the computational difficulty of figuring out the corresponding private key given a public key. Once Suzanne and Daryl have generated private and public key pairs, they exchange public keys. You might have guessed from the names that the public key is public and can be shared with anyone, while the private key must be kept secret. Once Suzanne and Daryl have exchanged public keys, they're ready to begin exchanging secure messages. When Suzanne wants to send Daryl an encrypted message, she uses Daryl's public key to encrypt the message and then send the ciphertext. Daryl can then use his private key to decrypt the message and read it. Because of the relationship between private and public keys, only Daryl's private key can decrypt messages encrypted using Daryl's public key. The same is true of Suzanne's key pairs. So when Daryl is ready to reply to Suzanne's message, he'll use Suzanne's public key to encode his message, and Suzanne will use her private key to decrypt the message. 
Can you see why it's called asymmetric or public key cryptography? We just described encryption and decryption operations using an asymmetric crypto system, but there's one other very useful function the system can perform, public key signatures. Let's go back to our friends Suzanne and Daryl. Let's say Suzanne wants to send a message to Daryl, and she wants to make sure that Daryl knows the message came from her and no one else, and that the message was not modified or tampered with. She could do this by composing the message and combining it with her private key to generate a digital signature. She then sends this message along with the associated digital signature to Daryl. We're assuming Suzanne and Daryl have already exchanged public keys previously in this scenario. Daryl can now verify the message's origin and authenticity by combining the message, the digital signature, and Suzanne's public key. If the message was actually signed using Suzanne's private key and not someone else's, and the message wasn't modified at all, then the digital signature should validate. If the message was modified, even by one white space character, the validation will fail, and Daryl shouldn't trust the message. This is an important component of the asymmetric crypto system. Without message verification, anyone could use Daryl's public key and send him an encrypted message claiming to be from Suzanne. The three concepts that an asymmetric crypto system grants us are confidentiality, authenticity, and non-repudiation. Confidentiality is granted through the encryption-decryption mechanism, since our encrypted data is kept confidential and secret from unauthorized third parties. Authenticity is granted by the digital signature mechanism, as the message can be authenticated or verified that it wasn't tampered with. Non-repudiation means that the author of the message isn't able to dispute the origin of the message. In other words, this allows us to ensure that the message came from the person claiming to be the author. Can you see the benefit of using an asymmetric encryption algorithm versus a symmetric one? Asymmetric encryption allows secure communication over an untrusted channel. But with symmetric encryption, we need some way to securely communicate the shared secret or key with the other party. If that's the case, it seems like asymmetric encryption is better, right? Well, sort of. While asymmetric encryption works really well in untrusted environments, it's also computationally more expensive and complex. On the other hand, symmetric encryption algorithms are faster and more efficient at encrypting large amounts of data. In fact, what many secure communication schemes do is take advantage of the relative benefits of both encryption types by using both for different purposes. An asymmetric encryption algorithm is chosen as a key exchange mechanism or cipher. What this means is that the symmetric encryption key or shared secret is transmitted securely to the other party using asymmetric encryption to keep the shared secret secure in transit. Once the shared secret is received, data can be sent quickly and efficiently and securely using an asymmetric encryption cipher. Clever, huh? One last topic to mention is somewhat related to asymmetric encryption, and that's MAX, or Message Authentication Codes, not to be confused with Media Access Control or MAC addresses. A MAC is a bit of information that allows authentication of a received message, ensuring that the message came from the alleged sender and not a third party masquerading as them. It also ensures that the message wasn't modified in some way in order to provide data integrity. This sounds super similar to digital signatures using public key cryptography, doesn't it? While very similar, it differs slightly since the secret key that's used to generate the MAC is the same one that's used to verify it. In this sense, it's similar to symmetric encryption system, and the secret key must be agreed upon by all communicating parties beforehand, or shared in some secure way. This describes one popular and secure type of MAC called HMAC, or a keyed hash message authentication code. HMAC uses a cryptographic hash function along with a secret key to generate a MAC. Any cryptographic hash functions can be used, like SHA-1 or MD5, and the strength or security of the MAC is dependent upon the underlying security of the cryptographic hash function used. The MAC is sent alongside the message that's being checked. The MAC is verified by the receiver by performing the same operation on the received message, then comparing the computed MAC with the one received with the message. If the MACs are the same, then the message is authenticated. There are also MACs based on symmetric encryption ciphers, either block or stream, like DES or AES, which are called CMACs, or cipher-based message authentication codes. The process is similar to HMAC, but instead of using a hashing function to produce a digest, 
A symmetric cipher with a shared key is used to encrypt the message, and the resulting output is used as the MAC. A specific and popular example of a CMAC, though slightly different, is CBC MAC, or Cipher Block Chaining Message Authentication Codes. CBC MAC is a mechanism for building MACs using block ciphers. This works by taking a message and encrypting it using a block cipher operating in CBC mode. CBC mode is an operating mode for block ciphers that incorporates the previously encrypted block ciphertext into the next block's plain text. So, it builds a chain of encrypted blocks that require the full, unmodified chain to decrypt. This chain of interdependently encrypted blocks means that any modification to the plain text will result in a different final output at the end of the chain, ensuring message integrity. In the next section, we'll check out some common examples of asymmetric encryption algorithms and systems. I'll see you there. So, one of the first practical asymmetric cryptography systems to be developed is RSA, named for the initials of the three co-inventors, Ron Rivest, Adi Shamir, and Leonard Aldeman. This crypto system was patented in 1983 and was released to the public domain by RSA Security in the year 2000. The RSA system specifies mechanisms for generation and distribution of keys, along with encryption and decryption operation using these keys. We won't go into the details of the math involved, since it's pretty high-level stuff and beyond the scope of this class. But it's important to know that the key generation process depends on choosing two unique, random, and usually very large prime numbers. DSA, or Digital Signature Algorithm, is another example of an asymmetric encryption system, though it's used for signing and verifying data. It was patented in 1991 and is part of the US government's Federal Information Processing Standard. Similar to RSA, the specification covers the key generation process along with the signing and verifying data using the key pairs. It's important to call out that the security of this system is dependent on choosing a random seed value that's incorporated into the signing process. If this value is leaked, or if it can be inferred if the prime number isn't truly random, then it's possible for an attacker to recover the private key. This actually happened in 2010 to Sony with their PlayStation 3 game console. It turns out they weren't ensuring this randomized value was changed for every signature. This resulted in a hacker group called Fail Overflow being able to recover the private key that Sony used to sign software for their platform. This allowed modders to write and sign custom software that was allowed to run on the otherwise very locked down console platform. This resulted in game piracy becoming a problem for Sony as this facilitated the illicit copying and distribution of games, which caused significant losses in sales. I've included links to more about this in the next reading, in case you want to dive deeper. Earlier, we talked about how asymmetric systems are commonly used as key exchange mechanisms to establish a shared secret that will be used with a symmetric cipher. Another popular key exchange algorithm is DH, or Diffie-Hellman, named for the co-inventors. Let's walk through how the DH key exchange algorithm works. Let's assume we have two people who'd like to communicate over an unsecured channel, and let's call them Suzanne and Daryl. I've grown pretty fond of these two. First, Suzanne and Daryl agree on a starting number that would be random and will be a very large integer. This number should be different for every session and doesn't need to be secret. Next, each person chooses another randomized large number, but this one is kept secret. Then, they combine their shared number with their respective secret number and send the resulting mix to each other. Next, each person combines their secret number with the combined value they received from the previous step. The result is a new value that's the same on both sides without disclosing enough information to any potential eavesdroppers to figure out the shared secret. This algorithm was designed solely for key exchange, though there have been efforts to adapt it for encryption purposes. It's even been used as part of a PKI system, or Public Key Infrastructure System. We'll dive more into PKI systems later in this course. Elliptic Curve Cryptography, or ECC, is a public key encryption system that uses the algebraic structure of elliptic curves over finite fields to generate secure keys. Uh, what does that even mean? Well, traditional public key systems make use of factoring large prime numbers, whereas ECC 
makes use of elliptic curves. An elliptic curve is composed of a set of coordinates that fit an equation, similar to something like y to the second equals x to the third plus ax plus b. Elliptic curves have a couple interesting and unique properties. One is horizontal symmetry, which means that at any point in the curve can be mirrored along the x-axis and still make up the same curve. On top of this, any non-vertical line will intersect the curve in three places at most. It's this last property that allows elliptic curves to be used in encryption. The benefit of elliptic curve-based encryption systems is that they're able to achieve security similar to traditional public key systems with smaller key sizes. So, for example, a 256-bit elliptic curve key would be comparable to a 3072-bit RSA key. This is really beneficial since it reduces the amount of data needed to be stored and transmitted when dealing with keys. Both Diffie-Hellman and DSA have elliptic curve variants, referred to as ECDH and ECDSA, respectively. The US NIST recommends the use of EC encryption, and the NSA allows its use to protect up to top secret data with 384-bit EC keys. But the NSA has expressed concern about EC encryption being potentially vulnerable to quantum computing attacks as quantum computing technology continues to evolve and mature. I'm gonna buy Suzanne and Daryl a drink today for all their hard work. In the meantime, we've cooked up an assignment for you that will test your encryption and decryption skills. Take your time to decode all the details and I'll see you all in the next lesson. So far, we've talked about two forms of encryption, symmetric and asymmetric. In this next lesson, we're going to cover a special type of function that's widely used in computing and especially within security, hashing. No, not the breakfast kind, although those are delicious. Hashing, or a hash function, is a type of function or operation that takes in an arbitrary data input and maps it to an output of a fixed size called a hash or a digest. The output size is usually specified in bits of data and is often included in the hashing function name. What this means exactly is that you feed in any amount of data into a hash function and the resulting output will always be the same size, but the output should be unique to the input such that two different inputs should never yield the same output. Hash functions have a large number of applications in computing in general, typically used to uniquely identify data. You may have heard the term hash table before in context of software engineering. This is a type of data structure that uses hashes to accelerate data lookups. Hashing can also be used to identify duplicate data sets in databases or archives to speed up searching of tables or to remove duplicate data to save space. Depending on the application, there are various properties that may be desired, and the variety of hashing functions exist for various applications. We're primarily concerned with cryptographic hash functions, which are used for various applications like authentication, message integrity, fingerprinting, data corruption detection, and digital signatures. Cryptographic hashing is distinctly different from encryption because cryptographic hash functions should be one directional. They're similar in that you can input plain text into the hash function and get output that's unintelligible, but you can't take the hash output and recover the plain text. The ideal cryptographic hash function should be deterministic, meaning that the same input value should always return the same hash value. The function should be quick to compute and be efficient. It should be infeasible to reverse the function and recover the plain text from the hash digest. A small change in the input should result in a change in the output so that there is no correlation between the change in the input and the resulting change in the output. Finally, the function should not allow for hash collisions, meaning two different inputs mapping to the same output. Cryptographic hash functions are very similar to symmetric key block ciphers in that they operate on blocks of data. In fact, many popular hash functions are actually based on modified block ciphers. Let's take a basic example to quickly demonstrate how a hash function works. We'll use an imaginary hash function for demonstration purposes. Let's say we have an input string of hello world and we feed this into a hash function which generates the resulting hash of E49A00FF. 
every time we feed this string into our function, we get the same hash digest output. Now let's modify the input very slightly so it becomes hello world, all lowercase now. While this change seems small to us, the resulting hash output is wildly different, FF1832AE. Here is the same example, but using a real hash function, in this case, MD5SUM. Hopefully, the concept of hash functions makes sense to you now. In the next section, we will explore some examples of hashing algorithms and dive into weaknesses or attacks on hash functions. In this section, we'll cover some of the more popular hashing functions, both currently and historically. MD5 is a popular and widely used hash function designed in the early 1990s as a cryptographic hashing function. It operates on a 512-bit blocks and generates 128-bit hash digests. While MD5 was published in 1992, a design flaw was discovered in 1996 and cryptographers recommended using the SHA-1 hash, a more secure alternative. But this flow was not deemed critical, so the hash function continued to see widespread use and adoption. In 2004, it was discovered that MD5 is susceptible to hash collisions, allowing for a bad actor to craft a malicious file that can generate the same MD5 digest as another, different, legitimate file. Bad actors are the worst, aren't they? Shortly after this flaw was discovered, security researchers were able to generate two different files that have matching MD5 hash digests. In 2008, security researchers took this a step further and demonstrated the ability to create a fake SSL certificate that validated due to an MD5 hash collision. Due to these very serious vulnerabilities in the hash function, it was recommended to stop using MD5 for cryptographic applications by 2010. In 2012, this hash collision was used for nefarious purposes in the Flame malware, which used the Forge Microsoft Digital Certificate to sign their malware, which resulted in the malware appearing to be from legitimate software that came from Microsoft. You can learn more about the Flame malware in the next reading. When design flaws were discovered in MD5, it was recommended to use SHA-1 as a replacement. SHA-1 is part of the Secure Hash Algorithm suite of functions, designed by the NSA and published in 1995. It operates a 512-bit blocks and generates 160-bit hash digest. SHA-1 is another widely used cryptographic hashing functions used in popular protocols like TLS SSL, PGP SSH, and IPsec. SHA-1 is also used in version control systems like Git, which uses hashes to identify revisions and ensure data integrity by detecting corruption or tampering. SHA-1 and SHA-2 were required for use in some U.S. government cases for protection of sensitive information, although the U.S. National Institute of Standards and Technology recommends stopping the use of SHA-1 and relying on SHA-2 in 2010. Many other organizations have also recommended replacing SHA-1 with SHA-2 or SHA-3, and major browser vendors have announced intentions to drop support for SSL certificates that use SHA-1 in 2017. SHA-1 also has its share of weaknesses and vulnerabilities, with security researchers trying to demonstrate realistic hash collisions. During the 2000s, a bunch of theoretical attacks were formulated and some partial collisions were demonstrated, but full collisions using these methods require significant computing power. One such attack was estimated to require $2.77 million in cloud computing CPU resources. Wowza! In 2015, a different attack method was developed that didn't demonstrate a full collision, but this was the first time that one of these attacks was demonstrated, which had major implications for the future security of SHA-1. What was only theoretically possible before was now becoming possible with more efficient attack methods and increases in computing performance, especially in the space of GPU-accelerated computations and cloud resources. A full collision with this attack method was estimated to be feasible using CPU and GPU cloud computing for approximately $75,000 to $120,000, much cheaper than previous attacks. You can read more about these attacks and collisions in the next reading. In early 2017, the first full collision of SHA-1 was published. Using significant CPU and GPU resources, 
two unique PDF files were created that result in the same SHA-1 hash. The estimated processing power required to do this was described as equivalent of 6,500 years of a single CPU and 110 years of a single GPU computing nonstop. Uh, that's a lot of years. There's also the concept of a mic, or message integrity check. This shouldn't be confused with a MAC or message authentication check, since how they work and what they protect against is different. A mic is essentially a hash digest of the message in question. You can think of it as a checksum for the message, ensuring that the contents of the message weren't modified in transit. But this is distinctly different from a MAC that we talked about earlier. It doesn't use secret keys, which means the message isn't authenticated. There's nothing stopping an attacker from altering the message, recomputing the checksum, and modifying the mic attached to the message. You can think of mics as protecting against accidental corruption or loss, but not protecting against tampering or malicious actions. We've already alluded to attacks on hashes. Now let's learn some more details, including how to defend against these attacks. One crucial application for cryptographic hash functions is for authentication. Think about when you log into your email account. You enter your email address and password. What do you think happens in the background for the email system to authenticate you? It has to verify that the password you entered is the correct one for your account. You could just take the user supplied password and look up the password on file for the given account and compare them, right? If they're the same, then the user is authenticated. Seems like a simple solution, but does that seem secure to you? In the authentication scenario, we'd have to store user passwords in plain text somewhere. That's a terrible idea. You should never, ever store sensitive information like passwords in plain text. Instead, you should do what pretty much every authentication system does, store a hash of the password instead of the password itself. When you log into your email account, the password you entered is run through the hashing function, and then the resulting hash digest is compared against the hash on file. If the hashes match, then we know the password is correct and you're authenticated. Passwords shouldn't be stored in plain text, because if your systems are compromised, passwords for other accounts are ultimate prize for the attacker. If an attacker manages to gain access to your system and can just copy the database of accounts and passwords, this would obviously be a bad situation. By only storing password hashes, the worst the attacker would be able to recover would be password hashes, which aren't really useful on their own. What if the attacker wanted to figure out what passwords correspond to the hashes they stole? They would perform a brute force attack against the password hash database. This is where the attacker just tries all possible input values until a resulting hash matches the one they're trying to recover the plain text for. Once there's a match, we know that the input that's generated that matches the hash is the corresponding password. As you can imagine, a brute force attack can be very computationally intensive, depending on the hashing function used. An important characteristic to call out about brute force attacks is technically they're impossible to protect against completely. A successful brute force attack against even the most secure system imaginable is a function of attacker time and resources. If an attacker has unlimited time and or resources, any system can be brute forced. Yikes. So the best we can do to protect against these attacks is to raise the bar. Make it sufficiently time and resource intensive so that it's not practically feasible in a useful time frame or with existing technology. Another common method to help raise the computational bar and protect against brute force attacks is to run the password through the hashing function multiple times, sometimes through thousands of iterations. This would require significantly more computations for each password guess attempt. That brings us to the topic of rainbow tables. Don't be fooled by the colorful name. These tables are used by bad actors to help speed up the process of recovering passwords from stolen password hashes. A rainbow table is just a pre-computed table of all possible password values and their corresponding hashes. The idea behind rainbow table attacks is to trade computational power for disk space. By pre-computing the hashes and storing them in a table, an attacker can determine what the corresponding password is for a given hash by just looking up the hash in their rainbow table. This is unlike a brute force attack, where the hash is computed for each guess attempt. It's possible to download rainbow tables from the internet for popular password lists and hashing functions. This further reduces the need for computational resources, requiring large amounts of storage space to keep all the password and hash data. 
So you may be wondering how you can protect against these pre-computed rainbow tables. That's where salts come into play. And no, I'm not talking about table salt. A password salt is additional randomized data that's added into the hashing function to generate a hash that's unique to the password and salt combination. Here's how it works. A randomly chosen large salt is concatenated, or tacked onto the end of, the password. The combination of salt and password is then run through the hashing function to generate the hash, which is then stored alongside the salt. What this means now for an attacker is that they'd have to compute a rainbow table for each possible salt value. If a large salt is used, the computational and storage requirements to generate useful rainbow tables becomes almost infeasible. Early Unix systems used a 12-bit salt, which amounts to a total of 4,096 possible salts. So an attacker would have to generate hashes for every password in their database 4,096 times over. Modern systems like Linux, BSD, and Solaris use a 128-bit salt. That means there are two to the 128th power possible salt values, which is over 340 undecillion. That's 340 with 36 zeros following. Clearly, 128-bit salt raises the bar high enough that a rainbow table attack wouldn't be possible in any realistic time frame. Just another scenario when adding salt to something makes it even better. That rounds out our lesson on hashing functions. Up next, we'll talk about real-world applications of cryptography and explain how it's used in various applications and protocols. But first, a project that will help you get hands-on with hashing. Hashtag, get it done. In this lesson, we're going to cover PKI, or Public Key Infrastructure. Spoiler alert, this is a critical piece to securing communications on the internet today. Earlier, we talked about public key cryptography and how it can be used to securely transmit data over an untrusted channel and verify the identity of a sender using digital signatures. PKI is a system that defines the creation, storage, and distribution of digital certificates. A digital certificate is a file that proves that an entity owns a certain public key. A certificate contains information about the public key, the entity it belongs to, and a digital signature from another party that has verified this information. If the signature is valid and we trust the entity that signed the certificate, then we can trust the public key to be used to securely communicate with the entity that owns it. The entity that's responsible for storing, issuing, and signing certificates is referred to as CA, or Certificate Authority. It's a crucial component of a PKI system. There's also an RA, or Registration Authority, that's responsible for verifying the identities of any entities requesting certificates to be signed and stored with the CA. This role is usually lumped together with the CA. A central repository is needed to securely store and index keys, and a certificate management system of some sort makes managing access to storage certificates and issuance of certificates easier. There are a few different types of certificates that have different applications or uses. The one you're probably most familiar with is SSL or TLS server certificate. This is a certificate that a web server presents to a client as part of the initial secure setup of an SSL TLS connection. Don't worry, we'll cover SSL TLS in more detail in a future lesson. The client Usually a web browser will then verify that the subject of the certificate matches the host name of the server the client is trying to connect to. The client will also verify that the certificate is signed by a certificate authority that the client trusts. It's possible for a certificate to be valid for multiple host names. In some cases, a wildcard certificate can be issued where the host name is replaced with an asterisk denoting validity for all host names within a domain. It's also possible for a server to use what's called a self-signed certificate. You may have guessed from the name. This certificate has been signed by the same entity that issued the certificate. This would basically be signing your own public key using your private key. Unless you already trusted this key, this certificate would fail to verify. Another certificate type is an SSL TLS client certificate. This is an optional component of SSL TLS connections and is less commonly seen than server certificates. As the name implies, these are certificates that are bound to clients and are used to authenticate the client to the server, allowing access control to an SSL TLS service. 
These are different from server certificates in that the client certificates aren't issued by a public CA. Usually, the service operator would have their own internal CA, which issues and manages client certificates for their service. There are also code signing certificates, which are used for signing executable programs. This allows users of these signed applications to verify the signatures and ensure that the application was not tampered with. It also lets them verify that the application came from the software author and is not a malicious twin. We've mentioned Certificate Authority Trust, but not really explained it. So let's take some time to go over how it all works. PKI is very much dependent on trust relationships between entities and building a network or chain of trust. This chain of trust has to start somewhere, and that starts with the root certificate authority. These root certificates are self-signed because they're the start of the chain of trust, so there's no higher authority that can sign on their behalf. This root certificate authority can now use the self-signed certificate and the associated private key to begin signing other public keys and issuing certificates. It builds a sort of tree structure with the root private key at the top of the structure. If the root CA signs a certificate and sets a field in the certificate called CA to true, this marks the certificate as an intermediary or subordinate CA. What this means is that the entity that this certificate was issued to can now sign other certificates, and this CA has the same trust as the root CA. An intermediary CA can also sign other intermediate CAs. You can see how this extension of trust from one root CA to intermediaries can begin to build a chain. A certificate that has no authority as a CA is referred to as an end entity or leaf certificate. Similar to a leaf on a tree, it's the end of the tree structure and can be considered the opposite of the roots. You might be wondering how these root CAs wind up being trusted in the first place. Well, that's a very good question. In order to bootstrap this chain of trust, you have to trust a root CA certificate. Otherwise, the whole chain is untrusted. This is done by distributing root CA certificates via alternative channels. Each major OS vendor ships a large number of trusted root CA certificates with their OS, and they typically have their own programs to facilitate distribution of root CA certificates. Most browsers will then utilize the OS-provided store of root certificates. Let's do a deep dive into certificates beyond just their function. The X509 standard is what defines the format of digital certificates. It also defines a certificate revocation list, or CRL, which is a means to distribute a list of certificates that are no longer valid. The X509 standard was first issued in 1988, and the current modern version of the standard is version 3. The fields defined in an X509 certificate are the version, what version of the X509 standard the certificate adheres to, serial number, a unique identifier for the certificate assigned by the CA, which allows the CA to manage and identify individual certificates, certificate signature algorithm. This field indicates what public key algorithm is used for the public key and what hashing algorithm is used to sign the certificate. Issuer name. This field contains information about the authority that signed the certificate. Validity. This contains two subfields, not before and not after, which define the dates when the certificate is valid for. Subject. This field contains identifying information about the entity the certificate was issued to. Subject public key info. These two subfields define the algorithm of the public key along with the public key itself. Certificate signature algorithm. Same as the subject public key info field, these two fields must match. Certificate signature value, the digital signature data itself. There are also certificate fingerprints, which aren't actually fields in the certificate itself, but are computed by clients when validating or inspecting certificates. These are just hash digests of the whole certificate. You can read about the full X509 standard in the next reading. An alternative to the centralized PKI model of establishing trust and binding identities is what's called the web of trust. A web of trust is where individuals, instead of certificate authorities, sign other individuals' public keys. Before an individual signs a key, they should first verify the person's identity through an agreed-upon mechanism, usually by checking some form of identification, driver's license, passport, etc. Once they've determined the person is who they claim to be, 
Signing their public key is basically vouching for this person. You're saying that you trust that this public key belongs to this individual. This process would be reciprocal, meaning both parties would sign each other's keys. Usually, people who are interested in establishing web of trusts will organize what are called key signing parties, where participants perform the same verification and signing. At the end of the party, everyone's public keys should have been signed by every other participant, establishing a web of trust. In the future, when one of these participants in the initial key signing party establishes trust with a new member, the web of trust extends to include this new member and other individuals they also trust. This allows separate webs of trust to be bridged by individuals and allows the network of trust to grow. In this section, we'll dive into some real-world applications of the encryption concepts that we've covered so far. In the last section, we mentioned SSL TLS when we were talking about digital certificates. Now that we understand how digital certificates function and the crucial roles CAs play, let's check out how that fits into securing web traffic via HTTPS. You've probably heard of HTTPS before, but do you know exactly what it is and how it's different from HTTP? Very simply, HTTPS is the secure version of HTTP, the Hypertext Transport Protocol. So how exactly does HTTPS protect us on the internet? HTTPS can also be called HTTP over SSL or TLS, since it's essentially encapsulating the HTTP traffic over an encrypted secured channel utilizing SSL or TLS. You might hear SSL and TLS used interchangeably, but SSL 3.0, the latest revision of SSL, was deprecated in 2015, and TLS 1.2 is the current recommended revision, with version 1.3 still in the works. Now, it's important to call out that TLS is actually independent of HTTPS and is actually a generic protocol to permit secure communications and authentication over a network. TLS is also used to secure other communications aside from web browsing, like VoIP calls, such as Skype or Hangouts, email, instant messaging, and even Wi-Fi network security. TLS grants us three things. One, a secure communication line, which means data being transmitted is protected from potential eavesdroppers. Two, the ability to authenticate both parties communicating through typically only the server is authenticated by the client. And three, the integrity of communications, meaning there are checks to ensure that messages aren't lost or altered in transit. TLS essentially provides a secure channel for an application to communicate with a service, but there must be a mechanism to establish this channel initially. This is what's referred to as a TLS handshake. I'm more of a high five person myself, but we can move on. The handshake process kicks off with a client establishing a connection with a TLS enabled service referred to in the protocol as client hello. This includes information about the client, like the version of the TLS that the client supports, a list of cipher suites that it supports, and maybe some additional TLS options. The server then responds with a server hello message in which it selects the highest protocol version in common with the client and chooses a Cypher suite from the list to use. It also transmits its digital certificate and a final server hello done message. The client would then validate the certificate that the server sent over to ensure that it's trusted and it's for the appropriate host name. Assuming the certificate checks out, the client then sends a client key exchange message. This is when the client chooses a key exchange mechanism to securely establish a shared secret with the server, which will be used with a symmetric encryption cipher to encrypt all further communications. The client also sends a changed cipher spec message indicating that it's switching to secure communications now that it has all the information needed to begin communicating over the secure channel. This is followed by an encrypted finished message which also serves to verify that the handshake completed successfully. The server replies with a change cipher spec and an encrypted finished message once the shared secret is received. Once complete, application data can begin to flow over the now secured channel. High five to that. The session key is the shared symmetric encryption key used in TLS sessions to encrypt data being sent back and forth. Since this key is derived from the public private key, if the private key is compromised, 
there's potential for an attacker to decode all previously transmitted messages that were encoded using keys derived from this private key. To defend against this, there's a concept of forward secrecy. This is a property of a cryptographic system so that even in the event that the private key is compromised, the session keys are still safe. The SSH, or Secure Shell, is a secure network protocol that uses encryption to allow access to a network service over unsecured networks. Most commonly, you'll see SSH used for remote login to command line based systems. But the protocol is super flexible and has provisions for allowing arbitrary network ports and traffic over those ports to be tunneled over the encrypted channel. It was originally designed as a secure replacement for the Telnet protocol and other unsecured remote login shell protocols like rlogin or rexec. It's very important that remote login and shell protocols use encryption. Otherwise, these services will be transmitting usernames and passwords, along with keystrokes and terminal output in plain text. This opens up the possibility for an eavesdropper to intercept credentials and keystrokes. Not good. SSH uses public key cryptography to authenticate the remote machine that the client is connecting to and has provisions to allow user authentication via client certificates if desired. The SSH protocol is very flexible and modular and supports a wide variety of different key exchange mechanisms like Diffie-Hellman, along with a variety of symmetric encryption ciphers. It also supports a variety of authentication methods, including custom ones that you can write. When using public key authentication, a key pair is generated by the user who wants to authenticate. They then must distribute those public keys to all systems that they want to authenticate to using the key pair. When authenticating, SSH will ensure that the public key being presented matches the private key, which should never leave the user's possession. PGP stands for Pretty Good Privacy. How's that for a creative name? PGP is an encryption application that allows authentication of data along with privacy from third parties, relying upon asymmetric encryption to achieve this. It's most commonly used for encrypted email communication, but it's also available as a full disk encryption solution or for encrypting arbitrary files, documents, or folders. PGP was developed by Phil Zimmerman in 1991, and it was freely available for anyone to use. The source code was even distributed along with the software. Zimmerman was an anti-nuclear activist, and political activism drove his development of the PGP encryption software to facilitate secure communications for other activists. PGP took off once released and found its way around the world, which wound up getting Zimmerman into hot water with the U.S. federal government. At the time, U.S. federal export regulations classified encryption technology that used keys larger than 40 bits in length as munitions. This meant that PGP was subject to similar restrictions as rockets, bombs, firearms, and even nuclear weapons. PGP was designed to use keys no smaller than 128-bit, so it ran up against these export restrictions, and Zimmerman faced a federal investigation for the widespread distribution of his cryptographic software. Zimmerman took a creative approach to challenging these restrictions by publishing the source code in a hardcover printed book, which was made available widely. The idea was that the contents of the book should be protected by the First Amendment of the U.S. Constitution. Pretty clever, huh? The investigation was eventually closed in 1996 without any charges being filed, and Zimmerman didn't even need to go to court. You can read more about why he developed PGP in the next reading. PGP is widely regarded as very secure, with no known mechanisms to break the encryption via cryptographic or computational means. It's been compared to military-grade encryption, and there are numerous cases of police and governments unable to recover data protected by PGP encryption. In these cases, law enforcement tend to resort to legal measure to force the handover of passwords or keys. Originally, PGP used the RSA algorithm, though that was eventually replaced with DSA to avoid issues with licensing. Let's talk about securing network traffic. As we've seen, Encryption is used for protecting data both from the privacy perspective and the data integrity perspective. A natural application of this technology is to protect data in transit. But what if our application doesn't utilize encryption? Or what if we want to provide remote access to internal resources too sensitive to expose directly to the internet? We use a VPN, 
or virtual private network solution. A VPN is a mechanism that allows you to remotely connect a host or network to an internal private network, passing the data over a public channel like the internet. You can think of this as a sort of encrypted tunnel where all of our remote systems network traffic would flow, transparently channeling our packets via the tunnel through the remote private network. A VPN can also be point to point, where two gateways are connected via a VPN, essentially bridging two private networks through an encrypted tunnel. There are a bunch of VPN solutions using different approaches and protocols with differing benefits and trade-offs. Let's go over some of the more popular ones. IPsec, or Internet Protocol Security, is a VPN protocol that was designed in conjunction with IPv6. It was originally required to be standards compliant with IPv6 implementations, but was eventually dropped as a requirement. It is optional for use with IPv6. IPsec works by encrypting an IP packet and encapsulating the encrypted packet inside an IPsec packet. This encrypted packet then gets routed to the VPN endpoint, where the packet is de-encapsulated and decrypted, then sent to the final destination. IPsec supports two modes of operations, transport mode and tunnel mode. When transport mode is used, only the payload of the IP packet is encrypted, leaving the IP headers untouched. Heads up that authentication headers are also used, header values are hashed and verified, along with the transport and application layers. This would prevent the use of anything that would modify these values, like NAT or PAT. In tunnel mode, the entire IP packet, header payload and all, is encrypted and encapsulated inside a new IP packet with new headers. While not a VPN solution itself, L2TP, or Layer 2 Tunneling Protocol, is typically used to support VPNs. A common implementation of L2TP is in conjunction with IPsec when data confidentiality is needed, since L2TP doesn't provide encryption itself. It's a simple tunneling protocol that allows encapsulation of different protocols or traffic over a network that may not support the type of traffic being sent. L2TP can also just segregate and manage the traffic. ISPs will use L2TP to deliver network access to a customer's endpoint, for example. The combination of L2TP and IPsec is referred to as L2TP IPsec and was officially standardized in IETF RFC 3193. The establishment of an L2TP IPsec connection works by first negotiating an IPsec security association, which negotiates the details of the secure connection, including key exchange if used. It can also share secrets, public keys, and a number of other mechanisms. I've included a link to more info about it in the next reading. Next, secure communication is established using encapsulating security payload. It's a part of the IPsec suite of protocols, which encapsulates IP packets, providing confidentiality, integrity, and authentication of the packets. Once secure encapsulation has been established, negotiation and establishment of the L2TP tunnel can proceed. L2TP packets are now encapsulated by IPsec, protecting information about the private internal network. An important distinction to make in this setup is the difference between the tunnel and the secure channel. The tunnel is provided by L2TP, which permits the passing of unmodified packets from one network to another. The secure channel, on the other hand, is provided by IPsec, which provides confidentiality, integrity, and authentication of data being passed. SSL TLS is also used in some VPN implementations to secure network traffic as opposed to individual sessions or connections. An example of this is OpenVPN, which uses the OpenSSL library to handle key exchange and encryption of data along with control channels. This also enables OpenVPN to make use of all the ciphers implemented by the OpenSSL library. Authentication methods supported are pre-shared secrets, certificate-based, and username password. Certificate-based authentication would be the most secure option, but it requires more support and management overhead since every client must have a certificate. Username password authentication can be used in conjunction with certificate authentication, providing additional layers of security. It should be called out that OpenVPN doesn't implement username password authentication directly. It uses modules to plug into authentication systems, which we'll cover in the next module. OpenVPN can operate over either TCP or UDP, typically over port 1194. It supports pushing network configuration options from the server to a client, and it supports two interfaces for networking. It can either rely on a Layer 3 IP tunnel 
or a Layer 2 Ethernet tap. The Ethernet tap is more flexible, allowing it to carry a wider range of traffic. From the security perspective, OpenVPN supports up to 256-bit encryption through the OpenSSL library. It also runs in user space, limiting the seriousness of potential vulnerabilities that might be present. There are a lot of acronyms to take in, so take a minute to go over them and read more about them, and I'll see you in the next video. In this module, we'll cover the three A's of security, which are authentication, authorization, and accounting. We'll cover exactly what they are, how they relate to each other, and their common implementations and protocols. Let's kick things off with authentication, and by extension, identification. You should be familiar with authentication in the form of username and password prompts when accessing things like your email. So let's take that as an example to show the differences between identification and authentication. Identification is the idea of describing an entity uniquely. For example, your email address is your identity when logging into your email. But how do you go about proving you are who you claim to be? That's the process we call authentication. When accessing your email, you're claiming to be your email address, and you'd supply a password associated with the identity to prove it's you or at least you know the password associated with the email account. Pretty straightforward, right? This is distinctly different from authorization, which pertains to the resources an identity has access to. These two concepts are usually distinguished from each other in the security world with the terms AuthN for authentication and AuthZ for authorization. In our email account login example, by authenticating using your email address and password, your identity is authorized to access your email inbox but you're not authorized to access anyone else's inbox. We really don't want anyone else getting access to our inbox, right? So what can we do to ensure that only we are able to identify and authenticate as our email account? We could start by ensuring that we're using a strong password. But what exactly constitutes a strong password? Well, what do you think of the password ponies? Would you categorize that as a strong password? I hope not. That password is super short at only six characters, and all of those characters are lowercase letters. This is a short and simple password, but that could be easily broken through brute force or dictionary-based attacks. Ponies would almost definitely be in a dictionary file, and six characters doesn't provide a large pool of possibilities for an attacker to try. We can ensure our password is strong by making it longer and more complex, adding numbers, uppercase letters, and special characters like punctuation. What do you think of the strength of this password? That seems way more secure, doesn't it? It adds complexity, which increases the pool of possible passwords, and is longer at 10 characters. But which of these two passwords do you think you would be able to remember tomorrow? Probably not the strong one, right? This highlights a super important concept in security. There's often a trade-off between security and usability. With our password example, the more usable password that's easy to memorize is less secure, while the more secure password is much more challenging to remember. This concept applies to many other security subjects, not just passwords. You can think of security as risk mitigation, and when it comes to risk mitigation, it's impossible to completely eliminate the risk. The best you can do is understand the risks your systems face, take measures to reduce those risks, and monitor them. Think about it like this. The most secure computer system is one that's disconnected from everything, including networking and even power, and is locked in a concrete bunker hundreds of feet underground that no one has access to. While this is an incredibly secure machine, almost impossible to compromise, it's basically useless since it's powered off and no one can access it. This is an extreme example of the security versus usability trade-off, but you get the point. Coming back to our password example, we obviously need to find some sort of happy medium but where we have a reasonably secure password that's also somewhat easy to memorize. How about something like this? We started with the short phrase, I like ponies, then replaced some letters with numbers that resemble the letters to help with memorization. We also swapped the S with a Z, since they're similar sounding, and tacked on some numbers as a suffix. At first glance, this seems like a very complex password and would be hard to memorize, but it's easier than our random password example. Problem solved, right? Well, 
you should actually be wary of this number substitution process, since it's well known by attackers and password cracking tools. As an IT support specialist, ensuring that your organization uses strong passwords and practices, good password hygiene are super important. They're literally the keys to the kingdom. So what should we do? Incorporating good password policies into an organization is key to ensuring that employees are securing their accounts with strong passwords. A good password policy system would enforce length requirements, character complexity, and check for the presence of dictionary words, which would undermine the strength of passwords. Passwords should never be written down or recorded in plain text, reused across accounts, or be shared with anyone. Password reuse is a risk because in the event the password for one account is compromised, other accounts using the same password would also be at risk. Sharing passwords should also be a no-go, since this undermines the identity of an account because someone else now has the ability to log in as that user. Along with requiring the use of strong passwords, a password rotation policy is also recommended, since this safeguards against potential undetected compromise of passwords. But it's important that a password rotation period isn't too short. Why? The inconvenience of having to change passwords so often may actually encourage poor security behavior by users. So let's say you required your organization to create highly complex passwords and to change them every three months. It's very likely that a significant percentage of users would write down their passwords on post-it notes or on their phones, a big no-no. Despite the policy being designed to increase security, it actually has the opposite effect because of the inconvenience it causes your users. Welcome back. Let's dive right in. Another interesting application of cryptography concepts is the Trusted Platform Module, or TPM. This is a hardware device that's typically integrated into the hardware of a computer that's a dedicated crypto processor. TPMs offer secure generation of keys, random number generation, remote attestation, and data binding and sealing. A TPM has unique secret RSA key burned into the hardware at the time of manufacture which allows the TPM to perform things like hardware authentication. This can detect unauthorized hardware changes to a system. Remote attestation is the idea of a system authenticating its software and hardware configuration to a remote system. This enables the remote system to determine the integrity of the remote system. This can be done using a TPM by generating a secure hash of the system configuration using the unique RSA key embedded in the TPM itself. Another use of this secret hardware-backed encryption key is data binding and sealing. It involves using the secret key to derive a unique key that's then used for encryption of data. Basically, this binds the encrypted data to the TPM and, by extension, the system the TPM is installed in, since only the keys stored in hardware in the TPM will be able to decrypt the data. Data sealing is similar to binding, since data is encrypted using the hardware-backed encryption key. But in order for the data to be decrypted, the TPM must be in a specified state. TPM is a standard with several revisions that can be implemented as a discrete hardware chip, integrated into another chip in the system, implemented in firmware or software, or virtualized in a hypervisor. The most secure implementation is the discrete chip, since these chip packages also incorporate physical tamper resistance to prevent physical attacks on the chip. Mobile devices have something similar, referred to as a secure element. Similar to a TPM, it's a tamper-resistant chip often embedded in the microprocessor or integrated into the main board of a mobile device. It supplies secure storage of cryptographic keys and provides a secure environment for applications. An evolution of secure elements is the Trusted Execution Environment, or T, which takes the concept a bit further. It provides a full-blown, isolated execution environment that runs alongside the main OS. This provides isolation of the applications from the main OS and other applications installed there. It also isolates secure processes from each other when running in the T. TPMs have received criticism around trusting the manufacturer. Since the secret key is burned into the hardware at the time of manufacture, the manufacturer would have access to this key at the time. It is possible for the manufacturer to store the keys that could then be used to duplicate a TPM that could break the security the module is supposed to provide. There's been one report of a physical attack on a TPM 
which allowed a security researcher to view and access the entire contents of a TPM. But this attack required the use of an electron microscope and micron precision equipment for manipulating the TPM's circuitry. While the process was incredibly time intensive and required highly specialized equipment, it proved that such an attack is possible, despite the tamper protections in place. You can read more about it just after this video. TPMs are most commonly used to ensure platform integrity, preventing unauthorized changes to the system, either in software or hardware, and full disk encryption, utilizing the TPM to protect the entire contents of the disk. Full disk encryption, or FTE, as you might have guessed from the name, is the practice of encrypting the entire drive of the system, not just sensitive files in the system. This allows us to protect the entire contents of the disk from data theft or tampering. Now, there are a bunch of options for implementing FTE, like the commercial product PGP, BitLocker from Microsoft, which integrates very well with TPMs, FileVault 2 from Apple, and the open source software DMCrypt, which provides encryption for Linux systems. An FTE configuration will have one partition or logical partition that holds the data to be encrypted, typically the root volume where the OS is installed. But in order for the volume to be booted, it must first be unlocked at boot time. Because the volume is encrypted, the BIOS can't access data on this volume for boot purposes. This is why FDE configurations will have a small unencrypted boot partition that contains elements like the kernel, bootloader, and initRD. At boot time, these elements are loaded, which then prompts the user to enter a passphrase to unlock the disk and continue the boot process. FTE can also incorporate the TPM, utilizing the TPM encryption keys to protect the disk. And it has platform integrity to prevent unlocking of the disk if the system configuration has changed. This protects against attacks like hardware tampering and disk theft or cloning. Before we wrap up this module on encryption, I wanted to touch base on the concept of random. Earlier, when we covered the various encryption systems, one commonality kept coming up that these systems rely on. Did you notice what it was? That's OK if you didn't. It's the selection of random numbers. This is a very important concept in encryption, because if your number selection process isn't truly random, then there can be some kind of pattern that an adversary could discover through close observation and analysis of encrypted messages over time. Something that isn't truly random is referred to as pseudo-random. It's for this reason that operating systems maintain what's referred to as an entropy pool. This is essentially a source of random data to help seed random number generators. There's also dedicated random number generators and pseudo-random number generators that can be incorporated into a security appliance or server to ensure that truly random numbers are chosen when generating cryptographic keys. I hope you found these topics in cryptography interesting and informative. I know I did when I first learned about them. In the next module, we'll cover the three A's of security, authentication, authorization, and accounting. These three A's are awesome, and I'll tell you why in the next module. But before we get there, one final quiz on the cryptographic concept we've covered so far. In the last video, we learned about basic authentication in the form of username password, sometimes referred to as single factor authentication. But there are other, more complex and secure authentication mechanisms. Keep in mind the security versus usability trade-off as we work through the different types of multi-factor authentication. Multi-factor authentication is a system where users are authenticated by presenting multiple pieces of information or objects. The many factors that comprise a multi-factor authentication system can be categorized into three types. Something you know, something you have, and something you are. Ideally, a multi-factor system will incorporate at least two of these factors. Something you know would be something like a password or a PIN for your bank or ATM card. Something you have would be a physical token, like your ATM or bank card. Something you are would be a piece of biometric data, like a fingerprint or iris scan. The premise behind multi-factor authentication is that an attacker would find it much more difficult to steal or clone multiple factors of authentication, assuming different types are used. If multiple passwords are used, security isn't enhanced by that much. This is because passwords, however many, 
are still susceptible to phishing or keylogging attacks. By using a password in conjunction with a security token is a game changer. Even if the password is compromised by a phishing attack, the attacker would also need to steal or clone the physical token to be able to access the account. And that's much less likely to happen. We won't cover passwords again here, since we talked about them in detail in the last section. But here's the quick rundown. Physical tokens can take a few different forms. Common ones include a USB device with a secret token on it, a standalone device which generates a token, or even a simple key used with a traditional lock. A physical token that's commonly used generates a short-lived token, typically a number that's entered along with a username and password. This number is commonly called a one-time password, or OTP, since it's short-lived and constantly changing value. An example of this is the RSA Secure ID token. It's a small, battery-powered device with an LCD display that shows a one-time password that's rotated periodically. This is a time-based token, sometimes called a TOTP, and operates by having a secret seed, or randomly generated, value on the token that's registered with the authentication server. This seed value is used in conjunction with the current time to generate a one-time password. Now, as long as the user has possession of their token or can view the display of the token, they're able to log in. I should also call out that the scheme requires the time between the authenticator token and the authentication server to be relatively synchronized. This is usually achieved by using the network time protocol, or NTP. An attacker would need to either steal the physical token or clone the token if they're able to steal the secret seed value. Since a time-based token is synchronized with the server using time, which is not a secret, that would be sufficient for an attacker to clone a token. There are also counter-based tokens, which use a secret seed value along with a secret counter value that's incremented every time a one-time password is generated on the device. The value is then incremented on the server upon successful authentication. This is more secure than the time-based tokens for two reasons. First, the attacker would need to recover the seed value and the counter value. Second, the counter value is also incrementing when it's being used. So a clone token would only be useful for a short period of time before the counter value changes too much and the clone token becomes unsynchronized from the real token and the server. These token generators can either be physical, dedicated devices, or they can be an app installed on a smartphone that performs the same functionality. Another very common method for handling multi-factor today is the delivery of one-time password tokens using SMS. But this has been subject to some criticism because of the observed attacks through this channel. The problem with relying on SMS to transmit an additional authentication factor is that you're dependent on the security processes of the mobile carrier. SMS isn't encrypted, nor is it private, and it's possible for SMS to be intercepted by a well-funded attacker. Even worse, there have been accounts of SMS-based multi-factor codes being stolen by calling the mobile provider. The attacker impersonates the owner of the line of service to redirect phone calls and SMS to a phone the attacker controls. If the attacker has already compromised the password and can get SMS redirected to them, they now get full access to the account. Of course, there's a convenience trade-off when you use a physical token you have to carry around another device in order to authenticate. If the device is lost or damaged, the user won't be able to authenticate until the device is replaced. This also requires support overhead, since devices will fail, be lost, run out of batteries, and get out of sync with the server. Using an app on a smartphone addresses some of these issues, but still requires some additional support and inconvenience. When prompted to log in, the user must retrieve a device or phone from their pocket and manually transcribe the numbers into the authentication page. These generated one-time passwords are also susceptible to man-in-the-middle style phishing attacks. A user can be tricked into going to a fake authentication page by sending a phishing email, something on the lines of, your account has been compromised, please log in and change your password immediately. When the victim enters their credentials in the fake page, including the one-time password, the attacker has all the information needed to take over the account. The other category of multi-factor authentication is biometrics, which has gained in popularity in recent years, especially in mobile devices. 
Biometric authentication is the process of using unique physiological characteristics of an individual to identify them. By confirming the biometric signature, the individual is authenticated. A very common use of this in mobile devices is fingerprint scanners to unlock phones. This works by registering your fingerprints first using an optical sensor that captures images of the unique pattern of your fingerprint. Much like how passwords should never be stored in plain text, biometric data used for authentication should also never be stored directly. This is even more important for handling biometric data. Unlike passwords, biometrics are an inherent part of who someone is, so there are privacy implications to theft or leaks of biometric data. Biometric characteristics can also be super difficult to change in the event that they're compromised, unlike passwords. So instead of storing the fingerprint data directly, the data is run through a hashing algorithm and the resulting unique hash is stored. One advantage of biometric authentication over knowledge or token-based systems is that it's more reliable to identify an individual for authentication, since biometric features aren't usually shareable. For example, you can't give your friend your fingerprint so that they can log in as you. Well, you'd hope not anyway. But as schools start to introduce fingerprint-based attendance recording systems, students are finding ways to trick the system. They're creating fake fingerprints using things like glue, allowing friends to mark each other as present if they're late or if they skip school. This is harder to achieve than sharing a password, but it's sort of ingenious of these kids to think up. They really go the extra mile to skip school these days. Not that I'm condoning this behavior, but you can read more about it just after this video. Other biometric systems use features like iris scans, facial recognition, gate detection, and even voice. Microsoft developed the biometric authentication system for Windows 10 called Windows Hello, which supports fingerprint identification, iris identification, and facial recognition. It uses two cameras, one for color and one for infrared, which allows for depth detection. This way, it's not possible to trick the system using a printout of an authorized user's face. An evolution of physical tokens is the U2F, or Universal Second Factor. It's a standard developed jointly by Google, Ubico, and NXP Semiconductors. The finalized standard for U2F are being hosted by the FIDO Alliance. U2F incorporates a challenge response mechanism, along with public key cryptography, to implement a more secure and more convenient second factor authentication solution. U2F tokens are referred to as security keys and are available from a range of manufacturers. Support for U2F authentication is built into the Chrome browser and the Opera browser, with native Firefox support coming soon. Security keys are essentially small embedded crypto processors that have secure storage of asymmetric keys and additional slots to run embedded code. Let's do a quick rundown on how exactly security keys work and how they're improvement over an OTP solution. The first step is registration, since the security key must be registered with a site or service. At registration time, the security key generates a private public key pair unique to that site and submits the public key to the site for registration. It also binds the identity of the site with the key pair. The reason for unique key pairs for each site is for privacy reasons. If a site is compromised, this prevents cross-referencing registered public keys and discovering commonalities between sites based on registration data. Once registered with a site, the next time you're prompted to authenticate, you'll be prompted for your username and password as usual. But afterwards, you'll be prompted to tap your security key. When you physically tap the security key, it's a small check for user presence to ensure malware can't authenticate on your behalf without your knowledge. This tap will unlock the private key stored in the security key, which is used to authenticate. The authentication happens as a challenge response process, which protects against replay attacks. This is because the authentication session can't be used again later by an eavesdropper, because the challenge and resulting response will be different with every authentication session. What happens is the site generates a challenge, essentially some randomized data, and sends this to the client that's attempting to authenticate. The client will then select the private key matching the site and use this key to sign the challenge and send the signed data back. The site can now verify the signature using the public key that was registered earlier. If the signature checks out, the user is authenticated. From a security perspective, this is a much more secure design than OTPs. This is because the authentication flow 
is protected from phishing attacks given the interactive nature of the process. While U2F doesn't directly protect against man-in-the-middle attacks, the authentication should take place over a secure TLS connection, which would provide protection from this type of attack. Security keys are also resistant to cloning or forgery because they have unique embedded secrets on them and are protected from tampering. From the convenience perspective, this is a much nicer authentication flow compared to OTPs, since the user doesn't have to manually transcribe a string of numbers into the authentication dialog. All they have to do is tap their security key. Nice and easy. As an IT support specialist, you may come across multi-factor authentication setups that you'd be responsible for supporting. You might even be tasked with helping to implement one. So it's important to understand how they provide enhanced account protection along with the options that are available. In the last section, we mentioned client certificates as a form of authentication. As we learned earlier, certificates are public keys that are signed by a certificate authority, or CA, as a sign of trust. We covered TLS server certificates, but there can also be client certificates. These operate very similarly to server certificates, but are presented by clients and allow servers to authenticate and verify clients. As an IT support specialist, it's important for you to understand client certificates and certificate-based authentication, since you might encounter these in the course of your career. It's not uncommon for VPN systems or enterprise Wi-Fi setups to use client certificates for authentication, so understanding how they work will help you troubleshoot issues. In order to issue client certificates, an organization must set up and maintain CA infrastructure to issue and sign certificates. Part of certificate authentication also involves the client authenticating the server, giving us mutual authentication. This is a positive since the client can verify that it's talking to the real authentication server and not an impersonator. In this case, all clients that are using certificate authentication would also need to have the CA's certificate in their certificate trust store. This establishes trust with the CA and allows the client to verify it's talking to the real server when trying to authenticate. Certificate authentication is like presenting identification at the airport. You show your ID or your certificate to prove who you are. The ID is checked to see if it was issued by an authority that is trusted by the verifier. Was it issued by a government entity or is it a novelty license from a gift shop? Obviously, one of those IDs would be accepted at the airport, similar to a certificate being signed by a trusted CA. When you're at the airport, the expiration date on your ID will also be checked to ensure it's still valid. The same thing applies to certificate authentication, although the certificates have two dates that need to be verified, not valid before and not valid after. Not valid before is checking if the certificate is valid yet, since it's possible to have certificates issued for future use. Not valid after is a straightforward expiration date after which the certificate is no longer valid. Airport authorities also have a list of specific IDs that are flagged. If your ID is on that list, then you'll be rejected for air travel. Similarly, the certificate will be checked against the revocation list, or a CRL. This is a signed list published by the CA which defines certificates that have been explicitly revoked. One last step that's performed as part of the authentication server verification process is to prove possession of the corresponding private key, since the certificate is a signed public key. If we don't prove possession, there's nothing stopping an attacker from copying the certificate, since it's not considered secret and pretending to be the owner. To avoid this, possession of the private key is verified through a challenge response mechanism. This is where the server requests a randomized bit of data to be signed using the private key corresponding to the public key presented for authentication. This is similar to how the airport checks the photo on your ID to make sure you look like the person in the photo and aren't impersonating them. LDAP, or Lightweight Directory Access Protocol, is an open industry standard protocol for accessing and maintaining directory services, 
When we say directory services, we're referring to something similar to a phone or email directory. It's most commonly used as a backend for authentication of accounts. The LDAP specification describes the data structure of, of the directory itself and defines functions for interacting with the service, like performing lookups and modifying data. You can think of a directory like a database, but with more details or attributes describing entities within the database. The structure of an LDAP directory is a sort of tree layout and is optimized for retrieval of data more so than writing. Think of it as being similar to a phone book, being used for looking up data far more often than making modifications to that data. Directories can be hosted across lots of different LDAP servers to facilitate more rapid lookups and are kept in sync through replication of the directory. So what kind of data gets stored in a directory entry exactly? Similar to an address book, an entry for a particular user will contain information pertaining to that user account, like their first and last name, phone number, desk location, email address, login shell, and other such data. Along with object attributes, the location of an entry within the overall data structure will represent information pertaining to the objects as relationships between objects. Because LDAP uses a tree structure called a data information tree, objects will have one parent and can have one or more children that belong to the parent object. You can also think about this like a file system with a root file system and folders under that. The folder an object belongs to will provide information about that object because of its relationship to the parent object. In LDAP language, we call these folders organizational units, or OUs. They let us group related objects into units, like people or groups, to distinguish between individual user accounts and groups that accounts can belong to. This tree structure also allows for inheritance and nesting of objects, where attributes or properties of a parent object can be inherited by children further down the tree. Now, since it's possible for entries in the directory to share attributes, there must be a unique identifier for each entry. We call this distinguished name, or DN. Coming back to our file system analogy, you can think of a DN as a full path to a file, as opposed to a file name. This is because you can have multiple files with the same file name across a file system, but the fully qualified path to the file would describe one unique file. Some of the more common operations that can be called by a client to interact with an LDAP server are bind, which is how clients authenticate to the server, start TLS, which permits a client to communicate using LDAP v3 over TLS, search for performing lookups and retrieval of records, add, delete, modify, which are various operations to write data to the directory, and unbind, which closes the connection to the LDAP server. Now, there are many implementations of LDAP servers, like Active Directory from Microsoft and Open LDAP for open source implementations. RADIUS, or Remote Authentication Dial-in User Service, is a protocol that provides AAA services for users on a network. It's a very common protocol used to manage access to internal networks, Wi-Fi networks, email services, and VPN services. Originally designed to transport authentication information for remote dial-up users, it's evolved to carry a wide variety of standard authentication protocols, like EAP, or Extensible Authentication Protocol. While it's unlikely that you'd be responsible for configuring a RADIUS server as an IT support specialist, you might be supporting clients that authenticate against a RADIUS backend server. In those cases, it's good to understand what role the RADIUS server plays in this authentication scenario, so you're better prepared to troubleshoot issues that may come up. Clients who want to authenticate to a RADIUS server don't directly interact with it. Instead, when a client wants to access a resource that's protected, the client will present authentication credentials to a NAS, or network access server, which will relay the credentials to the RADIUS server. The RADIUS server will then verify the credentials using a configured authentication scheme. RADIUS servers can verify user authentication information stored in a flat file, or can plug into external sources, like SQL databases, LDAP, Kerberos, or Active Directory. Once the RADIUS server has evaluated the user authentication request, it replies with one of three messages, access reject, 
access challenge, or access accept. Kerberos is a network authentication protocol that uses tickets to allow entities to prove their identity over potentially insecure channels to provide mutual authentication. It also uses symmetric encryption to protect protocol messages from eavesdropping and replay attacks. The name Kerberos is taken from the Greek mythical character of the same name, a three-headed guard dog protecting the gates to Hades, the underworld. Seems like an appropriate choice for an authentication protocol, don't you think? Kerberos was originally developed at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology in the US and was published in the 1980s as version 4. Years later, in 1993, version 5 was published. Today, Kerberos supports AES encryption and implements checksums to ensure data integrity and confidentiality. When joined to a Windows domain, Windows 2000 and newer versions will use Kerberos as the default authentication protocol. Microsoft also implemented their own Kerberos service with some modifications to the open protocol, like the addition of the RC4 stream cipher. We mentioned tickets earlier, which is a sort of token that proves your identity. They can be used for authenticating to services protected using Kerberos, or in other words, are within the Kerberos realm. The authentication tickets let users authenticate to services without requiring username and password authentication for every service individually. A ticket will expire after some time, but has provisions for automatic, transparent renewal of the ticket. Let's run down the details of how the Kerberos protocol operates. First, a user that wants to authenticate enters their username and password on their client machine. Their Kerberos client software will then take the password and generate a symmetric encryption key from it. Next, the client sends a plain text message to the Kerberos AS, or authentication server, which includes the user ID of the authenticating user. The password or secret key derived from the password aren't transmitted. The AS uses the user ID to check if there's an account in the authentication database, like an Active Directory server. If so, the AS will generate the secret key using the hashed password stored in the key distribution center server. The AS will then use this secret key to encrypt and send a message containing the client TGS session key. This is a secret key used for encrypting communications with the ticket granting service, or TGS, which is already known by the authentication server. The AS also sends a second message with a ticket granting ticket, or TGT which is encrypted using the TGS secret key. The ticket granting ticket has information like the client ID, ticket validity period, and the client ticket granting service session key. So the first message can be decrypted using the shared secret key derived from the user password. It then provides the secret key that can decrypt the second message, giving the client a valid ticket granting ticket. Now the client has enough information to authenticate with the ticket granting server. Since the client has authenticated and received a valid ticket granting ticket, it can use the ticket granting ticket to request access to services from within the Kerberos realm. This is done by sending a message to the ticket granting service with the encrypted ticket granting ticket received from the AS earlier, along with the service name or ID the client is requesting access to. The client also sends a message containing an authenticator, which has the client ID and a timestamp that's encrypted with the client ticking granting ticket session key from the AS. The ticket granting service decrypts the ticket granting ticket using the ticket granting service secret key, which provides the ticket granting service with the client ticket granting service session key. It then uses the key to decrypt the authenticator message. Next, it checks the client ID of these two messages to ensure they match. If they do, it sends two messages back to the client. The first one contains the client to server ticket, which is comprised of the client ID, client address, validity period, and the client server session key encrypted using the service's secret key. The second message contains the client server session key itself and is encrypted using the client ticket granted service session key. Finally, 
the client has enough information to authenticate itself to the service server, or SS. The client sends two messages to the SS. The first message is the encrypted client-to-server ticket received from the ticket-granting service. The second is a new authenticator with the client ID and timestamp, encrypted using the client-server session key. The SS decrypts the first message using its secret key, which provides it with the client-server session key. The key is then used to decrypt the second message, and it compares the client ID in the authenticator to the one included in the client-to-server ticket. If these IDs match, then the SS sends a message containing the timestamp from the client-supplied authenticator, encrypted using the client-server session key. The client then decrypts this message and checks that the timestamp is correct, authenticating the server. If this all succeeds, then the server grants access to the requested service on the client. Wow, OK, are you with me? I know, that was a lot. Kerberos has received some criticism because it's a single monolithic service. This creates a single point of failure danger. If the Kerberos service goes down, new users won't be able to authenticate and log in. Aside from availability issues, if the central Kerberos server is compromised, the attacker would be able to impersonate any user by generating valid Kerberos tickets for their user account. Kerberos enforces strict time requirements, requiring the client and server clocks to be relatively closely synchronized. Otherwise, authentication will fail. This is usually accomplished by using NTP to keep both parties synchronized using an NTP server. The trust model of Kerberos is also problematic, since it requires clients and services to have an established trust in the Kerberos server in order to authenticate using Kerberos. This means it's not possible for users to authenticate using Kerberos from unknown or untrusted clients. So things like BYOD, or bring your own device, and cloud computing are incompatible, or at least very challenging to implement securely with Kerberos authentication. Now, as an IT support specialist, you're likely to encounter Kerberos authentication, especially in environments running Microsoft Active Directory. Understanding how the underlying protocol functions will help when troubleshooting issues that may come with it. T-A-C-A-C-S plus, pronounced TechAx plus. It stands for Terminal Access Controller Access Control System Plus. It's a Cisco-developed AAA protocol that was released as an open standard in 1993. It replaced the older TechAx protocol developed in 1984 for MilNet, the unclassified network for DARPA, which later evolved into NipperNet. TechAx Plus also took the place of XTACACS, or Extended TechAx, which was a Cisco proprietary extension on top of TechAx. TechAx Plus is primarily used for device administration, authentication, authorization, and accounting, as opposed to RADIUS, which is mostly used for network access AAA. It's important to call out these differences and the characteristics of what these services provide, though the differences are primarily related to the authorization and accounting portions more so than authentication. While you might not encounter a TechAx Plus implementation in the course of your support career, it's something that you should be aware of. TechAx Plus is mainly used as an authentication system for network infrastructure devices, which tend to be high-value targets for attackers. This may be something to consider implementing as your organization grows. Single sign-on, or SSO, is an authentication concept that allows users to authenticate once to be granted access to a lot of different services and applications. Since re-authentication for each service isn't needed, users don't need multiple sets of usernames and passwords across a mix of applications and services. SSO is accomplished by authenticating to a central authentication server, like an LDAP server. This then provides a cookie, or token, that can be used to get access to applications configured to use SSO. Kerberos is actually a good example of an SSO authentication service. The user would authenticate against the Kerberos service once, 
which would then grant them a ticket granting ticket. This can then be presented to the ticket granting service in place of traditional credentials. So the user can enter credentials once and gain access to a variety of services. SSO is really convenient. It allows users to have one set of credentials that grant access to lots of services, making it less likely that passwords will be written down or stored insecurely. This should also reduce the overhead for password assistance support and removes time spent re-authenticating throughout the workday. So what's the downside? Well, an attacker that manages to compromise an account has a lot more access under an SSO scheme. User credentials will grant access to all applications and services that that account is permitted to access. So a big plug here for using multi-factor authentication in conjunction with an SSO scheme. But this opens a new channel of attack, theft of SSO session cookies or tokens. Instead of targeting credentials directly, attackers can try to steal the SSO tokens directly, which will permit wide access, if even for a short amount of time. Stealing these tokens also lets an attacker dodge multi-factor authentication protections, since the session token permits access without requiring full authentication until the token expires. An example of an SSO system is the OpenID Decentralized Authentication System. This is an open standard that allows participating sites, known as relying parties, to allow authentication of users utilizing a third-party authentication service. This allows sites to permit authentication without requiring the site itself to have authentication infrastructure, which can be tricky to implement and maintain. It also lets users access a site without requiring them to create a new account, simplifying access management across a wide variety of sites. Instead, a user just needs to already have an account with an identity provider. To ask for authentication, first the relying party looks up the OpenID provider, then establishes a shared secret with the provider if one doesn't already exist. This shared secret will be used to validate the OpenID provider messages. Then, the user will be redirected or asked to authenticate in a new window through the identity's provider's login flow. Once authenticated, the user will be prompted to confirm if they trust the relying party or not. Once confirmed, credentials are relayed to the relying party, typically in the form of a token, not actual user credentials, which indicates the user is now authenticated to the service. Now it's time for a practice quiz on authentication. Earlier, we covered authentication, the first component of the three A's of security. Next up, we'll cover authorization, which is usually tightly coupled with authentication. Now, while authentication is related to verifying the identity of a user, authorization pertains to describing what the user account has access to or doesn't have access to. These are separate and distinct components of AAA that have different purposes. A user may successfully authenticate to a system by presenting valid credentials, but if the username they authenticated as isn't also authorized to access the system in question, they'll be denied access. When we talked about Kerberos earlier, the user authenticated and received a ticket granting ticket. This can then be used to request access to a specific service by sending a request to the ticket granting service. This is when authorization comes into play, since the ticket granting service will decide whether or not the user in question is permitted to access the service being requested. If they're not permitted or authorized to access the service, the request would be denied by the ticket granting service. If the user is authorized, the ticket granting service would return a ticket which authorizes the user to access the service. One very popular open standard for authorization and access delegation is OAuth, used by companies like Google, Facebook, and Microsoft. We'll go into OAuth in the next video. OAuth is an open standard that allows users to grant third-party websites and applications access to their information without sharing account credentials. This can be thought of as a form of access delegation because access to the user's account is being delegated to the third party. This is accomplished by prompting the user to confirm that they agree to permit the third party access 
to certain information about their account. Typically, this prompt will specifically list which pieces of information or access are being requested. Once confirmed, the identity provider will supply the third party with a token that gives them access to the user's information. This token can then be used by the third party to access data or services offered by the identity provider directly on behalf of the user. OAuth is commonly used to grant access to third-party applications to APIs offered by large internet companies like Google, Microsoft, and Facebook. Let's say you want to use a third-party meme creation website. This website lets you create memes using templates and gives you the option to save your creations and email them to your friends. Instead of the site sending the emails directly, which would appear to be coming from an address your friends wouldn't recognize, the site uses OAuth to get permission to send the memes using your email account directly. This is done by making an OAuth request to your email provider. Once you approve this request, the email provider issues an access token to the site, which grants the site access to your email account. The access token would have a scope, which says that it can only be used to access email, not other services associated with the account. So, it can access email, but not your cloud storage files or calendar, for example. It's important that users pay attention to what third party is requesting access and what exactly they're granting access to. OAuth permissions can be used in phishing-style attacks to gain access to accounts without requiring credentials to be compromised. This works by sending phishing emails to potential victims that look like legitimate OAuth authorization requests which ask the user to grant access to some aspects of their account through OAuth. Once the user grants access, the attacker has access to the account through the OAuth authorization token. This was used in an OAuth-based worm attack in early 2017. There was a rash of phishing emails that appeared to be from a friend or colleague who wanted to share a Google Doc. When the sharing link was followed, the victim was prompted to log in and authorize access to email, documents, and contacts for some third-party service, which only identified itself as the name Google Apps. But it was actually a malicious service that would then email contacts from their email account, perpetuating the attack. In case you'd like to read more about it, I've included a link in the next reading. It's important to distinguish between OAuth and OpenID. OAuth is specifically an authorization system, and OpenID is an authentication system though they're usually used together. OpenID Connect is an authentication layer built on top of OAuth 2.0, designed to improve upon OpenID and build better integration with OAuth authorizations. Since Tecax Plus is a full AAA system, it also handles authorization along with authentication. This is done once a user is authenticated by allowing or disallowing access for the user account to run certain commands or access certain devices. This lets you not only allow admin access for users that administer devices, while still allowing less privileged access to other users when necessary. Here's an example. Since your networking teams are responsible for configuring and maintaining your network switches, routers, and other infrastructure, you'd give them admin access to your network and equipment. Meanwhile, you can have limited read-only access to your support team, since they don't need to be able to make changes to switch configurations in their jobs. Read-only access is enough for them to troubleshoot problems. The rest of the user accounts would have no access at all and wouldn't be permitted to connect to the networking infrastructure. Some more sophisticated or configurable AAA systems may even allow further refinement of authorization down to the command level. This gives you much more flexibility in how your access is granted to specific users or groups in your organization. RADIUS also allows you to authorize network access. For example, you may want to permit some users to have Wi-Fi and VPN access, while others may not need this. When they authenticate to the RADIUS server, if the authentication succeeds, the RADIUS server returns configuration information to the network access server. This includes authorizations, which specifies what network services the user is permitted to access. We briefly mentioned host-based firewalls when we talked about network monitoring and intrusion detection systems. Host-based firewalls are important to creating multiple layers of security. 
they protect individual hosts from being compromised when they're used in untrusted and potentially malicious environments. They also protect individual hosts from potentially compromised peers inside a trusted network. Our network-based firewall has a duty to protect our internal network by filtering traffic in and out of it, while the host-based firewall on each individual host protects that one machine. Like our network-based firewall, we'd still want to start with an implicit deny rule. Then we'd selectively enable specific services and ports that'll be used. This lets us start with a secure default and then only permits traffic that we know and trust. You can think of this as starting with a perfectly secure firewall configuration and then poking holes in it for the specific traffic we require. This may look very different from your network firewall configuration since it's unlikely that your employees would need remote SSH access to their laptops, for example. Remember that to secure systems, you need to minimize attack surfaces or exposure. A host-based firewall plays a big part in reducing what's accessible to an outside attacker. It provides flexibility while only permitting connections to selective services on a given host from specific networks or IP ranges. This ability to restrict connections from certain origins is usually used to implement a highly secure host or network. From there, access to critical or sensitive systems or infrastructure is permitted. These are called bastion hosts or networks and are specifically hardened and minimized to reduce what's permitted to run on them. Bastion hosts are usually exposed to the internet, so you should pay special attention to hardening and locking them down to reduce the chances of compromise. But they can also be used as a sort of gateway or access portal into more sensitive services like core authentication servers or domain controllers. This would let you implement more secure authentication mechanisms and ACLs on the Bastion hosts without making it inconvenient for your entire company. Monitoring and logging can be prioritized for these hosts more easily. Typically, these hosts or networks would also have severely limited network connectivity. It's usually just to the secure zone that they're designed to protect and not much else. Applications that are allowed to be installed and run on these hosts would also be restricted to those that are strictly necessary since these machines have one specific purpose. Part of the host-based firewall rules will likely also provide ACLs that allow access from the VPN subnet. It's good practice to keep the network that VPN clients connect into separate using both subnetting and VLANs. This gives you more flexibility to enforce security on these VPN clients. It also lets you build additional layers of defenses. While a VPN host should be protected using other means, it's still a host that's operating in a potentially malicious environment. This host is then initiating a remote connection into your trusted internal network. These hosts represent another potential vector of attack and compromise. Your ability to separately monitor traffic coming and going from them is super useful. There's an important thing for you to consider when it comes to host-based firewalls, especially for client systems like laptops. If the users of the system have administrator rights, then they have the ability to change firewall rules and configurations. This is something you should keep in mind and make sure to monitor with logging. If management tools allow it, you should also prevent the disabling of the host-based firewall. This can be done with Microsoft Windows machines when administered using Active Directory, as an example. A critical part of any security architecture is logging and alerting. It wouldn't do much good to have all these defenses in place if we have no idea if they're working or not. We need visibility into the security systems in place to see what kind of traffic they're seeing. We also need to have the visibility into the logs of all of our infrastructure devices and equipment that we manage. But it's not enough to just have logs. We also need ways to safeguard logs and make them easy to analyze and review. If there's a dedicated security team at your company, they would be performing this analysis. But at a smaller company, this responsibility would likely fall to the IT team. So let's make sure you're prepared with the skills you might need for incident investigation. 
Many investigative techniques can also be applied to troubleshooting. All systems and services running on hosts will create logs of some kind with different levels of detail. It depends on what it's logging and what events it's configured to log. So an authentication server would log every authentication attempt, whether it's successful or not. A firewall would log traffic that matches rules, with details like source and destination addresses and ports being used. All this logged information gives us details about the traffic and activity that's happening on our network and systems. This can be used to detect compromise or attempts to attack the system. When there are a large number of systems located around your network, each with their own log format, it can be challenging to make meaningful sense of all this data. This is where security information and event management systems, or SIEMs, come in. A SIEM can be thought of as a centralized log server. It has some extra analysis features, too. In the System Administration and IT Infrastructure course of this program, you learn ways that centralized logging can help you administer multiple machines at once. You can think of SIEM as a form of centralized logging for security administration purposes. A SIEM system gets logs from a bunch of other systems. It consolidates the logs from all different places and places it in one centralized location. This makes handling logs a lot easier. As an IT support specialist, an important step you'll take in logs analysis is normalization. This is the process of taking log data in different formats and converting it into a standardized format that's consistent with a defined log structure. As an IT support specialist, you might configure normalization for your log sources. For example, log entries from our firewall may have a timestamp using a year, month, and day format, while logs from our client machines may use day, month, year format. To normalize this data, you'd choose one standard date format. Then you'd define what the fields are for the log types that need to be converted. When logs are received from these machines, the log entries are converted into the standard that we defined and stored by the logging server. This lets you analyze and compare log data between different log types and systems in a much easier fashion. So what type of information should you be logging? Well, that's a great question. If you log too much info, it's difficult to analyze the data and find useful information. Plus, storage requirements for saving the logs become expensive very quickly. But if you log too little, then the information won't provide any useful insights into your systems and network. Finding that middle ground can be difficult. It will vary depending on the unique characteristics of the systems being monitored and the type of activity on the network. No matter what events are logged, all of them should have information that will help understand what happened and reconstruct the events. There are lots of important fields to capture in log entries, like timestamp, the event or error code, the service or application being logged, the user or system account associated with the event, and the devices involved in the event. Timestamps are super important to understanding when an event occurred. Fields like source and destination addresses will tell us who was talking to whom. For application logs, you can grab useful information from the logged in user associated with the event and from what client they used. On top of the analysis assistance it provides, a centralized log server also has security benefits. By maintaining logs on a dedicated system, it's easier to secure this system from attack. Logs are usually targeted by attackers after a breach so that they can cover their tracks. By having critical systems send logs to a remote logging server that's locked down, the details of a breach should still be logged. A forensics team will be able to reconstruct the events that led to the compromise. Once we have logging configured and the relevant events recorded on a centralized log server, what do we do with all the data? Well, analyzing log details depends on what you're trying to achieve. Typically, when you look at aggregated logs as an IT support specialist, you should pay attention to patterns and connections between traffic. So if you're seeing a large percentage of Windows hosts all connecting to specific address outside your network, that might be worth investigating. It could signal a malware infection. Once logs are centralized and standardized, you can write automated alerting based on rules. Maybe you'll want to define an alert rule for repeated unsuccessful attempts to authenticate to a critical authentication server. Lots of SIEM solutions also offer handy dashboards to help analysts visualize this data. Having data in a visual format can potentially provide more insight. 
you can also write some of your own monitoring and alert systems. Now, it doesn't matter if you're using a SIEM solution or writing your own. It can be useful to break down things like commonly used protocols in the network, quickly see the top talkers in the network, and view reported errors over time to reveal patterns. Speaking of top talkers, I have just one more thing to call out, but we'll take a break before the next video. Another important component to logging to keep in mind as an IT support specialist is retention. Your log storage needs will vary based on the amount of systems being logged, the amount of detail logged, and the rate at which logs are created. How long you want or need to keep logs around will also really influence the storage requirements for a log server. Some examples of logging servers and SIEM solutions are the open source R syslog, Splunk Enterprise Security, IBM Security Q Radar, and RSA Security Analytics. You can learn more about these solutions in the supplementary readings of this lesson. OK, break time. I'll see you at the top of the next video on anti-malware protection. Anti-malware defenses are a core part of any company's security model in this day and age. So it's important as an IT support specialist to know what's out there. Today, the internet is full of bots, viruses, worms, and other automated attacks. Lots of unprotected systems would be compromised in a matter of minutes if directly connected to the internet without any safeguards or protections in place. And they need to have critical system updates. While modern operating systems have reduced this threat vector by having basic firewalls enabled by default, there's still a huge amount of attack traffic on the internet. Anti-malware measures play a super important role in keeping this type of attack off your systems and helping to protect your users. Antivirus software has been around for a really long time, but some security experts question the value it can provide to a company especially since more sophisticated malware and attacks have been spun up in recent years. Antivirus software is signature-based. This means that it has a database of signatures that identify known malware, like the unique file hash of a malicious binary, or the file associated with an infection. Or it could be the network traffic characteristics that malware uses to communicate with a command and control server. Antivirus software will monitor and analyze things like new files being created or being modified on the system in order to watch for any behavior that matches a known malware signature. If it detects activity that matches a signature, depending on the signature type, it will attempt to block the malware from harming the system. But some signatures might only be able to detect the malware after the infection has occurred. In that case, it may attempt to quarantine the infected files. If that's not possible, it'll just log and alert the detection event. At a high level, this is how all antivirus products work. There are two issues with antivirus software, though. The first is that they depend on antivirus signatures distributed by the antivirus software vendor. The second is that they depend on the antivirus vendor discovering new malware and writing new signatures for newly discovered threats. Until the vendor is able to write new signatures and publish and disseminate them, your antivirus software can't protect you from these emerging threats. Boo! Antivirus, which is designed to protect systems, actually represents an additional attack surface that attackers can exploit. You might be thinking, wait, our own antivirus tools can be another threat to our system? What's the deal with that? Well. This is because of the very nature of what an antivirus engine must do. It takes arbitrary and potentially malicious binaries as input and performs various operations on them. Because of this, there are a lot of complex code where very serious bugs could exist. Exactly this kind of vulnerability was found in the Sophos antivirus engine back in 2012. You can read more about this event in the supplementary readings. So it sounds like antivirus software isn't ideal and has some pretty large drawbacks. Then why are we still recommending it as a core piece of security design? The short answer is this. It protects against the most common attacks out there on the internet. The really obvious stuff that still poses a threat to your systems still needs to be defended against. 
Antivirus is an easy solution to provide that protection. It doesn't matter how much user education you instill in your employees. There will still be some folks who will click on an email that has an infected attachment. A good way to think about antivirus in today's very noisy external threat environment is like a filter for the attack noise on the internet today. It lets you remove the background noise and focus on the more important targeted or specific threats. Remember, our defense in depth concept involves multiple layers of protection. Antivirus software is just one piece of our anti-malware defenses. If antivirus can't protect us from the threats we don't know about, how do we protect against the unknown threats out there? Well, antivirus operates on a blacklist model, checking against a list of known bad things and blocking what gets matched. There's a class of anti-malware software that does the opposite. Binary whitelisting software operates off a whitelist. It's a list of known good and trusted software, and only things that are on the list are permitted to run. Everything else is blocked. You can think of this as applying the implicit deny ACL rule to software execution. By default, everything is blocked. Only things explicitly allowed to execute are able to. I should call out that this typically only applies to executable binaries, not arbitrary files like PDF documents or text files. This would naturally defend against any unknown threats, but at the cost of convenience. Think about how frequently you download and install new software on your machine. Now, imagine if you had to get approval before you could download and install any new software. That would be really annoying, don't you think? Now, imagine that every system update had to be whitelisted before it could be applied. Obviously, not trusting everything wouldn't be very sustainable. It's for this reason that binary whitelisting software can trust software using a couple different mechanisms. The first is using the unique cryptographic hash of binaries, which are used to identify unique binaries. This is used to whitelist individual executables. The other trust mechanism is a software signing certificate. Remember back when we discussed public key cryptography and signatures using public and private key pairs? Software signing, or code signing, is the same idea but applied to software. A software vendor can cryptographically sign binaries they distribute using a private key. The signature can be verified at execution time by checking the signature using the public key embedded in the certificate and verifying the trust chain of the public key. If the hash matches and the public key is trusted, then the software can be verified that it came from someone with the software vendor's code signing private key. Binary whitelisting systems can be configured to trust specific vendors' code signing certificates. They permit all binaries signed with that certificate to run. This is helpful for automatically trusting content, like system updates, along with software in common use that comes from reputable and trusted vendors. But can you guess the downside here? Each new code signing certificate that's trusted represents an increase in attack surface. An attacker could compromise the code signing certificate of a software vendor that your company trusts and use that to sign malware that targets your company. That would bypass any binary whitelisting defenses in place. Not good. This exact scenario happened back in 2013 to Bit9, a binary whitelisting software company. Hackers managed to breach their internal network and found an unsecured virtual machine. It had a copy of the code signing certificate's private key. They stole that key and used it to sign malware that would have been trusted by all Bit9 software installations by default. In this lesson, we'll cover the best practices for implementing wireless security. As an IT support specialist, you'll be responsible for Wi-Fi configuration and infrastructure. So understanding the security options available for wireless networks is super important to making sure that the best solution is chosen. We already covered the nuts and bolts of the wireless 802.11 protocol and explained how wireless networks work. So we won't rehash that. But we'll take a closer look at the security implementations available to protect wireless networks. Before we jump into the nitty-gritty details of wireless security, take a second and ask yourself this question. What do you think the best security option is for securing a Wi-Fi network? It's okay if you're not sure. 
Just keep this question in mind as we go over all the options available, along with their benefits and drawbacks. Spoiler alert, there's some pretty technical security stuff coming your way, so put your thinking caps on. The first security protocol introduced for Wi-Fi networks was WEP, or Wired Equivalent Privacy. It was part of the original 802.11 standard introduced back in 1997. WEP was intended to provide privacy on par with a wired network. That means the information passed over the network should be protected from third parties eavesdropping. This was an important consideration when designing the wireless specification. Unlike wired networks, packets could be intercepted by anyone with physical proximity to the access point or client station. Without some form of encryption to protect the packets, wireless traffic would be readable by anyone nearby who wants to listen. WEP was proven to be seriously bad at providing confidentiality or security for wireless networks. It was quickly discounted in 2004 in favor of more secure systems. Even so, we'll cover it here for historical purposes. I want to drive home the point that no one should be using WEP anymore. You never know, you may see seriously outdated systems when working as an IT support specialist. So it's important that you fully understand why WEP is outdated and what you can do instead. WEP used the RC4 symmetric stream cipher for encryption. It used either a 40-bit or 104-bit shared key where the encryption key for individual packets was derived. The actual encryption key for each packet was computed by taking the user supplied shared key and then joining a 24-bit initialization vector, or IV for short. It's a randomized bit of data to avoid reusing the same encryption key between packets. Since these bits of data are concatenated or joined, a 40-bit shared key scheme uses a 64-bit key for encryption, and the 104-bit scheme uses a 128-bit key. Originally, WEP encryption was limited to 64-bit only because of US export restrictions placed on encryption technologies. Now, once those laws were changed, 128-bit encryption became available for use. The shared key was entered as either 10 hexadecimal characters for 40-bit WEP or 26 hex characters for 104-bit WEP. Each hex character was 4 bits each. The key could also be specified by supplying 5 ASCII characters or 13, each ASCII character representing 8 bits. But this actually reduces the available key space to only valid ASCII characters instead of all possible hex values. Since this is a component of the actual key, the shared key must be exactly as many characters as appropriate for the encryption scheme. WEP authentication originally supported two different modes, open system authentication and shared key authentication. The open system mode didn't require clients to supply credentials. Instead, they were allowed to authenticate and associate with the access point. But the access point would begin communicating with the client encrypting data frames with the pre-shared web key. If the client didn't have the key or had an incorrect key, it wouldn't be able to decrypt the frames coming from the access point or AP. It also wouldn't be able to communicate back to the AP. Shared key authentication worked by requiring clients to authenticate through a four-step challenge response process. This basically has the AP asking the client to prove that they have the correct key. Here's how it works. The client sends an authentication request to the AP. The AP replies with a clear text challenge, a bit of randomized data that the client is supposed to encrypt using the shared web key. The client replies to the AP with the resulting ciphertext from encrypting this challenge text. The AP verifies this by decrypting the response and checking it against the plain text challenge text. If they match, a positive response is sent back. Does anything jump out at you as potentially insecure in this scheme? We're transmitting both the plain text and the ciphertext in a way that exposes both of these messages to potential eavesdroppers. This opens the possibility for the encryption key to be recovered by the attacker. A general concept in security and encryption is to never send the plain text and ciphertext together so that attackers can't work out the key used for encryption. But WEP's true weakness wasn't related to the authentication schemes. Its use of the RC4 stream cipher and how the IVs were used to generate encryption keys led to WEP's ultimate downfall. 
The primary purpose of an IV is to introduce more random elements into the encryption key to avoid reusing the same one. When using a stream cipher like RC4, it's super important that an encryption key doesn't get reused. This would allow an attacker to compare two messages encrypted using the same key and recover information. But the encryption key in WEP is just made up of the shared key, which doesn't change frequently. It had 24 bits of randomized data, including the IV, tacked onto the end of it. This results in only a 24-bit pool where unique encryption keys will be pulled from and used. Since the IV is made up of 24 bits of data, the total number of possible values is not very big by modern computing standards. That's only about 17 million possible unique IVs, which means after roughly 5,000 packets, an IV will be reused. When an IV is reused, the encryption key is also reused. It's also important to call out that the IV is transmitted in plain text. If it were encrypted, the receiver would not be able to decrypt it. This means an attacker just has to keep track of IVs and watch for repeated ones. The actual attack that lets an attacker recover the web key relies on weaknesses in some IVs and how the RC4 cipher generates a key stream used for encrypting the data payloads. This lets the attacker reconstruct this key stream using packets encrypted using the weak IVs. The details of the attack are outside what we'll cover in this course, but the full paper detailing the attack is available in the supplementary readings if you want to check it out. You can also take a look at open source tools that demonstrate this attack in action, like Aircrack NG or Air Snort. They can recover a web key in a matter of minutes. It's kind of terrifying to think about. So now you've heard the technical reasons why WEP is inherently vulnerable to attacks. In the next video, we'll talk about the solution that replaced WEP. But before we get there, you might be asking yourself why it's important to know WEP since it's not recommended for use anymore. Well, as an IT support specialist, you might encounter some cases where legacy hardware is still running WEP. It's important to understand the security implications of using this broken security protocol so you can prioritize upgrading away from WEP. All right, now let's dive into the replacement for WEP in the next video. The replacement for WEP from the Wi-Fi Alliance was WPA, or Wi-Fi Protected Access. It was introduced in 2003 as a temporary measure while the Alliance finalized their specification for what would become WPA2, introduced in 2004. WPA was designed as a short-term replacement that would be compatible with older WEP-enabled hardware with a simple firmware update. This helped with user adoption because it didn't require the purchase of new Wi-Fi hardware. To address the shortcomings of WEP security, a new security protocol was introduced called TKIP, or the Temporal Key Integrity Protocol. TKIP implemented three new features that made it more secure than WEP. First, a more secure key derivation method was used to more securely incorporate the IV into the per packet encryption key. Second, a sequence counter was implemented to prevent replay attacks by rejecting out of order packets. Third, a 64-bit mic or message integrity check was introduced to prevent forging, tampering, or corruption of packets. TKIP still used the RC4 cipher as the underlying encryption algorithm, but it addressed the key generation weaknesses of WEP by using a key mixing function to generate unique encryption keys per packet. It also utilizes 256-bit long keys. This key mixing function incorporates the long-lived Wi-Fi passphrase with the IV. This is different compared to the simplistic concatenation of the shared key and IV. Under WPA, the pre-shared key is the Wi-Fi password you share with people when they come over and want to use your wireless network. This is not directly used to encrypt traffic. It's used as a factor to derive the encryption key. The passphrase is fed into the PBKDF2, or Password-Based Key Derivation Function 2, along with the Wi-Fi network's SSID as a salt. This is then run through the HMAC SHA-1 function 4096 times to generate a unique encryption key. 
The SSID salt is incorporated to help defend against rainbow table attacks. The 4096 rounds of HMAC SHA-1 increase the computational power required for a brute force attack. I should call out that the pre-shared key can be entered using two different methods. A 64 character hexadecimal value can be entered, where the 64 character value is used as the key, which is 64 hexadecimal characters times 4 bits, which is 256 bits. The other option is to use pbkdf2 function, but only if entering ASCII characters as a passphrase. If that's the case, the passphrase can be anywhere from 8 to 63 characters long. WPA2 improved WPA security even more by implementing CCMP, or Counter Mode CBC MAC protocol. WPA2 is the best security for wireless networks currently available, so it's really important to know as an IT support specialist. It's based on the AES cipher, finally getting away from the insecure RC4 cipher. The key derivation process didn't change from WPA, and the pre-shared key requirements are the same. Counter with CBC MAC is a particular mode of operation for block ciphers. It allows for authenticated encryption, meaning data is kept confidential and is authenticated. This is accomplished using an authenticate then encrypt mechanism. The CBC MAC digest is computed first. Then, the resulting authentication code is encrypted along with the message using a block cipher. We're using AES in this case, operating in counter mode. This turns a block cipher into a stream cipher by using a random seed value along with an incrementing counter to create a key stream to encrypt data with. Now, let's walk through the four-way handshake process that authenticates clients to the network. I should call out that while you might not encounter this in your day-to-day -day work, it's good to have a grasp on how the authentication process works. It'll help you understand how WPA2 can be broken. This process also generates the temporary encryption key that'll be used to encrypt data for this client. This process is called the four-way handshake, since it's made up of four exchanges of data between the client and AP. It's designed to allow an AP to confirm that the client has the correct pairwise master key or pre-shared key in a WPA PSK setup without disclosing the PMK. The PMK is a long-lived key and might not change for a long time. So an encryption key is derived from the PMK that's used for actual encryption and decryption of traffic between a client and AP. This key is called the pairwise transient key or PTK. The PTK is generating using the PMK, AP nonce, client nonce, AP MAC address, and client MAC address. They're all concatenated together and run through a function. The AP and client nonces are just random bits of data generated by each party and exchanged. The MAC addresses of each party would be known through the packet headers already, and both parties should already have the correct PMK. With this information, the PTK can be generated. This is different for every client to allow for confidentiality between clients. The PTK is actually made up of five individual keys, each with their own purpose. Two keys are used for encryption and confirmation of EAPOL packets, and the encapsulating protocol carries these messages. Two keys are used for sending and receiving message integrity codes. And finally, there's a temporal key which is actually used to encrypt data. The AP will also transmit the GTK, or groupwise transient key. It's encrypted using the EAPOL encryption key contained in the PTK, which is used to encrypt multicast or broadcast traffic. Since this type of traffic must be readable by all clients connected to an AP, this GTK is shared between all clients. It's updated and retransmitted periodically, and when a client disassociates the AP. That's a lot to take in, so let's recap. The four messages exchanged in order are the AP, which sends a nonce to the client, the client then sends its nonce to the AP, the AP sends the GDK, and the client replies with an ACK, confirming successful negotiation. The WPA and WPA2 standard also introduce an 802.1x authentication to Wi-Fi networks. It's usually called WPA2 Enterprise. 
The non-802.1x configurations are called either WPA2 Personal or WPA2 PSK, since they use a pre-shared key to authenticate clients. We won't rehash 802.1x here, since it operates similarly to 802.1x on wired networks, which we covered earlier. The only thing different is that the AP acts as the authenticator in this case. The backend radius is still the authentication server, and the PMK is generated using components of the EAP method chosen. While not a security feature directly, WPS, or Wi-Fi Protected Setup, is a convenience feature designed to make it easier for clients to join a WPA PSK protected network. You might encounter WPS in a small IT shop that uses commercial Soho routers. It can be useful in these smaller environments to make it easier to join wireless clients to the wireless network securely, but there are security implications to having it enabled that you should be aware of. The Wi-Fi Alliance introduced WPS in 2006. It provides several different methods that allow a wireless client to securely join a wireless network without having to directly enter the pre-shared key. This facilitates the use of very long and secure passphrases without making it unnecessarily complicated. Can you imagine having to have your less technically inclined friends and family enter a 63-character passphrase to use your Wi-Fi when they come over? That probably wouldn't go so well. WPS simplifies this by allowing for secure exchange of the SSID and pre-shared key. This is done after authenticating or exchanging data using one of the four supported methods. WPS supports pin entry authentication, NFC or USB for out-of-band exchange of the network details, or push button authentication. You've probably seen the push button mechanism. It's typically a small button somewhere on the home router with two arrows pointing counterclockwise. The push button mechanism works by requiring a button to be pressed on both the AP side and the client side. This requires physical proximity and a short window of time that the client can authenticate with a button press of its own. The NFC and USB methods just provide a different channel to transmit the details to join the network. The PIN methods are really interesting and also where critical flaw was introduced. The PIN authentication mechanism supports two modes. In one mode, the client generates a PIN, which is then entered into the AP. In the other mode, the AP has a PIN, typically hard-coded into the firmware, which is entered into the client. It's the second mode that is vulnerable to an online brute force attack. Feel free to dive deep into this by reading more about it in the supplementary readings. The PIN authentication method uses PINs that are eight digits long, but the last digit is a checksum that's computed from the first seven digits. This makes the total number of possible PINs 10 to the seventh power, or around 10 million possibilities. But the PIN is authenticated by the AP in halves. This means the client will send the first four digits to the AP, wait for a positive or negative response, and then send the second half of the PIN if the first half was correct. Did you see anything wrong with this scenario? We're actually reducing the total possible valid pins even more and making it even easier to guess what the correct pin is. The first half of the pin, being four digits, has about 10,000 possibilities. The second half, only three digits because of the checksum value, has a maximum of only 1,000 possibilities. This means the correct pin can be guessed in a maximum of 11,000 tries. It sounds like a lot, but it really isn't. Without any rate limiting, an attacker could recover the pin and the pre-shared key in less than four hours. In response to this, the Wi-Fi Alliance revised the requirements for the WPS specification, introducing a lockout period of one minute after three incorrect pin attempts. This increases the maximum time to guess the pin from four hours to less than three days. That's easily in the realm of possibility for a determined and patient attacker, but it gets worse. If your network is compromised using this attack because the pin is an unchanging element that's part of the AP configuration, the attacker could just reuse the already recovered WPS pin to get the new password. This would happen even if you detected unauthorized wireless clients on your network and changed your Wi-Fi password. WPA2 is a really robust security protocol. 
It's built using best-in-class mechanisms to prevent attacks and ensure the confidentiality of the data it's protecting. Even so, it's susceptible to some forms of attack. The four-way authentication handshake that we covered earlier is actually susceptible to an offline brute force attack. If an attacker can manage to capture the four-way handshake process, just four packets, they can begin guessing the pre-shared key, or PMK. They can take the nonces and MAC addresses from the four-way handshake packets and computing PTKs. Since the message authentication code secret keys are included as part of the PDK, the correct PMK guess would yield a PTK that successfully validates a mic. This is a brute force or dictionary-based attack, so it's dependent on the quality of the password guesses. It does require a fair amount of computational power to calculate the PMK from the passphrase guesses and SSID values. But the bulk of the computational requirements lie in the PMK computation. This requires 4,096 iterations of a hashing function, which can be massively accelerated through the use of GPU-accelerated computation and cloud computing resources. Because of the bulk of the computations involving computing the PMK, by incorporating the password guesses with the SSIDs, it's possible to pre-compute PMKs in bulk for common SSIDs and password combinations. This reduces the computational requirements to deriving the PTK from the unique session elements. These pre-computed sets are referred to as rainbow tables, and exactly this has been done. Rainbow tables are available for download for the top 1,000 most commonly seen SSIDs and 1 million passwords. Now that we've covered the security options available for protecting wireless networks, what do you think the most secure option would be? In an ideal world, we'd all be protecting our wireless networks using 802.1x with EAP TLS. It offers arguably the best security available, assuming proper and secure handling of the PKI aspects of it. But this option also requires a ton of added complexity and overhead. This is because it requires the use of a RADIUS server and an additional authentication backend at a minimum. If EAP TLS is implemented, then all the public key infrastructure components will also be necessary. This adds even more complexity and management overhead. Not only do you have to securely deploy PKI on the backend for certificate management, but a system must be in place to sign the client certificates. You also have to distribute them to each client that would be authenticating to the network. This is usually more overhead than many companies are willing to take on because of the security versus convenience trade-off involved. If 802.1x is too complicated for a company, the next best alternative would be WPA2 with AES CCMP mode. But to protect against brute force or rainbow table attacks, we should take some steps to raise the computational bar. A long and complex passphrase that wouldn't be found in a dictionary would increase the amount of time and resources an attacker would need to break the passphrase. Changing the SSID to something uncommon and unique would also make Rainbow Tables attack less likely. It would require an attacker to do the computations themselves, increasing the time and resources required to pull off an attack. When using a long and complex Wi-Fi password, you might be tempted to use WPS to join clients to the network. But we saw earlier that this might not be a good idea from a security perspective. In practice, you won't see WPS enabled in an enterprise environment because it's a consumer-oriented technology. If your company values security over convenience, you should make sure that WPS isn't enabled on your APs. Make sure this feature is disabled on your AP's management council. You might want to also verify the feature is actually disabled using a tool like WASH, which scans and enumerates APs that have WPS enabled. This independent verification is recommended, since some router manufacturers don't allow you to disable it. In some cases, disabling the feature through the management console doesn't actually disable the feature. Ready for another quiz? Don't worry, it's just a practice one.
to help make sure you're getting all this wireless info wired into your brain. Now, in order to monitor what type of traffic is on your network, you need a mechanism to capture packets from network traffic for analysis and potential logging. Packet sniffing, or packet capture, is the process of intercepting network packets in their entirety for analysis. It's an invaluable tool for IT support specialists to troubleshoot issues. There are lots of tools that make this really easy to do. Before we dive into the details of how to use them, let's cover some basic concepts of packet sniffing. By default, network interfaces and the networking software stack on an OS are going to behave like a well-mannered interface. It'll only be accepting and processing packets that are addressed to its specific interface address, usually identified by a MAC address. If a packet with a different destination address is encountered, the interface will just drop the packet. But if we wanted to capture all packets that an interface is able to see, like when we're monitoring all network traffic on a network segment, this behavior would be a pain for us. To override this, we can place the interface into what's called promiscuous mode. This is a special mode for Ethernet network interfaces that basically says, give me all the packets. Instead of only accepting and handling packets destined for its address, it'll now accept and process any packet that it sees. This is much more useful for network analysis or monitoring purposes. I should also call out that admin or root privileges are needed to place an interface into promiscuous mode and to begin to capture packets. Details for various platforms on how to get into promiscuous mode can be found in the supplemental reading section. Many packet capture tools will handle this for you, too. Another super important thing to consider when you perform packet captures is whether you have access to the traffic you'd like to capture and monitor. Let's say you wanted to analyze all traffic between hosts connected to a switch, and your machine is also connected to a port on this switch. What traffic would you be able to see in this case? Because this is a switch, the only traffic you'd be able to capture would be traffic from your host or destined for your host. That's not very useful in letting you analyze other host traffic. If the packets aren't going to be sent to your interface in the first place, promiscuous mode won't help you see them. But if your machine was inserted between the uplink port of the switch and the uplink device further upstream, now you'd have access to all packets in and out of that local network segment. Enterprise managed switches usually have a feature called port mirroring, which helps with this type of scenario. Port mirroring allows the switch to take all packets from a specified port, port range, or the entire VLAN, and mirror the packets to a specified switch port. This lets you gain access to all packets passing on a switch in a more convenient and secure way. There's another handy, though less advanced way that you can get access to packets in a switch network environment. You can insert a hub into the topology with the device or devices you'd like to monitor traffic on connected to the hub and our monitoring machine. Hubs are a quick and dirty way of getting packets mirrored to your capture interface. They obviously have drawbacks though, like reduced throughput and the potential for introducing collisions. If you capture packets from a wireless network, the process is slightly different. Promiscuous mode applied to a wireless device would allow the wireless client to process and receive packets from the network it's associated with, destined for other clients. But if we wanted to capture and analyze all wireless traffic that we're able to receive in the immediate area, we can place our wireless interface into a mode called monitor mode. Monitor mode allows us to scan across channels to see all wireless traffic being sent by APs and clients. It doesn't matter what networks they're intended for, and it wouldn't require the client device to be associated or connected to any wireless network. To capture wireless traffic, all you need is an interface placed into monitor mode. Just like enabling promiscuous mode, this can be done with a simple command. But usually, the tools used for wireless packet captures can handle the enabling and disabling of the mode for you. You need to be near enough to the AP and client to receive a signal, and then you can begin capturing traffic right out of the air. There are a number of open source wireless capture and monitoring utilities, like Aircrack NG and Kismet. It's important to call out 
that if a wireless network is encrypted, you can still capture the packets. But you won't be able to decode the traffic payloads without knowing the password for the wireless network. So now we're able to get access to some traffic we'd like to monitor. So what do we do next? We need tools to help us actually do the capture and the analysis. We'll learn more about those in the next lesson. TCP dump is a super popular lightweight command line based utility that you can use to capture and analyze packets. TCP dump uses the open source libpcap library. That's a very popular packet capture library that's used in a lot of packet capture and analysis tools. TCP dump also supports writing packet captures to a file for later analysis, sharing, or replaying traffic. It also supports reading packet captures back from a file. TCP dump's default operating mode is to provide a brief packet analysis. It converts key information from layers three and up into human readable formats. Then it prints information about each packet to standard out or directly into your terminal. It does things like converting the source and destination IP addresses into the dotted quad format we're most used to, and it shows the port numbers being used by the communications. Let's quickly walk through the output of a sample TCP dump. The first bit of information is fairly straightforward. It's a timestamp that represents when the packet on this line was processed by the kernel in local time. Next, the layer three protocol is identified. In this case, it's IPv4. After this, the connection quad is shown. This is the source address, source port, destination address, and destination port. Next, the TCP flags and the TCP sequence number are set on the packet, if there are any. This is followed by the ACK number, TCP window size, then TCP options, if there are any set. Finally, we have payload size in bytes. Remember these from a few lessons ago when we covered networking? TCP dump allows us to actually inspect these values from packets directly. I want to call out that TCP dump by default will attempt to resolve host addresses to host names. It'll also replace port numbers with commonly associated services that use these ports. You can override this behavior with the dash n flag. It's also possible to view the actual raw data that makes up the packet. This is represented as hexadecimal digits by using the dash x flag or capital X if you want the hex and ASCII interpretation of the data. Remember that packets are just collections of data or groupings of ones and zeros. They represent information depending on the values of this data and where they appear in the data stream. Think back to packet headers and how those are structured and formatted. The view TCP dump gives us lets us see the data that fits into the various fields that make up the headers for layers in a packet. Wireshark is another packet capture and analysis tool that you can use, but it's way more powerful when it comes to application and packet analysis compared to TCP dump. It's a graphical utility that also uses the libpcap library for capture and interpretation of packets, but it's way more extensible when it comes to protocol and application analysis. While TCP dump can do basic analysis of some types of traffic, like DNS queries and answers, Wireshark can do way more. Wireshark can decode encrypted payloads if the encryption key is known. It can identify and extract data payloads from file transfers through protocols like SMB or HTTP. Wireshark's understanding of application level protocols even extends to its filter strings. This allows filter rules like finding HTTP requests with specific strings in the URL, which would look like HTTP request URI matches Q equals Wireshark. That filter string would locate packets in our capture that contain a URL request that has the specified string within it. In this case, it would match a query perimeter from a URL searching for Wireshark. While this could be done using TCP dump, it's much easier using Wireshark. Let's take a quick look at the Wireshark interface, which is divided into thirds. The list of packets are up top, followed by the layered representation of a selected packet from the list. Lastly, the hex and ASCII representation of the selected packet are at the bottom. The packet list view is color coded to distinguish between different types of traffic in the capture. The color coded is user configurable. 
The defaults are green for TCP packets, light blue for UDP traffic, and dark blue for DNS traffic. Black also highlights problematic TCP packets, like out of order or repeated packets. Above the packet list pane is a display filter box, which allows complex filtration of packets to be shown. This is different from capture filters, which follows the libpcap standard, along with TCP dump. Wireshark's deep understanding of protocols allows filtering by protocols, along with their specific fields. Since there are over 2,000 protocols supported by Wireshark, we won't cover them in detail. You may want to take a look at the supplementary readings, which shows a broad range of protocols understood by Wireshark. Not only does Wireshark have very handy protocol handling and filtration, it also understands and can follow TCP streams or sessions. This lets you quickly reassemble and view both sides of a TCP session, so you can easily view the full two-way exchange of information between parties. Some other neat features of Wireshark is its ability to decode WPA and WEP encrypted wireless packets if the passphrase is known. It's also able to view Bluetooth traffic with the right hardware, along with USB traffic and other protocols like Zigbee. It also supports file carving, or extracting data payloads from files transferred over unencrypted protocols, like HTTP file transfers or FTP. And it's able to extract audio streams from unencrypted VoIP traffic. So basically, Wireshark is awesome. You might be wondering how packet capture and analysis fits into security at this point. Like logs analysis, traffic analysis is also an important part of network security. Traffic analysis is done using packet captures and packet analysis. Traffic on a network is basically a flow of packets. Now, being able to capture and inspect those packets is important to understanding what type of traffic is flowing on our networks that we'd like to protect. Defense in depth is the concept of having multiple overlapping systems of defense to protect IT systems. This ensures some amount of redundancy for defensive measures. It also helps avoid a catastrophic compromise in the event that a single system fails or a vulnerability is discovered in one system. Think of this as having multiple lines of defense. If an attacker manages to bypass your firewall, you're still protected by strong authentication systems within the network. This would require an attacker to find more vulnerabilities in more systems before real damage can occur. These next lessons will focus on bringing together the different security systems and measures we've discussed so far into a comprehensive security design. It'll offer defense in depth from a variety of known and unknown threats. By the end of this course, you'll be able to implement the appropriate methods for system hardening and application hardening. You'll also be able to determine the policies to use for operating system security. All right, let's get started. We covered packet capture and analysis, which is related to our next topic, intrusion detection and prevention systems, or IDS, IPS. IDS or IPS systems operate by monitoring network traffic and analyzing it. As an IT support specialist, you may need to support the underlying platform that the IDS, IPS runs on. You might also need to maintain the system itself, ensuring that rules are updated and you may even need to respond to alerts. So what exactly do IDS and IPS systems do? They look for matching behavior or characteristics that would indicate malicious traffic. The difference between an IDS and an IPS system is that IDS is only a detection system. It won't take action to block or prevent an attack when one is detected. It will only log an alert. But an IPS system can adjust firewall rules on the fly to block or drop the malicious traffic when it's detected. IPS and IDS systems can either be host-based or network-based. In the case of a network intrusion detection system, or NIDS, the detection system would be deployed somewhere on a network where it can monitor traffic for a network segment or subnet. 
A host-based intrusion detection system would be a software deployed on a host that monitors traffic to and from that host only. It might also monitor system files for unauthorized changes. NID systems resemble firewalls in a lot of ways. But a firewall is designed to prevent intrusions by blocking potentially malicious traffic coming from outside and enforce ACLs between networks. NID systems are meant to detect and alert on potential malicious activity coming from within the network. Plus, firewalls only have visibility of traffic flowing between networks they're set up to protect. They generally wouldn't have visibility of traffic between hosts inside the network. So the location of the NIDs must be considered carefully when you deploy a system. It needs to be located in the network topology in a way that it has access to the traffic we'd like to monitor. A good way that you can get access to network traffic is using the port mirroring functionality found in many enterprise switches. This allows all packets on a port, port range, or entire VLAN to be mirrored to another port where our NIDs host would be connected. With this configuration, our NIDS machine would be able to see all packets flowing in and out of hosts on the switch segment. This lets us monitor host-to-host -host communications and traffic from hosts to external networks like the internet. The NIDS host would analyze this traffic by enabling promiscuous mode on the analysis port. This is the network interface that's connected to the mirror port on our switch, so it can see all packets being passed and perform analysis on the traffic. Since this interface is used for receiving mirrored packets from the network we'd like to monitor, a NIDS host must have at least two network interfaces. One is for monitoring and analysis, and a separate one is for connecting to our network for management and administrative purposes. Some popular NID or NIP systems are Snort, Suricata, and Bro NIDS, which you can read about more in the supplementary readings. Placement of a NIP system or network intrusion prevention system would differ from a NID system. This is because of a prevention system being able to take action against a suspected malicious traffic. In order for a NIPS device to block or drop traffic from a detected threat, it must be placed in line with the traffic being monitored. This means that the traffic that's being monitored must pass through the NIPS device. If it wasn't the case, the NIPS host wouldn't be able to take action on suspected traffic. Think of it this way. A NIDS device is a passive observer that only watches the traffic and sends an alert if it sees something. This is unlike a NIPS device, which not only monitors traffic, but can take action on the traffic it's monitoring, usually by blocking or dropping the traffic. The detection of threats or malicious traffic is usually handled through signature-based detection, similar to how antivirus software detects malware. As an IT support specialist, you might be in charge of maintaining the IDS or IPS setup, which would include ensuring that rules and signatures are up to date. Signatures are unique characteristics of known malicious traffic. They might be specific sequences of packets or packets with certain values encoded in the specific header field. This allows intrusion detection and prevention systems from easily and quickly recognizing known bad traffic from sources like botnets, worms, and other common attack vectors on the internet. But similar to antivirus, less common or targeted attacks might not be detected by a signature-based system, since there might not be signatures developed for these cases. So it's also possible to create custom rules to match traffic that might be considered suspicious, but not necessarily malicious. This would allow investigators to look into the traffic in more detail to determine the badness level. If the traffic is found to be malicious, a signature can be developed from the traffic and incorporated into the system. What actually happens when a NID system detects something malicious? This is configurable, but usually the NID system would log the detection event along with a full packet capture of the malicious traffic. An alert would also usually be triggered to notify the investigating team to look into the detected traffic. Depending on the severity of the event, the alert may just email a group or create a ticket to follow up on. Or it might page someone in the middle of the night if it's determined to be a really high severity and urgent. These alerts would usually also include reference information linking to a known vulnerability or some more information about the nature of the alert to help the investigator look into the event. Well, we covered a lot of ground on securing your networks. I hope you feel secure enough to move on. 
If not, you can review any of these concepts that we've talked about. Once you've done that, it's time for a peer review assessment to give you some hands-on experience with packet sniffing and analysis. When you've finished, I'll see you in the next video where we'll cover defense in depth. We briefly mentioned host-based firewalls when we talked about network monitoring and intrusion detection systems. Host-based firewalls are important to creating multiple layers of security. They protect individual hosts from being compromised when they're used in untrusted and potentially malicious environments. They also protect individual hosts from potentially compromised peers inside a trusted network. Our network-based firewall has a duty to protect our internal network by filtering traffic in and out of it, while the host-based firewall on each individual host protects that one machine. Like our network-based firewall, we'd still want to start with an implicit deny rule. Then we'd selectively enable specific services and ports that'll be used. This lets us start with a secure default and then only permits traffic that we know and trust. You can think of this as starting with a perfectly secure firewall configuration and then poking holes in it for the specific traffic we require. This may look very different from your network firewall configuration since it's unlikely that your employees would need remote SSH access to their laptops, for example. Remember that to secure systems, you need to minimize attack surfaces or exposure. A host-based firewall plays a big part in reducing what's accessible to an outside attacker. It provides flexibility while only permitting connections to selective services on a given host from specific networks or IP ranges. This ability to restrict connections from certain origins is usually used to implement a highly secure host or network. From there, access to critical or sensitive systems or infrastructure is permitted. These are called bastion hosts or networks and are specifically hardened and minimized to reduce what's permitted to run on them. Bastion hosts are usually exposed to the internet, so you should pay special attention to hardening and locking them down to reduce the chances of compromise. But they can also be used as a sort of gateway or access portal into more sensitive services like core authentication servers or domain controllers. This would let you implement more secure authentication mechanisms and ACLs on the Bastion hosts without making it inconvenient for your entire company. Monitoring and logging can be prioritized for these hosts more easily. Typically, these hosts or networks would also have severely limited network connectivity. It's usually just to the secure zone that they're designed to protect and not much else. Applications that are allowed to be installed and run on these hosts would also be restricted to those that are strictly necessary since these machines have one specific purpose. Part of the host base firewall rules will likely also provide ACLs that allow access from the VPN subnet. It's good practice to keep the network that VPN clients connect into separate using both subnetting and VLANs. This gives you more flexibility to enforce security on these VPN clients. It also lets you build additional layers of defenses while a VPN host should be protected using other means, it's still a host that's operating in a potentially malicious environment. This host is then initiating a remote connection into your trusted internal network. These hosts represent another potential vector of attack and compromise. Your ability to separately monitor traffic coming and going from them is super useful. There's an important thing for you to consider when it comes to host-based firewalls, especially for client systems like laptops. If the users of the system have administrator rights, then they have the ability to change firewall rules and configurations. This is something you should keep in mind and make sure to monitor with logging. If management tools allow it, you should also prevent the disabling of the host-based firewall. This can be done with Microsoft Windows machines when administered using Active Directory, as an example. A critical part of any security architecture is logging and alerting. It wouldn't do much good to have all these defenses in place if we have no idea if they're working or not. 
we need visibility into the security systems in place to see what kind of traffic they're seeing. We also need to have the visibility into the logs of all of our infrastructure devices and equipment that we manage. But it's not enough to just have logs. We also need ways to safeguard logs and make them easy to analyze and review. If there's a dedicated security team at your company, they would be performing this analysis. But at a smaller company, this responsibility would likely fall to the IT team. So let's make sure you're prepared with the skills you might need for incident investigation. Many investigative techniques can also be applied to troubleshooting. All systems and services running on hosts will create logs of some kind with different levels of detail. It depends on what it's logging and what events it's configured to log. So an authentication server would log every authentication attempt, whether it's successful or not. A firewall would log traffic that matches rules, with details like source and destination addresses and ports being used. All this logged information gives us details about the traffic and activity that's happening on our network and systems. This can be used to detect compromise or attempts to attack the system. When there are a large number of systems located around your network, each with their own log format, it can be challenging to make meaningful sense of all this data. This is where security information and event management systems, or SIEMs, come in. A SIEM can be thought of as a centralized log server. It has some extra analysis features, too. In the System Administration and IT Infrastructure course of this program, you learn ways that centralized logging can help you administer multiple machines at once. You can think of SIEM as a form of centralized logging for security administration purposes. A SIEM system gets logs from a bunch of other systems. It consolidates the logs from all different places and places it in one centralized location. This makes handling logs a lot easier. As an IT support specialist, an important step you'll take in logs analysis is normalization. This is the process of taking log data in different formats and converting it into a standardized format that's consistent with a defined log structure. As an IT support specialist, you might configure normalization for your log sources. For example, log entries from our firewall may have a timestamp using a year, month, and day format, while logs from our client machines may use day, month, year format. To normalize this data, you choose one standard date format. Then you define what the fields are for the log types that need to be converted. When logs are received from these machines, the log entries are converted into the standard that we defined and stored by the logging server. This lets you analyze and compare log data between different log types and systems in a much easier fashion. So what type of information should you be logging? Well, that's a great question. If you log too much info, it's difficult to analyze the data and find useful information. Plus, storage requirements for saving the logs become expensive very quickly. But if you log too little, then the information won't provide any useful insights into your systems and network. Finding that middle ground can be difficult. It will vary depending on the unique characteristics of the systems being monitored and the type of activity on the network. No matter what events are logged, all of them should have information that will help understand what happened and reconstruct the events. There are lots of important fields to capture in log entries, like timestamp, the event or error code, the service or application being logged, the user or system account associated with the event, and the devices involved in the event. Timestamps are super important to understanding when an event occurred. Fields like source and destination addresses will tell us who was talking to whom. For application logs, you can grab useful information from the logged in user associated with the event and from what client they used. On top of the analysis assistance it provides, a centralized log server also has security benefits. By maintaining logs on a dedicated system, it's easier to secure this system from attack. Logs are usually targeted by attackers after a breach so that they can cover their tracks. By having critical systems send logs to a remote logging server that's locked down, the details of a breach should still be logged. A forensics team will be able to reconstruct the events that led to the compromise. Once we have logging configured and the relevant events recorded on a centralized log server, what do we do with all the data? Well, analyzing log details depends on what you're trying to achieve. Typically, when you look at aggregated logs as an IT support specialist, you should pay attention to patterns and connections between traffic. 
So if you're seeing a large percentage of Windows hosts all connecting to a specific address outside your network, that might be worth investigating. It could signal a malware infection. Once logs are centralized and standardized, you can write automated alerting based on rules. Maybe you'll want to define an alert rule for repeated unsuccessful attempts to authenticate to a critical authentication server. Lots of SIEM solutions also offer handy dashboards to help analysts visualize this data. Having data in a visual format can potentially provide more insight. You can also write some of your own monitoring and alert systems. Now, it doesn't matter if you're using a SIEM solution or writing your own. It can be useful to break down things like commonly used protocols in the network, quickly see the top talkers in the network, and view reported errors over time to reveal patterns. Speaking of top talkers, I have just one more thing to call out, but we'll take a break before the next video. Another important component to logging to keep in mind as an IT support specialist is retention. Your log storage needs will vary based on the amount of systems being logged, the amount of detail logged, and the rate at which logs are created. How long you want or need to keep logs around will also really influence the storage requirements for a log server. Some examples of logging servers and SIEM solutions are the open source R syslog, Splunk Enterprise Security, IBM Security Q Radar, and RSA Security Analytics. You can learn more about these solutions in the supplementary readings of this lesson. OK, break time. I'll see you at the top of the next video on anti-malware protection. Anti-malware defenses are a core part of any company's security model in this day and age. So it's important as an IT support specialist to know what's out there. Today, the internet is full of bots, viruses, worms, and other automated attacks. Lots of unprotected systems would be compromised in a matter of minutes if directly connected to the internet without any safeguards or protections in place. And they need to have critical system updates. While modern operating systems have reduced this threat vector by having basic firewalls enabled by default, there's still a huge amount of attack traffic on the internet. Anti-malware measures play a super important role in keeping this type of attack off your systems and helping to protect your users. Antivirus software has been around for a really long time, but some security experts question the value it can provide to a company especially since more sophisticated malware and attacks have been spun up in recent years. Antivirus software is signature-based. This means that it has a database of signatures that identify known malware, like the unique file hash of a malicious binary, or the file associated with an infection. Or it could be the network traffic characteristics that malware uses to communicate with a command and control server. Antivirus software will monitor and analyze things like new files being created or being modified on the system in order to watch for any behavior that matches a known malware signature. If it detects activity that matches a signature, depending on the signature type, it will attempt to block the malware from harming the system. But some signatures might only be able to detect the malware after the infection has occurred. In that case, it may attempt to quarantine the infected files. If that's not possible, it'll just log and alert the detection event. At a high level, this is how all antivirus products work. There are two issues with antivirus software, though. The first is that they depend on antivirus signatures distributed by the antivirus software vendor. The second is that they depend on the antivirus vendor discovering new malware and writing new signatures for newly discovered threats. Until the vendor is able to write new signatures and publish and disseminate them, your antivirus software can't protect you from these emerging threats. Boo! Antivirus, which is designed to protect systems, actually represents an additional attack surface that attackers can exploit. You might be thinking, wait, our own antivirus tools can be another threat to our system? What's the deal with that? Well. This is because of the very nature of what an antivirus engine must do. It takes arbitrary and potentially malicious binaries as input and performs various operations on them. Because of this, there are a lot of complex code where very serious bugs could exist. 
exactly this kind of vulnerability was found in the Sophos antivirus engine back in 2012. You can read more about this event in the supplementary readings. So it sounds like antivirus software isn't ideal and has some pretty large drawbacks. Then why are we still recommending it as a core piece of security design? The short answer is this. It protects against the most common attacks out there on the internet. The really obvious stuff that still poses a threat to your systems still needs to be defended against. Antivirus is an easy solution to provide that protection. It doesn't matter how much user education you instill in your employees. There will still be some folks who will click on an email that has an infected attachment. A good way to think about antivirus in today's very noisy external threat environment is like a filter for the attack noise on the internet today. It lets you remove the background noise and focus on the more important targeted or specific threats. Remember, our defense in depth concept involves multiple layers of protection. Antivirus software is just one piece of our anti-malware defenses. If antivirus can't protect us from the threats we don't know about, how do we protect against the unknown threats out there? Well, antivirus operates on a blacklist model, checking against a list of known bad things and blocking what gets matched. There's a class of anti-malware software that does the opposite. Binary whitelisting software operates off a whitelist. It's a list of known good and trusted software, and only things that are on the list are permitted to run. Everything else is blocked. You can think of this as applying the implicit deny ACL rule to software execution. By default, everything is blocked. Only things explicitly allowed to execute are able to. I should call out that this typically only applies to executable binaries, not arbitrary files like PDF documents or text files. This would naturally defend against any unknown threats, but at the cost of convenience. Think about how frequently you download and install new software on your machine. Now, imagine if you had to get approval before you could download and install any new software. That would be really annoying, don't you think? Now, imagine that every system update had to be whitelisted before it could be applied. Obviously, not trusting everything wouldn't be very sustainable. It's for this reason that binary whitelisting software can trust software using a couple different mechanisms. The first is using the unique cryptographic hash of binaries, which are used to identify unique binaries. This is used to whitelist individual executables. The other trust mechanism is a software signing certificate. Remember back when we discussed public key cryptography and signatures using public and private key pairs? Software signing, or code signing, is the same idea but applied to software. A software vendor can cryptographically sign binaries they distribute using a private key. The signature can be verified at execution time by checking the signature using the public key embedded in the certificate and verifying the trust chain of the public key. If the hash matches and the public key is trusted, then the software can be verified that it came from someone with the software vendor's code signing private key. Binary whitelisting systems can be configured to trust specific vendor's code signing certificates. They permit all binaries signed with that certificate to run. This is helpful for automatically trusting content, like system updates, along with software in common use that comes from reputable and trusted vendors. But can you guess the downside here? Each new code signing certificate that's trusted represents an increase in attack surface. An attacker could compromise the code signing certificate of a software vendor that your company trusts and use that to sign malware that targets your company. That would bypass any binary whitelisting defenses in place. Not good. This exact scenario happened back in 2013 to Bit9, a binary whitelisting software company. Hackers managed to breach their internal network and found an unsecured virtual machine. It had a copy of the code signing certificate's private key. They stole that key and used it to sign malware that would have been trusted by all Bit9 software installations by default. We briefly discussed disk encryption earlier when we talked about encryption at a high level. Now, it's time to dive deeper. Full disk encryption, or FDE, is an important factor in a defense in-depth security model. It provides protection from some physical forms of attack. 
As an IT support specialist, you likely assist with implementing an FTE solution if one doesn't exist already, help with migrating between FTE solutions, and troubleshoot issues with FTE systems, like helping with forgotten passwords. So FTE is key. Systems with their entire hard drives encrypted are resilient against data theft. They'll prevent an attacker from stealing potentially confidential information from a hard drive that's been stolen or lost. Without also knowing the encryption password or having access to the encryption key, the data on the hard drive is just meaningless gibberish. This is a very important security mechanism to deploy for more mobile devices, like laptops, cell phones, and tablets. But it's also recommended for desktops and servers, too, since disk encryption not only provides confidentiality, but also integrity. This means that an attacker with physical access to a system can't replace system files with malicious ones or install malware. Having the disk fully encrypted protects from data theft and unauthorized tampering, even if an attacker has physical access to the disk. But in order for a system to boot if it has an FTE setup, there are some critical files that must be accessible. They need to be available before the primary disk can be unlocked and the boot process can continue. Because of this, all FTE setups have an unencrypted partition on the disk which holds these critical boot files. Examples include things like the kernel and bootloader that are critical to booting the operating system. These files are actually vulnerable to being replaced with modified, potentially malicious files by an attacker with physical access. While it's possible to compromise a machine this way, it would take a sophisticated and determined attacker to do it. There's also protection against this attack in the form of the Secure Boot Protocol, which is part of the UEFI specification. Secure Boot uses public key cryptography to secure these encrypted elements of the boot process. It does this by integrated code signing and verification of the boot files. Initially, Secure Boot is configured with what's called a platform key, which is the public key corresponding to the private key used to sign the boot files. This platform key is written to firmware and is used at boot time to verify the signature of the boot files. Only files correctly signed and trusted will be allowed to execute. This way, a secure boot protects against physical tampering with the unencrypted boot partition. There are first-party full disk encryption solutions from Microsoft and Apple, called BitLocker and FileVault 2, respectively. There are also a bunch of third-party and open-source solutions. On Linux, the DMCrypt package is super popular. There are also solutions from PGP, TrueCrypt, Veracrypt, and lots of others. Check out the supplementary readings for a detailed list of FDE tools. Just pick your poison, or antidote, I should say. Full disk encryption schemes rely on a secret key for actual encryption and decryption operations. They typically password protect access to this key, and in some cases, the actual encryption key is used to derive a user key, which is then used to encrypt the master key. If the encryption key needs to be changed, the user key can be swapped out without requiring a full decryption and re-encryption of the data being protected. This would be necessary if the master encryption key needs to be changed. Password protecting the key works by requiring the user enter a passphrase to unlock the encryption key. It can then be used to access the protected contents on the disk. In many cases, this might be the same as the user account password to keep things simple and to reduce the number of passwords to memorize. When you implement a full disk encryption solution at scale, it's super important to think about how to handle cases where passwords are forgotten. This is another convenience trade-off when using FDE. If the passphrase is forgotten, then the contents of the disk aren't recoverable. Yikes! This is why lots of enterprise disk encryption solutions have a key escrow functionality. Key escrow allows the encryption key to be securely stored for later retrieval by an authorized party. So, if someone forgets the passphrase to unlock their encrypted disk for their laptop, the system's administrators are able to retrieve the escrow key or recovery passphrase to unlock the disk. It's usually a separate key or passphrase that can unlock the disk in addition to the user-defined one. This allows for recovery if a password is forgotten. The recovery key is used to unlock the disk and boot the system fully. 
you should compare full disk encryption against file-based encryption. That's where only some files or folders are encrypted, and not the entire disk. This is usually implemented as home directory encryption. It serves a slightly different purpose compared to FDE. Home directory or file-based encryption only guarantees confidentiality and integrity of files protected by encryption. These setups usually don't encrypt system files because there are often compromises between security and usability. When the whole disk isn't encrypted, it's possible to remotely reboot a machine without being locked out. If you reboot a full disk encrypted machine, the disk unlock password must be entered before the machine finishes booting and is reachable over the network again. So while file-based encryption is a little more convenient, it's less protected against physical attacks. An attacker could modify or replace core system files and compromise the machine to gain access to the encrypted data. This is a good example of why understanding threats and the risks these threats represent is an important part in designing a security architecture and choosing the right defenses. In our next lesson, we'll cover application hardening. I'll see you there. While some parts of software features are exposed, a lot of attacks depend on exploiting bugs in software. This triggers obscure and unintended behavior, which can lead to a compromise of the system running the vulnerable software. These types of vulnerabilities can be fixed through software patches and updates, which correct the bugs that the attackers exploit. As an IT support specialist, it's critical that you make sure that you install software updates and security patches in a timely way in order to defend your company's systems and networks. Software updates don't just improve software products by adding new features and improving performance and stability. They also address security vulnerabilities. There are some software bugs that are present in the core functionality of the software in question. This means that the vulnerability can't be mitigated by disabling the vulnerable service. Not good. An example of this was the Heartbleed vulnerability a bug in the open source TLS library OpenSSL. This was discovered and widely publicized in April of 2014. The bug showed up in how the library handled TLS heartbeat messages. they are special messages that allow one party in a TLS session to signal to the other party that they'd like the session to be kept alive. This works by sending a TLS heartbeat request message, a packet that has a text string and the length of the string. The receiving end is supposed to reply with the same text string in response. So, if the heartbeat request message contains the text, I'm still alive, and the length of 15, the receiving end would reply back with the same text, I'm still alive. But, the bug in the OpenSSL library was that the replying side would allocate memory space according to the value in the received packet. This was based on the specified length of the string, like it's defined in the packet not based on the actual length of the string. The value was not verified. This meant that an attacker could send a malformed heartbeat request message with a much larger length specified than what was allowed. The reply would contain the original text message, but would also include bits of memory from the replying system. So, an attacker could send a malformed heartbeat request message containing the text, I'm still alive, but with a length of 500. Because the length value wasn't verified, this means that the response back would be, I'm still alive, followed by the next 485 characters in memory. So it was possible for an attacker to read up to 64 kilobytes of a target's memory. This memory was likely used before by OpenSSL library, so it might contain sensitive information regarding other TLS sessions. This bug meant that it was feasible for an attacker to recover the private keys used to protect TLS sessions. This would allow them to decrypt TLS protected sessions and recover details like login credentials. This is a great example of a mistake in the code leading to a very high profile software vulnerability. It could only be fixed through a software update or switching to a different TLS library entirely. While the heartbeat functionality is enabled by default, it's possible to disable it in the OpenSSL library but it wasn't a simple argument to pass to an application. Disabling this functionality required compiling the library with a flag 
that was specified to disable heartbeats. Then you had to replace the installed version with the custom compiled one. That's not something most people will do. This was also a library widely used by both server applications and client applications. This means that it may not be possible to replace the OpenSSL library with a customized version or a different library. The only way to address the vulnerability in client software that implemented OpenSSL was to wait for a patch from the software vendor. What a mess! Here's the bad news. With software continuing to grow more complex over time, these types of bugs are likely to become more commonplace. Attackers will be looking for exactly this type of vulnerability. The best protection is to have a good system and policy in place for your company. The system should be checking for, distributing, and verifying software updates for software deployment. This is a complex problem when considering a large organization with many machines to manage that run a variety of software products. This is where management tools can help make this task more approachable for you. Solutions like Microsoft's SCCM or Puppet Lab's Puppet and Factor tools allow administrators to get an overview of what software is installed across their fleet of managed systems. This lets a security team analyze what specific software and versions are installed to better understand the risk of vulnerable software in the fleet. When updates are released and pushed to the fleet, these reporting tools can help make sure that the updates have been applied. SCCM even has the ability to force install updates after a specified deadline is passed. Patching isn't just necessary for software, but also operating systems and firmware that run on infrastructure devices. Every device has code running on it that might have software bugs that could lead to security vulnerabilities, from routers, switches, phones, even printers. Operating system vendors usually push security-related patches pretty quickly when an issue is discovered. They'll usually release security fixes out of cycle from typical OS upgrades to ensure a timely fix because of the security implications. But for embedded devices like networking equipment or printers, this might not be typical. Critical infrastructure devices should be approached carefully when you apply updates. There's always the risk that a software update will introduce a new bug that might affect the functionality of a device, or if the update process itself would go wrong and cause an outage. I hope you can see the importance of applying software patches and firmware updates in a timely fashion. It would be pretty embarrassing if you wind up being compromised by a vulnerability that could have been easily fixed with a software update. As you can see, application software can represent a pretty large attack surface. This is especially true when it comes to a large fleet of systems used throughout an organization. So it's important to have some kind of application policies in place. These policies serve two purposes. Not only do they define boundaries of what applications are permitted or not, but they also help educate folks on how to use software more securely. We've seen the risks that software can pose because of security vulnerabilities. It makes sense to have a policy around applying software updates in a timely way. A common recommendation, or even a requirement, is to only support or require the latest version of a piece of software. From the IT support perspective, this is important because software updates would often fix issues that someone may be encountering. But from the security side of things, Making sure the latest version of the software will ensure that all security patches have been applied and the most secure version is in use. This should be clearly called out in a policy. People tend to be pretty lazy about applying updates to software that they use a lot. Lots of times, applying an update requires restarting the application, which can feel inconvenient and disruptive to users. It's generally a good idea to disallow risky classes of software by policy. Things like file sharing software and piracy related software tend to be closely associated with malware infections. They usually don't have a business use either. Let's not even talk about the legal implications of this type of software. Understanding what your users need to do their jobs will help shape your approach to software policies and guidelines. If there's a common use case for a certain type of software, it would be helpful to select a specific software implementation and require the use of that solution. 
This lets you evaluate the most secure solution and benefit from a more uniform software installation. Remember, the name of the game is to minimize attack surfaces. Each piece of software that accomplishes the same thing represents a different set of potential attack surfaces that could have a vulnerability lurking inside. Helping your users accomplish tasks by recommending or supporting specific software makes for a more secure environment. It also helps users by giving them clear solutions to accomplish tasks. If you want to employ a binary whitelisting solution, it's also important to define a policy around what type of software can be whitelisted. So it's probably unnecessary to have video games whitelisted, unless your company is a video game studio, of course. These policies usually require some kind of business use case or justification to avoid a lot of one-off personal software requests. Another class of software that you might want to have policies defined for are browser extensions or add-ons. Since a lot of workflows live exclusively within the web browser now, they represent a potential vector for malware that often gets overlooked. Extensions that require full access to websites visited can be risky, since the extension developer has the power to modify pages visited. Some extensions may even send user input to a remote server. This could potentially leak confidential information. Clearly defining classifications of risky extensions and add-ons will help protect your systems and provide guidance to your users. But policies are usually not enough to arm users with the information they need to make informed choices. Their decisions can impact the security of your organization. That's where education and training comes into play, which we'll discuss in the next module. We went over a lot of really dense information on security in these lessons. Take time to review some of the videos so that it really sinks in. OK, awesome work. Now, it's time for a project that will test what you've learned about the system hardening. Then, if you can believe it, you'll move on to the last lesson of the last course of this program. Woohoo! Congratulations! You've reached the last chunk of the last course of this program you are totally ready to lock down every single operation of your organization and make it airtight, right? Not quite. If you're responsible for an organization of users, there's a delicate balance between security and user productivity. We've seen this balance in action when we dove into the different security tools and systems together. Before you start to design a security architecture, you need to define exactly what you like it to accomplish. This will depend on what your company thinks is most important. It will probably have a way it wants different data to be handled and stored. You also need to know if your company has any legal requirements when it comes to security. If your company handles credit card payments, then you have to follow the PCI DSS, or Payment Card Industry Data Security Standard, depending on local laws. We'll take a closer look at PCI DSS, which is a great example of clearly defined security goals. PCI DSS is broken into six broad objectives, each with some requirements. The first objective is to build and maintain a secure network and systems. This includes the requirements to install and maintain a firewall configuration to protect cardholder data, and to not use vendor supply defaults for system passwords and other security parameters. As you can tell, the requirements are related to the objective. The objective is the end goal, or what we'd like to achieve, and the requirements are the actions that can help achieve that goal. PCI DSS goes into more detailed actions for each requirement. It provides more specific guidance around what a firewall configuration should control. For example, a secure firewall configuration should restrict connections between untrusted networks and any systems in the cardholder data environment. That's a little generic, but it does give us some guidance on how to meet the requirements. The second objective category is to protect cardholder data. In this objective, the first requirement is to protect stored cardholder data. The second is to encrypt the transmission of cardholder data across open public networks. I want to call out again how the broad objective is to protect sensitive data that's stored in systems within our control. The requirements give us specific guidelines on how to get this done. 
the specifics of these requirements help clarify some of the points, like what constitutes an open network. They also recommend using strong cryptography and offer some examples. But not all requirements are technical in nature. Let's look at the requirement to protect stored cardholder data, for example. It has requirements for data retention policies to make sure that sensitive payment information isn't stored beyond the time it's required. Once payment is authorized, authentication data shouldn't be needed anymore, and it should be securely deleted. This highlights the fact that good security defenses aren't just technical in nature. They're also procedural and policy-based. The third objective is to maintain a vulnerability management program. The first requirement is to protect all systems against malware and regularly update antivirus software or programs. The second is to develop and maintain secure systems and applications. You'll find more detailed implementation procedures within these requirements. They'll cover things like ensuring all systems have antivirus software installed and making sure this software is kept up to date. They also require that scans are run regularly and logs are maintained. There are also requirements for ensuring systems and software are protected against known vulnerabilities by applying security patches at least one month from the release of a security patch. Use of third-party security vulnerability databases is also listed to help identify known vulnerabilities within managed systems. The fourth objective is to implement strong access control measures. This objective has three requirements. The first is to restrict access to cardholder data by business need to know. The second is to identify and authenticate access to system components. And the third is to restrict physical access to cardholder data. This highlights the importance of good access control measures, along with good data access policies. The first objective, restricting access to data by business need to know, means that any sensitive data should be directed to data access policies to make sure that customer data isn't misused. Part of this requirement is to enforce password authentication for system access and two-factor authentication for remote access. That's the minimum requirement. Another important piece highlighted by the PCI DSS requirements is access control for physical access. This is a critical security aspect to keep in mind since we need to protect systems and data from both physical theft and virtual attacks. The fifth objective is to regularly monitor and test networks. The first requirement is to track and monitor all access to network resources and cardholder data. The second is to regularly test security systems and processes. The requirement for network monitoring and testing is another essential part of a good security plan. This refers to things like setting up and configuring intrusion detection systems and conducting vulnerability scans of the network, which we'll cover a bit more later. Testing defenses is another super important part of this. Just having the systems in place isn't enough. It's really helpful to test defense systems regularly to make sure that they provide the protection that you want. It also ensures that the alerting systems are functional. But don't worry, we'll dive deeper into this a little bit later when we cover penetration testing. The sixth and final objective is to maintain an information security policy. It only has one requirement, to maintain a policy that addresses information security for all personnel. This requirement addresses why we need to have well-established security policies. They help govern and regulate user behavior when it comes to information security aspects. It's important to call out that this requirement mentions that the policy should be for all personnel. The responsibility of information security isn't only on the security teams. Every member of an organization is responsible for information security. Well-designed security policies address the most common questions or use cases that users would have based on the specific details of the organization. Everyone that uses systems on your organization's network is able to get around security. They might not mean to, but they can reduce the overall security with their actions and practices. That's why having well thought out security policies in place also need to be easy to find and easy to read. We'll cover more details about user education and getting users involved in the overall security plan in another upcoming video of this course.
We've covered security risk assessment a little bit in the last lesson, but there's lots more to talk about. Security is all about determining risks or exposure, understanding the likelihood of attacks, and designing defenses around these risks to minimize the impact of an attack. This thought process is actually something that everyone uses in their daily life, whether they know it or not. Think of when you cross a busy intersection, you assess the probability of being hit by an oncoming car and minimize that risk by choosing the right time to cross the road. Security risk assessment starts with threat modeling. First, we identify likely threats to our systems. Then, we assign them priorities that correspond to severity and probability. We do this by brainstorming from the perspective of an outside attacker, putting ourselves in a hacker's shoes. It helps to start by figuring out what high-value targets an attacker may want to go after. From there, you can start to look at possible attack vectors that could be used to gain access to high-value assets. High-value data usually includes account information like usernames and passwords. Typically, any kind of user data is considered high-value, especially if payment processing is involved. Another part of risk measurement is understanding what vulnerabilities are on your systems and network. One way to find these out is to perform regular vulnerability scanning. There are lots of open source and commercial solutions that you can use. They can be configured to perform scheduled, automated scans of designated systems or networks to look for vulnerabilities. Then they generate a report. Some of these tools are Nessus, OpenVOS, and Qualys, which I've linked to in the next reading. Let me break down what vulnerability scanners do. Heads up, this might be a little dense, so feel free to go over it again. Vulnerability scanners are services that run on your system within your control that conduct periodic scans of configured networks. The service then conducts scans to find and discover hosts on the network. Once hosts are found, either through a ping sweep or port scanning, more detailed scans are run against discovered hosts. Scans upon scans upon scans. A port scan of either common ports or all possible valid ports is conducted against discovered hosts to determine what services are listening. These services are then probed to try to discover more info about the type of service and what version is listening on the relevant port. This information can then be checked against databases of known vulnerabilities. If a vulnerable version of a service is discovered, the scanner will add it to its report. Once the scan is finished, the discovered vulnerabilities and hosts are compiled in a report. That way, an analyst can quickly and easily see where the problem areas are on the network. Found vulnerabilities are prioritized according to severity and other categorization. Severity takes into account a number of things, like how likely the vulnerability is to be exploited. It also considers the type of access the vulnerability would provide to an attacker and whether or not it can be exploited remotely or not. Vulnerabilities in the report will have links to detailed and disclosed information about the vulnerability. In some cases, it will also have recommendations on how to get rid of it. Vulnerability scanners will detect lots of things, ranging from misconfigured services that represent potential risks to detecting the presence of backdoors in systems. It's important to call out that vulnerability scanning can only detect known and disclosed vulnerabilities and insecure configurations. That's why it's important for you to have an automated vulnerability scan conducted regularly. You'll also need to keep the vulnerability database up to date to make sure new vulnerabilities are detected quickly. But vulnerability scanning isn't the only way to put your defenses to the test. Conducting regular penetration tests is also really encouraged to test your defenses even more. These tests will also ensure detection and alerting systems are working properly. Penetration testing is the practice of attempting to break into a system or network to verify the systems in place. Think of this as playing the role of a bad guy for educational purposes. This exercise isn't designed to see if you have the acting chops. It's intended to make you think like an attacker and use the same tools and techniques they would use. This way, you can test your systems to make sure they protect you like they're supposed to. The results of the penetration testing reports will also show you where weak points or blind spots exist. These tests help improve defenses and guide future security projects. They can be conducted by members of your in-house security team. 
If your internal team doesn't have the resources for this exercise, you can hire a third-party company that offers penetration testing as a service. You can even do both. That would help give you more perspectives on your defense systems, and you'll get a more comprehensive test this way. When you're supporting systems that handle customer data, it's super important to protect it from unauthorized and inappropriate access. It's not just to defend against external threats. It also protects the data against misuse by employees. This type of behavior would fall under your company's privacy policies. Privacy policies oversee the access and use of sensitive data. They also define what appropriate and authorized use is and what provisions or restrictions are in place when it comes to how the data is used. Keep in mind that people might not consider the security implications of their actions. So both privacy and data access policies are important to guiding and informing people how to maintain security while handling sensitive data. Having defined and well-established privacy policies is an important part of good privacy practices. But you also need a way to enforce these policies. Periodic audits on cases where sensitive data was accessed can get you there. This was enabled by our logging and monitoring systems. Auditing data access logs is super important. It helps us ensure that sensitive data is only accessed by people who are authorized to access it, and that they use it for the right reasons. It's good practice to apply the principle of least privilege here by not allowing access to this type of data by default. You should require anyone that needs access to first make an access request with a justification for getting the data. But it can't just be vague or a generic request for access. They should be required to specify what data they need access to. Usually, this type of request would also have a time limit that should be called out in the request. That way, you can ensure that data access is only permitted for legitimate business reasons, which reduces the likelihood of inappropriate data access or usage. By logging each data access request and actual data access, we can also correlate requests with usage. Any access that doesn't have a corresponding request should be flagged as a high priority potential breach that needs to be investigated as soon as possible. Company policies act as our guidelines and informational resources on how and how not to access and handle data. They're equally important here. Policies will range from sensitive data handling to public communications. Data handling policies should cover the details of how different data is classified. What makes some data sensitive as opposed to non-sensitive? What's considered confidential data? Well, once different data classes are defined, you should create guidelines around how to handle these different types of data. If something is considered sensitive or confidential, you'd probably have stipulations that this data shouldn't be stored on media that's easily lost or stolen, like USB sticks or portable hard drives. They're also commonly used without any encryption at all. Imagine if one of your employees lost an unencrypted portable hard drive full of customer information. Disaster. That's exactly the situation a data access policy tries to avoid. It might also make sense to include laptops and mobile devices, like phones and tablets, in the removable media classification, since these devices are easily lost or stolen. Even though they're more commonly encrypted these days, the loss and theft rate is much higher. You may not like users storing sensitive data on removable media, but sometimes you're out of luck. There may be an occasion where that's the only solution to accomplish a task. If this is the case, it would help to have recommendations on how to handle this situation in a secure way. So you could offer an appropriate encryption solution and provide instructions and support on its use. You've got to involve your users when it comes to security. It's super important and might seem obvious, but it's usually overlooked. You can build the world's best security systems, but they won't protect you if the users are going to be practicing unsafe security. If a user writes their password on a Post-it note, sticks it to their laptop, then leaves the laptop unlocked and unattended at a cafe, you could have a disaster on your hands. But making sure that your users take reasonable security precautions takes effort and can be really tricky. You have to make sure your users' habits and actions involve having clear and reasonable security policies. 
but there's more that you can do to help ensure that your users are diligent about maintaining security. Let's assume that your employees are acting with good intent and that leaks and disclosures are unintentional and mostly due to improper handling of sensitive data. Leaks and disclosures can be avoided by understanding what employees need to do to accomplish their jobs. You also need to make sure that they have the right tools to get their work done without compromising security. If an employee needs to share a confidential file with an external partner and it's too big to email, they may want to upload it to a third-party file sharing website that they have a personal account with. This is risky business. You should never upload confidential information onto a third-party service that hasn't been evaluated by your company. If sharing big files with external parties is common behavior for your employees, it's best to find a solution that meets the needs of your users and the security guidelines. By providing a sanctioned and approved mechanism for this file sharing activity, users are less likely to expose the organization to unnecessary risk. We covered password security when we discussed password authentication earlier, but there's more to talk about when it comes to users and passwords. I hate to say it, but generally speaking, users can be lazy about security stuff. They don't like to memorize long, complicated passwords, but this is super important to keeping your company safe. So how do we resolve this conflict? If we require 20 character passwords that have to be changed every three months, our users will almost definitely write them down. This compromises the security that our complex password policy is supposed to provide. It's important to understand what threats password policies are supposed to protect against. That way, you can try to find a better balance between security and usability. A long and complex password requirement is designed to protect against brute force attacks, either against authentication systems or if a hashed password database is stolen. Since direct brute force attacks against authentication infrastructure should be easily detected and blocked by intrusion prevention systems, they can be considered pretty low risk. But the theft of a password database would be a super serious breach. We do have lots of additional layers of security in place to prevent a critical compromise like that from happening in the first place. So the two attacks that complex passwords are primarily designed to protect against are fairly low risk. Now, we can relax the password requirements a bit and not ask for overly long passwords. We can even adjust the mandatory password rotation time period. Password reuse is another common user behavior. People don't want a bunch of passwords to memorize. Lots of users find it easier to use the same password for both their personal email account and their work account. But this undermines the security of their work password. If an online service is compromised and the password database is leaked, they're in trouble. The passwords in that database will find their way into password files used for cracking passwords and brute force attacks. Once a password isn't a secret, it shouldn't be used anymore. The chances of a bad actor being able to use the password are too high. That's why it's important to make sure employees use new and unique passwords and don't reuse them from other services. It's also important to have a password change system check against old passwords. This will prevent users from changing their password back to a previously used, potentially compromised password. A much greater risk in the workplace that users should be educated on is credential theft from phishing emails. Phishing emails are pretty effective. They take advantage of people's inclination to open emails without looking at them too closely. If an email that seems authentic actually leads to a fake login page, users can blindly enter their credentials into the fake site and disclose their credentials to an attacker. While having two-factor authentication helps protect against this type of attack, OTP-based two-factor solutions would still provide usable credentials to an attacker. Plus, the attacker still has a password, which is really not good, even in a two-factor environment. If someone entered their password into a phishing site or even suspects they did, it's important to change their password as soon as possible. If you can, your organization should try to detect these types of password disclosures using tools like Password Alert, which I've linked to in the next reading. This is a Chrome extension from Google that can detect when you enter your password into a site that's not a Google page. Being able to detect when a password is entered into a potentially untrustworthy site lets an organization detect potential phishing compromises. But you can also combat phishing attacks with good spam filtering combined with good user education. 
you can help influence good user behavior by offering security training, which we'll discuss in another video. Next up, we'll do a quick rundown of the benefits and trade-offs of third-party security. I'll see you there. Sometimes, you need to rely on third-party solutions or service providers because you might not be able to do everything in-house. This is especially true if you work as an IT support specialist in a small shop. In some cases, you'll have to trust that third party with a lot of potentially sensitive data or access. So how do you make sure that you aren't opening yourself up to a ton of unnecessary risk? When you contract services from a third party, you're trusting them to protect your data and any credentials involved. If they have subpar security, you're undermining your security defenses by potentially opening a new avenue of attack. It's important to hire trustworthy and reputable vendors whenever you can. You also need to manage the engagements in a controlled way. This involves conducting a vendor risk review or security assessment. In typical vendor security assessments, you ask vendors to complete a questionnaire that covers different aspects of their security policies, procedures, and defenses. The questionnaire is designed to determine whether or not they've implemented good security designs in their organization. For software services or hardware vendors, you might also ask to test the software or hardware. That way, you can evaluate it for potential security vulnerabilities or concerns before deciding to contract their services. It's important to understand how well protected your business partners are before deciding to work with them. If they have poor security practices, your organization's security could be at risk. If you contract services from a company that will be handling data on your behalf, the security of your data is in the hands of this third party, it's important to understand how safe your data will be with them. Sometimes, vendors will perform tasks for you, so they'll have access to your network and systems. In these cases, it's also important to understand how well secured the third party is. A compromise of their infrastructure could lead to a breach of your systems. While the questionnaire model is a quick way to assess a third party, it's not ideal. It depends on self-reporting of practices, which is pretty unreliable. Without a way to verify or prove what's stated in the questionnaire, you have to trust that the company is answering honestly. Why you'd hope that a company you're doing business with would be honest is best to verify. If you can, ask for a third-party security assessment report. Some of the information on the questionnaire can be verified, like third-party security audit results and penetration testing reports. In the case of third-party software, you might be able to conduct some basic vulnerability assessments and tests to ensure the product has some reasonable security. There are lots of companies that will evaluate vendors for you for a price, but Google recently made their vendor security assessment questionnaires available for free. I've provided a link to these questionnaires just after this video. This is a great starting point to design your own vendor security assessment questionnaire or you can just use these as is. If the third-party service involves the installation of any infrastructure equipment on site, pay close attention to how they're doing it. You have to make sure this equipment's managed in a way that doesn't negatively affect overall security. Let's say the vendor company requires remote access to the infrastructure device to perform maintenance. If that's the case, then make appropriate adjustments to firewall rules to restrict this access. That way, you'll make sure that it can't be used as an entry point into your network. Additional monitoring would also be recommended for this third-party device, since it represents a new potential attack surface in your network. If the vendor lets you, evaluate the hardware in a lab environment first. There, you can run in-depth vulnerability assessments and penetration testing of the hardware and make sure there aren't any obvious vulnerabilities in the product. Report your findings to the vendor and ask that they address any issues you discover. We try our best to protect our systems and networks, but it's pretty likely that some sort of incident will happen. This could be anything from a full system compromise and data theft to someone accidentally leaking a memo. Regardless of the nature of the incident, proper incident handling is important to understanding what exactly happened, and how it happened, and how to avoid it from happening again. 
the very first step of handling an incident is to detect it in the first place. Hopefully, our intrusion detection systems caught the telltale signs of an ongoing attack and alerted us to the threat. Incidents can be brought to your attention in other ways too. An employee may have noticed something suspicious and reported it to the security team for investigation. Or maybe they leaked information that ended up in the news. However you found out about the incident, the next step is to analyze it and determine the effects and scope of damage. Was it a data leak or information disclosure? If so, what information got out? How bad is it? Were systems compromised? What systems? And what level of access did they manage to get? Is it a malware infection? What systems were infected? Some attacks are really obvious, with very clear signs of an intrusion, like a defaced web page or unusual processes consuming all resources in the system. Others may be way more subtle and almost impossible to detect, like a small change to a single system configuration file. This is why having good monitoring in place is so important, along with understanding your baseline. Once you figure out what normal traffic looks like on your network and what services you expect to see, outliers will be easier to detect. This is important because every false lead that the incident response team has to investigate means time and resources wasted. This has the potential to allow real intrusions to go undetected and uninvestigated longer. During detection and scoping, correlating data from different systems can reveal a much bigger picture of what's happened. It might show how an intruder gained access. For example, you could see a connection event logged by the firewall from a suspicious IP address. Searching for other events related to this IP address may reveal login attempts in the authentication logs for a system. This would provide insight into where the attacker is coming from and what they attempted to do on the network. The authentication logs would also indicate whether or not they were able to successfully log into an account. If so, that's lets you know what account is compromised. Once the scope of the incident is determined, the next step is containment. You need to contain the breach to prevent further damage. For system compromises and malware infection, this is a pretty time-sensitive step. You don't want the malware or attacker to use one compromised machine to pivot to other machines inside your network. This could broaden the incident scope and cause even more damage. Containment strategies will vary depending on the nature of the incident. If an account was compromised, change the password immediately. If the owner is unable to change the password right away, then lock the account. Also, revoke any long-live authentication tokens, since the attacker may have one of those too. If it's a malware infection, can our anti-malware software quarantine or remove the infection? If not, the infected machine needs to be removed from the network as soon as possible to prevent lateral movement around the network. To do this, you can adjust network-based firewall rules to effectively quarantine the machine. You can also move the machine to a separate VLAN used for security quarantining purposes. This would be a VLAN with strict restrictions and filtering applied to prevent further infection of other systems and networks. It's important during this phase that efforts are made to avoid the destruction of any logs or forensic evidence. Attackers will usually try to cover their tracks by modifying logs and deleting files, especially when they suspect they've been caught. They'll take measures to make sure they keep their access to compromised systems. This could involve installing a backdoor or some kind of remote access malware. Another step to watch out for is creating a new user account that they can use to authenticate with in the future. With effective logging configurations and systems in place, these activities would show up in audit logs. So this type of access should be detected during an incident investigation. Then actions can be taken to remove access. I hope I'm not scaring you with all these scenarios, but it's better to be safe than sorry. Another part of incident analysis is determining severity, impact, and recoverability of the incident. Severity includes factors like what and how many systems were compromised and how the breach affects business functions. An incident that's compromised a bunch of machines in the network would be more severe than one where a single web server was hacked, for example. You can imagine that the effort required to fix a large-scale compromise would negatively affect the ability to do normal work. So the impact of an incident is also an important issue to consider. If the organization only had one web server and it was compromised, it might be considered a much higher severity breach. It would probably have a direct, externally visible impact on the business. 
Data exfiltration is the unauthorized transfer of data from a computer. It's also a very important concern when a security incident happens. Hackers may try to steal data for a number of reasons. They may want to steal account information to provide access later. They may target business data to publish online to cause financial loss or damage to the organization's reputation. In some cases, the attacker may just want to cause damage and destruction, which might involve deleting or corrupting data. What actions have been taken will affect the recoverability of the incident. The recoverability is how complicated and time-consuming the recovery effort will be. An incident that can be recovered with a simple restoration from backup by following documented procedures would be considered easily recovered from. But an incident where an attacker deleted large amounts of customer information and wrecked havoc across lots of critical infrastructure systems would be way more difficult to recover from. It might not be possible to recover from it at all. In some cases, depending on backup systems and configurations, some data may be lost forever and can't be restored. Backups won't contain any changes or new data that were made after the last backup run. Once a threat's been detected and contained, it has to be removed or remediated. When it comes to malware infection, this means removing the malware from affected systems. But in some cases, this may not be possible, so the affected systems have to be restored to a known good configuration. This can be done by rebuilding the machine or restoring from backup. Take care when removing malware from systems, because some malware is designed to be very persistent which means it's resistant to being removed. But before we can start the recovery, we have to contain the incident. This might involve shutting down affected systems to prevent further damage or spread of an infection. On the flip side of that, affected systems may just have network access removed to cut off any communication with the compromised system. Again, the motivating factor here would be to prevent the spread of any infection or to remove remote access to the system. The containment strategy varies depending on the nature of the affected system. Let's say a critical piece of networking infrastructure was compromised. A quick shutdown may not work since it would impact other business operations. On top of that, removing networking access might trigger fail-safes and attack software or malware. Let's say a piece of malware is designed to periodically check into a command and control server. Severing network communications with the infected host might cause the malware to trigger a self-destruct function in an attempt to destroy evidence. Forensic analysis may need to be done to analyze the attack. This is especially true when it comes to a malware infection. In the case of forensic analysis, affected machines might be investigated very closely to determine exactly what the attacker did. This is usually done by taking an image of the disk, essentially making a virtual copy of the hard drive. This lets the investigator analyze the contents of the disk without the risk of modifying or altering the original files. If that happened, it would compromise the integrity of any forensic evidence. Usually, evidence gathering is also part of the incident response process. This provides evidence to law enforcement if the organization wants to pursue legal action against the attackers. Forensic evidence is super useful for providing details of the attack to the security community. It allows other security teams to be aware of new threats and lets them better defend themselves. It's also very important that you get members from your legal team involved in any incident handling plans. Because an incident can have legal implications for the company, a lawyer should be available to consult and advise on the legal aspects of the investigation. It's crucial in order to avoid complications or issues of liability. Members of the public relations team should also get involved since these incidents can have an impact on a company's reputation. There's another part of the cleanup and recovery phase I should call out. We'll need to use information from the analysis to prevent any further intrusions or infections. First, we determine the entry point to figure out how the attacker got in or what vulnerability the malware exploited. This needs to be done at the same time as the cleanup. If you remove the malware infection without also addressing the underlying vulnerability, systems could become reinfected right after you clean them up. As you learned in the System Administration and IT Infrastructure Services course, postmortems can be a great way to document incidents. 
the learnings from postmortems can be used to prevent those incidents from happening again. If a critical system has been compromised, remediation can be complicated because of downtime during remediation and recovery. Logs have to be audited to determine exactly what the attacker did while they had access to the system. They'll also tell you what data the attacker accessed. Systems must be scrutinized to ensure no backdoors have been installed or malware planted on the system. Depending on the severity of the compromise or infection, it might be necessary to rebuild the system from the ground up. Cleanup would typically involve restoring from a backup point to a known good configuration. Infected or corrupted system files could be restored from known good copies. Sometimes, cleanup can be very simple and quick. I hope that's what you find more often than not. If a website was defaced, the attacker may have simply uploaded their defaced HTML file and pointed the web server at the new file. A configuration file change and deletion of the attacker's HTML file would undo those changes. Even so, efforts need to be made to determine how the attacker got access. That vulnerability should be closed to prevent any future attacks. When all traces of the attack have been removed and discovered, and the known vulnerabilities have been closed, you can move on to the last step. That's when systems need to be thoroughly tested to make sure proper functionality has been restored. Usually, affected systems would also remain under close watch, sometimes with additional detailed monitoring and logging enabled. This is to watch for any additional signs of an intrusion in case something was missed during the cleanup. It's also possible that the attacker will attempt to attack the same target again. There's a very high chance that they use the same or similar attack methodology on other targets in your network. It's important to incorporate the lessons you've learned from any incident into your overall security defenses. Update firewall rules and ACLs if an exposure was discovered in the course of the investigation. Create new definitions and rules for intrusion detection systems that can watch for the signs of the same attack again. Stay vigilant and prepared to protect your system from attacks. Remember that at some point, some sort of security breach will happen. Just stay calm and execute your plan to counterattack the breach. Congratulations on all you've accomplished. What you have achieved is no small feat. It's very difficult to dive into a topic that you know nothing about and from the very beginning to become the expert that you are now. You've done a lot of work. It's, it's been an incredible journey. These are all not easy concepts to get, but you made it through the whole thing. It's an amazing accomplishment, and you should be really proud of yourself. Congrats, that's great work. Congratulations. 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 You're probably exhausted right now, but congratulations. And I hope that all this was super exciting and that you're really excited about where you can take this now. Congratulations, you've made it. You're through the program. Now get out there and get a job and get your career started. Think back to the beginning of this course, when we talked about attacks and vulnerabilities. The special class of vulnerabilities we discussed, called zero-day vulnerabilities, are unique since they're unknown until they're exploited in the wild. The potential for these unknown flaws is something you should think about when looking to secure your company's systems and networks. Even though it's an unknown risk, it can still be handled by taking measures to restrict and control access to systems. Our end goal overall is risk reduction. Two important terms to know when talking about security risks are attack vectors and attack surfaces. An attack vector is a method or mechanism by which an attacker or malware gains access to a network or system. Some attack vectors are email attachments, network protocols or services, network interfaces, and user input. These are different approaches or paths that an attacker could use to compromise a system if they're able to exploit it. An attack surface is the sum of all the different attack vectors in a given system. Think of this as the combination of all possible ways an attacker could interact with our system, regardless of known vulnerabilities. It's not possible to know of all vulnerabilities in a system, so make sure to think of all avenues that an outside actor could interact with our systems as a potential attack surface. The main takeaway here is to keep our attack surfaces as small as possible. 
This reduces the chances of an attacker discovering an unknown flaw and compromising our systems. There are lots of approaches you can use as an IT support specialist to reduce attack surfaces. All of them boil down to simplifying systems and services. The less complex something is, the less likely there will be undetected flaws. So make sure to disable any extra services or protocols. If they're not totally necessary, then get them out of there. Every additional surface that's operating represents additional attack surfaces that could have an undiscovered vulnerability. That vulnerability could be exploited and lead to compromise. This concept also applies to access and ACLs. Only allow access when totally necessary. So, for example, it's probably not necessary for employees to be able to access printers directly from outside of a local network. You can just adjust firewall rules to prevent that type of access. Another way to keep things simple is to reduce your software deployments. Instead of having five different software solutions to accomplish five separate tasks, replace them with one unified solution, if you can. That one solution should require less complex code, which reduces the number of potential vulnerabilities. You should also make sure to disable unnecessary or unused components of software and systems deployed. By disabling features not in use, you're reducing even more attack surfaces even more. You're not only reducing the number of ways an attacker can get in, but you're also minimizing the amount of code that's active. It's important to take this approach at every level of systems and networks under your administration. It might seem obvious to take these measures on critical networking infrastructure and servers, but it's just as important to do this for desktop and laptop platforms that your employees use. Lots of consumer operating systems ship a bunch of default services and software enabled right out of the box that you probably won't be using in an enterprise network or environment. For example, Telnet access for a managed switch has no business being enabled in a real-world environment. You should disable it immediately if you find it on a device. Any vendor-specific API access should also be disabled if you don't plan on using these services or tools. They might be harmless, especially if you set up strong firewall rules and network ACLs. This one service might represent a fairly low risk, but why take any unnecessary risk at all? Remember, the defense in depth concept is all about risk mitigation and implementing layers of security. Now, let's think about the layered approach to security. What if our access control measures are bypassed or fail in some unforeseen way? As an IT support specialist, this is exactly what you want to think about. How do we keep this component secure if the security systems above it have failed? Congrats on getting this far. You're over halfway through the course and so close to completing the program. In this section, we'll cover ways for you to harden your networks. Network hardening is the process of securing a network by reducing its potential vulnerabilities through configuration changes and taking specific steps. In the next few lessons, we'll do a deep dive on the best practices that an IT support specialist should know for implementing network hardening. We'll also discuss network security protection along with network monitoring and analysis. There's a general security principle that can be applied to most areas of security. It's the concept of disabling unnecessary extra services or restricting access to them. Since any service that's enabled and accessible can be attacked, this principle should be applied to network security too. Networks would be much safer if you disable access to network services that aren't needed and enforce access restrictions. Implicit deny is a network security concept where anything not explicitly permitted or allowed should be denied. This is different from blocking all traffic, since an implicit deny configuration will still let traffic pass that you've defined as allowed. You can do this through ACL configurations. This can usually be configured on a firewall, which makes it easier to build secure firewall rules. Instead of requiring you to specifically block all traffic you don't want, you can just create rules for traffic that you need to go through. You can think of this as whitelisting as opposed to blacklisting. While this is slightly less convenient, it's a much more secure configuration. 
Before a new service will work, a new rule must be defined for it, reducing convenience a bit. If you want to learn more about how to configure firewall rules in Linux and other implementations, take a look at the references in the supplementary reading. Another very important component of network security is monitoring and analyzing traffic on your network. There are a couple reasons why monitoring your network is so important. The first is that it lets you establish a baseline of what your typical network traffic looks like. This is key because in order to know what unusual or potential attack traffic looks like, you need to know what normal traffic looks like. You can do this through network traffic monitoring and logs analysis. We'll dive deeper into what network traffic monitoring is a bit later. But let's quickly summarize how logs can be helpful in this context. Analyzing logs is the practice of collecting logs from different network and sometimes client devices on your network, then performing an automated analysis on them. This will highlight potential intrusions, signs of malware infections, or atypical behavior. You'd want to analyze things like firewall logs, authentication server logs, and application logs. As an IT support specialist, you should pay close attention to any external facing devices or services. They're subject to a lot more potentially malicious traffic, which increases the risk of compromise. Analysis of logs would involve looking for specific log messages of interest, like with firewall logs. Attempted connections to an internal service from an untrusted source address may be worth investigating. Connections from the internal network to known address ranges of botnet command and control servers could mean there's a compromised machine on the network. As you learned in earlier courses of this program, log and analysis systems are a best practice for IT support specialists to utilize and implement. This is true, too, for network hardening. Logs analysis systems are configured using user-defined rules to match interesting or atypical log entries. These can then be surfaced through an alerting system to let security engineers investigate the alert. Part of this alerting process would also involve categorizing the alert based on the rule matched. You'd also need to assign a priority to facilitate this investigation and to permit better searching or filtering. Alerts could take the form of sending an email or an SMS with information and a link to the event that was detected. You could even wake someone up in the middle of the night if the event was severe enough. Normalizing log data is an important step since logs from different devices and systems may not be formatted in a common way. You might need to convert log components into a common format to make analysis easier for analysts and rule-based detection systems. This also makes correlation analysis easier. Correlation analysis is the process of taking log data from different systems and matching events across the systems. So if we see a suspicious connection coming from a suspect source address in the firewall logs to our authentication server, we might want to correlate that logged connection with the log data of the authentication server. That would show us any authentication attempts made by the suspicious client. This type of logs analysis is also super important in investigating and recreating the events that happened once a compromise is detected. This is usually called a post-fail analysis since it's investigating how a compromise happened after the breach is detected. Detailed logging and analysis of logs would allow for detailed reconstruction of the events that led to the compromise. Hopefully, this would let the security team make appropriate changes to security systems to prevent further attacks. It could also help determine the extent and severity of the compromise. Detailed logging would also be able to show if further systems were compromised after the initial breach. It would also tell us whether or not any data was stolen, and if it was, what that data was. One popular and powerful logs analysis system is Splunk, a very flexible and extensible log aggregation and search system. Splunk can grab logs data from a wide variety of systems and in large amounts of formats. It can also be configured to generate alerts, and allows for powerful visualization of activity based on log data. You can read more about Splunk in the supplementary readings in this lesson. Flood guards provide protection against DOS or denial of service attacks. Think back to the CIA triad we covered earlier. Availability is an important tenet of security and is exactly what flood guard protections are designed to help ensure. This works by identifying common flood attack types like SYN floods or UDP floods. 
It then triggers alerts once a configurable threshold of traffic is reached. There's another threshold called the activation threshold. When this one is reached, it triggers a pre-configured action. This will typically block the identified attack traffic for a specific amount of time. This is usually a feature on enterprise-grade routers or firewalls, though it's a general security concept. A common open source flood guard protection tool is fail to ban. It watches for signs of an attack on a system and blocks further attempts from a suspected attack address. Fail to ban is a popular tool for smaller scale organizations. So if you're the sole IT support specialist in your company or have a small fleet of machines, this can be a helpful tool to use. This flood guard protection can also be described as a form of intrusion prevention system, which we'll cover in more detail in another video. Network separation or network segmentation is a good security principle for an IT support specialist to implement. It permits more flexible management of the network and provides some security benefits. This is the concept of using VLANs to create virtual networks for different device classes or types. Think of it as creating dedicated virtual networks for your employees to use, but also having separate networks for your printers to connect to. The idea here is that the printers won't need access to the same network resources that employees do. It probably doesn't make sense to have the printers on the employee network. You might be wondering how employees are supposed to print if the printers are on a different network. It's actually one of the benefits of network separation, since we can control and monitor the flow of traffic between networks more easily. To give employees access to printers, we'd configure routing between the two networks on our routers. We'd also implement network ACLs that permit the appropriate traffic. Last but not least, the final A of the triple A's of security is accounting. This means keeping records of what resources and services your users access or what they did when they were using your systems. A critical component of this is auditing, which involves reviewing these records to ensure that nothing is out of the ordinary. If we're watching and recording usage of our systems, but never actually checking the usage data, that's not super useful. So, what exactly do counting systems keep track of? Well, that depends on the purpose and intent of the system. For example, a Takax Plus server would be more concerned with keeping track of user authentication, what systems they authenticated to, and what commands they ran during their session. This is because Takax Plus is a device access AAA system that manages who has access to your network devices and what they do on them. Cisco's AAA system supports accounting of individual commands executed, connection to and from network devices, commands executed in privileged mode, and network services and system details, like configuration reloads or reboots. Radius would track details like session duration, client location, and bandwidth or other resources used during the session. This is because Radius is a network access AAA system, so it tracks details about network access and usage. Radius accounting kicks off with the network access server sending an accounting request packet to the accounting server that contains an event record to be logged. This starts the accounting session on the server. The server replies with an accounting response indicating that the message was received. The NAS will continue sending periodic accounting messages with statistics of the session until an accounting stop packet is received. Radius accounting can be used for billing purposes by ISPs because it records the length of a session and the amount of data sent and received by the user. This data can also be used to enforce data or time quotas, limiting the duration of sessions or restricting the amount of data that can be sent or received. But this accounting information isn't detailed and won't contain specifics of what exactly the user did during the session. Information like websites visited or what protocols were used aren't recorded. Other logging utilities that we'll cover later meet that use case. Wow, okay, we covered a lot in this module. Great work. Take the time to go over anything that may have been a little dense. When you're ready, we've got a project for you that will test you on authentication, authorization, and accounting system concepts. Once that's done, you can head to the next video where we'll dive into network security, monitoring, and logging.
Congrats on getting this far. You're over halfway through the course and so close to completing the program. In this section, we'll cover ways for you to harden your networks. Network hardening is the process of securing a network by reducing its potential vulnerabilities through configuration changes and taking specific steps. In the next few lessons, we'll do a deep dive on the best practices that an IT support specialist should know for implementing network hardening. We'll also discuss network security protection along with network monitoring and analysis. There's a general security principle that can be applied to most areas of security. It's the concept of disabling unnecessary extra services or restricting access to them. Since any service that's enabled and accessible can be attacked, this principle should be applied to network security too. Networks would be much safer if you disable access to network services that aren't needed and enforce access restrictions. Implicit deny is a network security concept where anything not explicitly permitted or allowed should be denied. This is different from blocking all traffic since an implicit deny configuration will still let traffic pass that you've defined as allowed. You can do this through ACL configurations. This can usually be configured on a firewall, which makes it easier to build secure firewall rules. Instead of requiring you to specifically block all traffic you don't want, you can just create rules for traffic that you need to go through. You can think of this as whitelisting as opposed to blacklisting. While this is slightly less convenient, it's a much more secure configuration. Before a new service will work, a new rule must be defined for it, reducing convenience a bit. If you want to learn more about how to configure firewall rules in Linux and other implementations, take a look at the references in the supplementary reading. Another very important component of network security is monitoring and analyzing traffic on your network. There are a couple reasons why monitoring your network is so important. The first is that it lets you establish a baseline of what your typical network traffic looks like. This is key because in order to know what unusual or potential attack traffic looks like, you need to know what normal traffic looks like. You can do this through network traffic monitoring and logs analysis. We'll dive deeper into what network traffic monitoring is a bit later, but let's quickly summarize how logs can be helpful in this context. Analyzing logs is the practice of collecting logs from different network and sometimes client devices on your network, then performing an automated analysis on them. This will highlight potential intrusions, signs of malware infections, or atypical behavior. You'd want to analyze things like firewall logs, authentication server logs, and application logs. As an IT support specialist, you should pay close attention to any external facing devices or services. They're subject to a lot more potentially malicious traffic, which increases the risk of compromise. Analysis of logs would involve looking for specific log messages of interest, like with firewall logs. Attempted connections to an internal service from an untrusted source address may be worth investigating. Connections from the internal network to known address ranges of botnet command and control servers could mean there's a compromised machine on the network. As you learned in earlier courses of this program, log and analysis systems are a best practice for IT support specialists to utilize and implement. This is true, too, for network hardening. Logs analysis systems are configured using user-defined rules to match interesting or atypical log entries. These can then be surfaced through an alerting system to let security engineers investigate the alert. Part of this alerting process would also involve categorizing the alert based on the rule matched. You'd also need to assign a priority to facilitate this investigation and to permit better searching or filtering. Alerts could take the form of sending an email or an SMS with information and a link to the event that was detected. You could even wake someone up in the middle of the night if the event was severe enough. Normalizing log data is an important step since logs from different devices and systems may not be formatted in a common way. You might need to convert log components into a common format to make analysis easier for analysts and rule-based detection systems. This also makes correlation analysis easier. Correlation analysis is the process of taking log data from different systems and matching events across the systems. 
So if we see a suspicious connection coming from a suspect source address in the firewall logs to our authentication server, we might want to correlate that logged connection with the log data of the authentication server. That would show us any authentication attempts made by the suspicious client. This type of logs analysis is also super important in investigating and recreating the events that happened once a compromise is detected. This is usually called a post-fail analysis, since it's investigating how a compromise happened after the breach is detected. Detailed logging and analysis of logs would allow for detailed reconstruction of the events that led to the compromise. Hopefully, this would let the security team make appropriate changes to security systems to prevent further attacks. It could also help determine the extent and severity of the compromise. Detailed logging would also be able to show if further systems were compromised after the initial breach. It would also tell us whether or not any data was stolen, and if it was, what that data was. One popular and powerful logs analysis system is Splunk, a very flexible and extensible log aggregation and search system. Splunk can grab logs data from a wide variety of systems and in large amounts of formats. It can also be configured to generate alerts and allows for powerful visualization of activity based on log data. You can read more about Splunk in the supplementary readings in this lesson. Flood guards provide protection against DOS or denial of service attacks. Think back to the CIA triad we covered earlier. Availability is an important tenet of security and is exactly what flood guard protections are designed to help ensure. This works by identifying common flood attack types like SYN floods or UDP floods. It then triggers alerts once a configurable threshold of traffic is reached. There's another threshold called the activation threshold. When this one is reached, it triggers a pre-configured action. This will typically block the identified attack traffic for a specific amount of time. This is usually a feature on enterprise-grade routers or firewalls, though it's a general security concept. A common open source flood guard protection tool is fail to ban. It watches for signs of an attack on a system and blocks further attempts from a suspected attack address. Fail to ban is a popular tool for smaller scale organizations. So if you're the sole IT support specialist in your company or have a small fleet of machines, this can be a helpful tool to use. This flood guard protection can also be described as a form of intrusion prevention system, which we'll cover in more detail in another video. Network separation or network segmentation is a good security principle for an IT support specialist to implement. It permits more flexible management of the network and provides some security benefits. This is the concept of using VLANs to create virtual networks for different device classes or types. Think of it as creating dedicated virtual networks for your employees to use, but also having separate networks for your printers to connect to. The idea here is that the printers won't need access to the same network resources that employees do. It probably doesn't make sense to have the printers on the employee network. You might be wondering how employees are supposed to print if the printers are on a different network. It's actually one of the benefits of network separation, since we can control and monitor the flow of traffic between networks more easily. To give employees access to printers, we'd configure routing between the two networks on our routers. We'd also implement network ACLs that permit the appropriate traffic. In this video, we'll cover some ways that an IT support specialist can implement network hardware hardening. We talked about general network hardening, and now we're going to dive deeper into more specific tools and techniques for hardening a network. We'll pay close attention to features and options available on networking infrastructure hardware. In an earlier lesson on networking, we explored DHCP. It's the protocol where devices on a network are assigned critical configuration information for communicating on the network. You also learned about configuring DHCP in another course of this program. So you can see how DHCP is a target of attackers because of the important nature of the service it provides. If an attacker can manage to deploy a rogue DHCP server on your network, they could hand out DHCP leases with whatever information they want. 
This includes setting a gateway address or DNS server that's actually a machine within their control. This gives them access to your traffic and opens the door for future attacks. Yikes. We call this type of attack a rogue DHCP server attack. To protect against this rogue DHCP server attack, enterprise switches offer a feature called DHCP snooping. A switch that has DHCP snooping will monitor DHCP traffic being sent across it. It will also track IP assignments and map them to hosts connected to switch ports. This basically builds a map of assigned IP addresses to physical switch ports. This information can also be used to protect against IP spoofing and ARP poisoning attacks. DHCP snooping also makes you designate either a trusted DHCP server IP if it's operating as a DHCP helper and forwarding DHCP requests to the server. Or you can enable DHCP snooping trust on the uplink port where legitimate DHCP responses would now come from. Now, any DHCP responses coming from either an untrusted IP address or from a downlink switch port would be detected as untrusted and discarded by the switch. Let's talk about another form of network hardware hardening, dynamic ARP inspection. We covered ARP earlier from the how does it function standpoint. ARP allows for a layer two man in the middle attack because of the unauthenticated nature of ARP. It allows an attacker to forge an ARP response advertising its MAC address as the physical address matching a victim's IP address. This type of ARP response is called a gratuitous ARP response, since it's effectively answering a query that no one made. When this happens, all of the clients on the local network segment would cache this ARP entry. Because of the forged ARP entry, they send frames intended for the victim's IP address to the attacker's machine instead. The attacker could enable IP forwarding, which would let them transparently monitor traffic intended for the victim. They could also manipulate or modify data. Dynamic ARP inspection, or DAI, is another feature on enterprise switches that prevents this type of attack. It requires the use of DHCP snooping to establish a trusted binding of IP addresses to switch ports. DAI will detect these forged gratuitous ARP packets and drop them. It does this because it has a table from DHCP snooping that has the authoritative IP address assignments per port. DAI also enforces rate limiting of ARP packets per port to prevent ARP scanning. An attacker is likely to ARP scan before attempting the ARP attack. To prevent IP spoofing attacks, IP source guard or IPSG can be enabled on enterprise switches along with DHCP snooping. If you're an IT support specialist at a small company that uses enterprise class switch hardware, you'll probably utilize IPSG. It works by using the DHCP snooping table to dynamically create ACLs for each switch port. This drops packets that don't match the IP address for the port based on the DHCP snooping table. Now, if you really want to lock down your network, you can implement 802.1x. We've added details about how to configure this in the supplementary reading, but for now, let's discuss this at a high level. It's important for an IT support specialist to be aware of 802.1x. This is the IEEE standard for encapsulating EAP, or Extensible Authentication Protocol, traffic over the 802 networks. This is also called EAP over LAN, or EAPOL. It was originally designed for Ethernet, but support was added for other network types, like Wi-Fi and fiber networks. We won't go into the details of all EAP authentication types supported. There are about 100 compatible types, so it would take way too long. But we'll take a closer look at EAP TLS, since it's one of the more common and secure EAP methods. When a client wants to authenticate to a network using 802.1x, there are three parties involved. The client device is what we call the supplicant. It's sometimes also used to refer to the software running on the client machine that handles the authentication process for the user. The open source Linux utility WPA supplicant is one of those. The supplicant communicates with the authenticator, which acts as a sort of gatekeeper for the network. It requires clients to successfully authenticate to the network before they're allowed to communicate with the network. This is usually an enterprise switch, 
or an access point in the case of wireless networks. It's important to call out that while the supplicant communicates with the authenticator, it's not actually the authenticator that makes the authentication decision. The authenticator acts like a go-between and forwards the authentication request to the authentication server. That's where the actual credential verification and authentication occurs. The authentication server is usually a RADIUS server. EAP TLS is an authentication type supported by EAP that uses TLS to provide mutual authentication of both the client and the authenticating server. This is considered one of the more secure configurations for wireless security, so it's definitely possible that you'll encounter this authentication type in your IT career. Like with many of these protocols, understanding how it works can help you if you need to troubleshoot. You might remember from course four that HTTPS is a combination of the hypertext transfer protocol, HTTP, with SSL TLS cryptographic protocols. When TLS is implemented for HTTPS traffic, it specifies a client certificate as an optional factor of authentication. Similarly, most EAP TLS implementations require client-side certificates. Authentication can be certificate-based, which requires a client to present a valid certificate that's signed by the authenticating CA, or a client can use a certificate in conjunction with a username, password, and even a second factor of authentication, like a one-time password. The security of EAP TLS stems from the inherent security that the TLS protocol and PKI provide. That also means that the pitfalls are the same when it comes to properly managing PKI elements. You have to safeguard private keys appropriately and ensure distribution of the CA certificate to client devices to allow verification of the server side. An even more secure configuration for EAP TLS would be to bind the client side certificates to the client platforms using TPMs. This would prevent theft of the certificates from client machines. When you combine this with FDE, even theft of a computer would prevent compromise of the network. We're covering a lot of complex processes right now, so feel free to watch this video again so that the material really sinks in. If you're really interested in implementing these processes yourself or want to dive into even more details about how it all works, check out the supplementary readings for this lesson. Keep in mind, as an IT support specialist, you don't need to know every single step-by-step -step detail here. Knowing what these processes are and how they work can be very beneficial while troubleshooting and evaluating infrastructure security. When you're ready, I'll catch you in the next video. Hey, welcome back. In the last lesson, we cover network hardware hardening security measures, which you should be aware of as an IT support specialist. Now, we're going to shift to network software hardening techniques. Just like with network hardware hardening, it's important for you to know how to implement network software hardening, which includes things like firewalls, proxies, and VPNs. These security software solutions will play an important role in securing networks and their traffic for your organization. Like we mentioned before, firewalls are critical to securing a network. They can be deployed as dedicated network infrastructure devices, which regulate the flow of traffic for a whole network. They can also be host-based as software that runs on a client system providing protection for that one host only. It's generally recommended to deploy both solutions. A host-based firewall provides protection for mobile devices, such as a laptop that could be used in an untrusted, potentially malicious environment, like an airport Wi-Fi hotspot. Host-based firewalls are also useful for protecting other hosts from being compromised by a corrupt device on the internal network. That's something a network-based firewall may not be able to help defend against. You will almost definitely encounter host-based firewalls since all major operating systems have built-in ones today. It's also very likely that your company will have some kind of network-based firewall. Your router at home even has a network-based firewall built in. VPNs are also recommended to provide secure access to internal resources for mobile or roaming users. We went over the details of VPNs and how they work in securing network traffic. If you need a refresher, 
feel free to revisit that again. We won't go back over all the details, but here's a quick rundown. VPNs are commonly used to provide secure remote access and link two networks securely. Let's say we have two offices located in buildings that are on opposite sides of town. We want to create one unified network that would let users in each location seamlessly connect to devices and services in either location. We could use a site-to-site -site VPN to link these two offices. To the people in the offices, everything would just work. They'd be able to connect to a service hosted in the other office without any specific configuration. Using a VPN tunnel, all traffic between the two offices can be secured using encryption. This lets the two remote networks join each other seamlessly. This way, clients on one network can access devices on the other without requiring them to individually connect to a VPN service. Usually, the same infrastructure can be used to allow remote access VPN services for individual clients that require access to internal resources while out of the office. Proxies can be really useful to protect client devices and their traffic. They also provide secure remote access without using a VPN. A standard web proxy can be configured for client devices. This allows web traffic to be proxied through a proxy server that we control for lots of purposes. This configuration can be used for logging web requests of client devices. The devices can be used for logs and traffic analysis and forensic investigation. The proxy server can be configured to block content that might be malicious, dangerous, or just against company policy. A reverse proxy can be configured to allow secure remote access to web-based services without requiring a VPN. Now, as an IT support specialist, you may need to configure or maintain a reverse proxy service as an alternative to VPN. By configuring a reverse proxy at the edge of your network, connection requests to services inside the network coming from outside are intercepted by the reverse proxy. They're then forwarded onto the internal service with the reverse proxy acting as a relay. This bridges communications between the remote client outside the network and the internal service. This proxy setup can be secured even more by requiring the use of client TLS certificates along with username and password authentication. Specific ACLs can also be configured on the reverse proxy to restrict access even more. Lots of popular proxy solutions support a reverse proxy configuration, like Ha Proxy, Nginx, and even the Apache web server. You can read more about these popular proxy solutions in the supplemental readings. Next up, let's take a practice quiz to secure the network architecture terms we've just discussed. In this lesson, we'll cover the best practices for implementing wireless security. As an IT support specialist, you'll be responsible for Wi-Fi configuration and infrastructure. So understanding the security options available for wireless networks is super important to making sure that the best solution is chosen. We already covered the nuts and bolts of the wireless 802.11 protocol and explained how wireless networks work, so we won't rehash that. But we'll take a closer look at the security implementations available to protect wireless networks. Before we jump into the nitty gritty details of wireless security, take a second and ask yourself this question. What do you think the best security option is for securing a Wi-Fi network? It's okay if you're not sure. Just keep this question in mind as we go over all the options available, along with their benefits and drawbacks. Spoiler alert. There's some pretty technical security stuff coming your way, so put your thinking caps on. The first security protocol introduced for Wi-Fi networks was WEP, or Wired Equivalent Privacy. It was part of the original 802.11 standard introduced back in 1997. WEP was intended to provide privacy on par with a wired network. That means the information passed over the network should be protected from third parties eavesdropping. This was an important consideration when designing the wireless specification. Unlike wired networks, packets could be intercepted by anyone with physical proximity to the access point or client station. Without some form of encryption to protect the packets, wireless traffic would be readable by anyone nearby who wants to listen. 
WEP was proven to be seriously bad at providing confidentiality or security for wireless networks. It was quickly discounted in 2004 in favor of more secure systems. Even so, we'll cover it here for historical purposes. I want to drive home the point that no one should be using WEP anymore. You never know, you may see seriously outdated systems when working as an IT support specialist. So it's important that you fully understand why WEP is outdated and what you can do instead. WEP used the RC4 symmetric stream cipher for encryption. It used either a 40-bit or 104-bit shared key where the encryption key for individual packets was derived. The actual encryption key for each packet was computed by taking the user-supplied shared key and then joining a 24-bit initialization vector, or IV for short. It's a randomized bit of data to avoid reusing the same encryption key between packets. Since these bits of data are concatenated or joined, a 40-bit shared key scheme uses a 64-bit key for encryption, and the 104-bit scheme uses a 128-bit key. Originally, WEP encryption was limited to 64-bit only because of US export restrictions placed on encryption technologies. Now, once those laws were changed, 128-bit encryption became available for use. The shared key was entered as either 10 hexadecimal characters for 40-bit WEP or 26 hex characters for 104-bit WEP. Each hex character was 4 bits each. The key could also be specified by supplying 5 ASCII characters or 13, each ASCII character representing 8 bits. But this actually reduces the available key space to only valid ASCII characters instead of all possible hex values. Since this is a component of the actual key, the shared key must be exactly as many characters as appropriate for the encryption scheme. WEP authentication originally supported two different modes, open system authentication and shared key authentication. The open system mode didn't require clients to supply credentials. Instead, they were allowed to authenticate and associate with the access point. But the access point would begin communicating with the client encrypting data frames with the pre-shared WEP key. If the client didn't have the key or had an incorrect key, it wouldn't be able to decrypt the frames coming from the access point, or AP. It also wouldn't be able to communicate back to the AP. Shared key authentication worked by requiring clients to authenticate through a four-step challenge response process. This basically has the AP asking the client to prove that they have the correct key. Here's how it works. The client sends an authentication request to the AP. The AP replies with a clear text challenge, a bit of randomized data that the client is supposed to encrypt using the shared web key. The client replies to the AP with the resulting ciphertext from encrypting this challenge text. The AP verifies this by decrypting the response and checking it against the plain text challenge text. If they match, a positive response is sent back. Does anything jump out at you as potentially insecure in this scheme? We're transmitting both the plain text and the ciphertext in a way that exposes both of these messages to potential eavesdroppers. This opens the possibility for the encryption key to be recovered by the attacker. A general concept in security and encryption is to never send the plain text and ciphertext together so that attackers can't work out the key used for encryption. But WEP's true weakness wasn't related to the authentication schemes. Its use of the RC4 stream cipher and how the IVs were used to generate encryption keys led to WEP's ultimate downfall. The primary purpose of an IV is to introduce more random elements into the encryption key to avoid reusing the same one. When using a stream cipher like RC4, it's super important that an encryption key doesn't get reused. This would allow an attacker to compare two messages encrypted using the same key and recover information. But the encryption key in WEP is just made up of the shared key, which doesn't change frequently. It had 24 bits of randomized data, including the IV, tacked onto the end of it. This results in only a 24-bit pool where unique encryption keys will be pulled from and used. Since the IV is made up of 24 bits of data, the total number of possible values is not very big by modern computing standards. That's only about 17 million possible unique IVs, which means after roughly 5,000 packets, 
an IV will be reused. When an IV is reused, the encryption key is also reused. It's also important to call out that the IV is transmitted in plain text. If it were encrypted, the receiver would not be able to decrypt it. This means an attacker just has to keep track of IVs and watch for repeated ones. The actual attack that lets an attacker recover the web key relies on weaknesses in some IVs and how the RC4 cipher generates a key stream used for encrypting the data payloads. This lets the attacker reconstruct this key stream using packets encrypted using the weak IVs. The details of the attack are outside what we'll cover in this course, but the full paper detailing the attack is available in the supplementary readings if you want to check it out. You can also take a look at open source tools that demonstrate this attack in action, like Aircrack NG or Air Snort. They can recover a web key in a matter of minutes. It's kind of terrifying to think about. So now you've heard the technical reasons why WEP is inherently vulnerable to attacks. In the next video, we'll talk about the solution that replaced WEP. But before we get there, you might be asking yourself why it's important to know WEP since it's not recommended for use anymore. Well, as an IT support specialist, you might encounter some cases where legacy hardware is still running WEP. It's important to understand the security implications of using this broken security protocol so you can prioritize upgrading away from WEP. All right, now let's dive into the replacement for WEP in the next video. We briefly mentioned host-based firewalls when we talked about network monitoring and intrusion detection systems. Host-based firewalls are important to creating multiple layers of security. They protect individual hosts from being compromised when they're used in untrusted and potentially malicious environments. They also protect individual hosts from potentially compromised peers inside a trusted network. Our network-based firewall has a duty to protect our internal network by filtering traffic in and out of it, while the host-based firewall on each individual host protects that one machine. Like our network-based firewall, we'd still want to start with an implicit deny rule. Then we'd selectively enable specific services and ports that'll be used. This lets us start with a secure default and then only permits traffic that we know and trust. You can think of this as starting with a perfectly secure firewall configuration and then poking holes in it for the specific traffic we require. This may look very different from your network firewall configuration since it's unlikely that your employees would need remote SSH access to their laptops, for example. Remember that to secure systems, you need to minimize attack surfaces or exposure. A host-based firewall plays a big part in reducing what's accessible to an outside attacker. It provides flexibility while only permitting connections to selective services on a given host from specific networks or IP ranges. This ability to restrict connections from certain origins is usually used to implement a highly secure host or network. From there, access to critical or sensitive systems or infrastructure is permitted. These are called bastion hosts or networks and are specifically hardened and minimized to reduce what's permitted to run on them. Bastion hosts are usually exposed to the internet, so you should pay special attention to hardening and locking them down to reduce the chances of compromise. But they can also be used as a sort of gateway or access portal into more sensitive services like core authentication servers or domain controllers. This would let you implement more secure authentication mechanisms and ACLs on the Bastion hosts without making it inconvenient for your entire company. Monitoring and logging can be prioritized for these hosts more easily. Typically, these hosts or networks would also have severely limited network connectivity. It's usually just to the secure zone that they're designed to protect and not much else. Applications that are allowed to be installed and run on these hosts would also be restricted to those that are strictly necessary since these machines have one specific purpose. Part of the host base firewall rules will likely also provide ACLs that allow access from the VPN subnet. It's good practice to keep the network that VPN clients connect into separate using both subnetting and VLANs. 
This gives you more flexibility to enforce security on these VPN clients. It also lets you build additional layers of defenses. While a VPN host should be protected using other means, it's still a host that's operating in a potentially malicious environment. This host is then initiating a remote connection into your trusted internal network. These hosts represent another potential vector of attack and compromise. Your ability to separately monitor traffic coming and going from them is super useful. There's an important thing for you to consider when it comes to host-based firewalls, especially for client systems like laptops. If the users of the system have administrator rights, then they have the ability to change firewall rules and configurations. This is something you should keep in mind and make sure to monitor with logging. If management tools allow it, you should also prevent the disabling of the host-based firewall. This can be done with Microsoft Windows machines when administered using Active Directory, as an example. A critical part of any security architecture is logging and alerting. It wouldn't do much good to have all these defenses in place if we have no idea if they're working or not. We need visibility into the security systems in place to see what kind of traffic they're seeing. We also need to have the visibility into the logs of all of our infrastructure devices and equipment that we manage. But it's not enough to just have logs. We also need ways to safeguard logs and make them easy to analyze and review. If there's a dedicated security team at your company, they would be performing this analysis. But at a smaller company, this responsibility would likely fall to the IT team. So let's make sure you're prepared with the skills you might need for incident investigation. Many investigative techniques can also be applied to troubleshooting. All systems and services running on hosts will create logs of some kind with different levels of detail. It depends on what it's logging and what events it's configured to log. So an authentication server would log every authentication attempt, whether it's successful or not. A firewall would log traffic that matches rules, with details like source and destination addresses and ports being used. All this logged information gives us details about the traffic and activity that's happening on our network and systems. This can be used to detect compromise or attempts to attack the system. When there are a large number of systems located around your network, each with their own log format, it can be challenging to make meaningful sense of all this data. This is where security information and event management systems, or SIEMs, come in. A SIEM can be thought of as a centralized log server. It has some extra analysis features, too. In the System Administration and IT Infrastructure course of this program, you learn ways that centralized logging can help you administer multiple machines at once. You can think of SIEM as a form of centralized logging for security administration purposes. A SIEM system gets logs from a bunch of other systems. It consolidates the logs from all different places and places it in one centralized location. This makes handling logs a lot easier. As an IT support specialist, an important step you'll take in logs analysis is normalization. This is the process of taking log data in different formats and converting it into a standardized format that's consistent with a defined log structure. As an IT support specialist, you might configure normalization for your log sources. For example, log entries from our firewall may have a timestamp using a year, month, and day format, while logs from our client machines may use day, month, year format. To normalize this data, you choose one standard date format. Then, you define what the fields are for the log types that need to be converted. When logs are received from these machines, the log entries are converted into the standard that we defined and stored by the logging server. This lets you analyze and compare log data between different log types and systems in a much easier fashion. So what type of information should you be logging? Well, that's a great question. If you log too much info, it's difficult to analyze the data and find useful information. Plus, storage requirements for saving the logs become expensive very quickly. But if you log too little, then the information won't provide any useful insights into your systems and network. Finding that middle ground can be difficult. It will vary depending on the unique characteristics of the systems being monitored and the type of activity on the network. 
No matter what events are logged, all of them should have information that will help understand what happened and reconstruct the events. There are lots of important fields to capture in log entries, like timestamp, the event or error code, the service or application being logged, the user or system account associated with the event, and the devices involved in the event. Timestamps are super important to understanding when an event occurred. Fields like source and destination addresses will tell us who was talking to whom. For application logs, you can grab useful information from the logged in user associated with the event and from what client they used. On top of the analysis assistance it provides, a centralized log server also has security benefits. By maintaining logs on a dedicated system, it's easier to secure this system from attack. Logs are usually targeted by attackers after a breach so that they can cover their tracks. By having critical systems send logs to a remote logging server that's locked down, the details of a breach should still be logged. A forensics team will be able to reconstruct the events that led to the compromise. Once we have logging configured and the relevant events recorded on a centralized log server, what do we do with all the data? Well, analyzing log details depends on what you're trying to achieve. Typically, when you look at aggregated logs as an IT support specialist, you should pay attention to patterns and connections between traffic. So if you're seeing a large percentage of Windows hosts all connecting to specific address outside your network, that might be worth investigating. It could signal a malware infection. Once logs are centralized and standardized, you can write automated alerting based on rules. Maybe you'll want to define an alert rule for repeated unsuccessful attempts to authenticate to a critical authentication server. Lots of SIEM solutions also offer handy dashboards to help analysts visualize this data. Having data in a visual format can potentially provide more insight. You can also write some of your own monitoring and alert systems. Now, it doesn't matter if you're using a SIEM solution or writing your own. It can be useful to break down things like commonly used protocols in the network, quickly see the top talkers in the network, and view reported errors over time to reveal patterns. Speaking of top talkers, I have just one more thing to call out, but we'll take a break before the next video. Another important component to logging to keep in mind as an IT support specialist is retention. Your log storage needs will vary based on the amount of systems being logged, the amount of detail logged, and the rate at which logs are created. How long you want or need to keep logs around will also really influence the storage requirements for a log server. Some examples of logging servers and SIEM solutions are the open source R syslog, Splunk Enterprise Security, IBM Security Q Radar, and RSA Security Analytics. You can learn more about these solutions in the supplementary readings of this lesson. OK, break time. I'll see you at the top of the next video on anti-malware protection. Anti-malware defenses are a core part of any company's security model in this day and age. So it's important as an IT support specialist to know what's out there. Today, the internet is full of bots, viruses, worms, and other automated attacks. Lots of unprotected systems would be compromised in a matter of minutes if directly connected to the internet without any safeguards or protections in place. And they need to have critical system updates. While modern operating systems have reduced this threat vector by having basic firewalls enabled by default, there's still a huge amount of attack traffic on the internet. Anti-malware measures play a super important role in keeping this type of attack off your systems and helping to protect your users. Antivirus software has been around for a really long time, but some security experts question the value it can provide to a company especially since more sophisticated malware and attacks have been spun up in recent years. Antivirus software is signature-based. This means that it has a database of signatures that identify known malware, like the unique file hash of a malicious binary, or the file associated with an infection. Or it could be the network traffic characteristics that malware uses to communicate with a command and control server. Antivirus software will monitor and analyze things like new files being created or being modified on the system in order to watch for any behavior that matches a known malware signature. 
If it detects activity that matches the signature, depending on the signature type, it will attempt to block the malware from harming the system. But some signatures might only be able to detect the malware after the infection has occurred. In that case, it may attempt to quarantine the infected files. If that's not possible, it'll just log and alert the detection event. At a high level, this is how all antivirus products work. There are two issues with antivirus software, though. The first is that they depend on antivirus signatures distributed by the antivirus software vendor. The second is that they depend on the antivirus vendor discovering new malware and writing new signatures for newly discovered threats. Until the vendor is able to write new signatures and publish and disseminate them, your antivirus software can't protect you from these emerging threats. Boo! Antivirus, which is designed to protect systems, actually represents an additional attack surface that attackers can exploit. You might be thinking, wait, our own antivirus tools can be another threat to our system? What's the deal with that? Well, this is because of the very nature of what an antivirus engine must do. It takes arbitrary and potentially malicious binaries as input and performs various operations on them. Because of this, there are a lot of complex code where very serious bugs could exist. Exactly this kind of vulnerability was found in the Sophos antivirus engine back in 2012. You can read more about this event in the supplementary readings. So it sounds like antivirus software isn't ideal and has some pretty large drawbacks. Then why are we still recommending it as a core piece of security design? The short answer is this. It protects against the most common attacks out there on the internet. The really obvious stuff that still poses a threat to your systems still needs to be defended against. Antivirus is an easy solution to provide that protection. It doesn't matter how much user education you instill in your employees. There will still be some folks who will click on an email that has an infected attachment. A good way to think about antivirus in today's very noisy external threat environment is like a filter for the attack noise on the internet today. It lets you remove the background noise and focus on the more important targeted or specific threats. Remember, our defense in depth concept involves multiple layers of protection. Antivirus software is just one piece of our anti-malware defenses. If antivirus can't protect us from the threats we don't know about, how do we protect against the unknown threats out there? Well, antivirus operates on a blacklist model, checking against a list of known bad things and blocking what gets matched. There's a class of anti-malware software that does the opposite. Binary whitelisting software operates off a whitelist. It's a list of known good and trusted software, and only things that are on the list are permitted to run. Everything else is blocked. You can think of this as applying the implicit deny ACL rule to software execution. By default, everything is blocked. Only things explicitly allowed to execute are able to. I should call out that this typically only applies to executable binaries, not arbitrary files like PDF documents or text files. This would naturally defend against any unknown threats, but at the cost of convenience. Think about how frequently you download and install new software on your machine. Now, imagine if you had to get approval before you could download and install any new software. That would be really annoying, don't you think? Now, imagine that every system update had to be whitelisted before it could be applied. Obviously, not trusting everything wouldn't be very sustainable. It's for this reason that binary whitelisting software can trust software using a couple different mechanisms. The first is using the unique cryptographic hash of binaries which are used to identify unique binaries. This is used to whitelist individual executables. The other trust mechanism is a software signing certificate. Remember back when we discussed public key cryptography and signatures using public and private key pairs? Software signing, or code signing, is the same idea, but applied to software. A software vendor can cryptographically sign binaries they distribute using a private key. The signature can be verified at execution time by checking the signature using the public key embedded in the certificate and verifying the trust chain of the public key. If the hash matches and the public key is trusted, then the software can be verified that it came from someone with the software vendor's code signing private key. Binary whitelisting systems can be configured to trust specific vendor's code signing certificates. 
they permit all binary signed with that certificate to run. This is helpful for automatically trusting content, like system updates, along with software in common use that comes from reputable and trusted vendors. But can you guess the downside here? Each new code signing certificate that's trusted represents an increase in attack surface. An attacker could compromise the code signing certificate of a software vendor that your company trusts and use that to sign malware that targets your company. That would bypass any binary whitelisting defenses in place. Not good. This exact scenario happened back in 2013 to Bit9, a binary whitelisting software company. Hackers managed to breach their internal network and found an unsecured virtual machine. It had a copy of the code signing certificate's private key. They stole that key and used it to sign malware that would have been trusted by all Bit9 software installations by default. We briefly discussed disk encryption earlier when we talked about encryption at a high level. Now it's time to dive deeper. Full disk encryption, or FDE, is an important factor in a defense in depth security model. It provides protection from some physical forms of attack. As an IT support specialist, you likely assist with implementing an FDE solution if one doesn't exist already, help with migrating between FDE solutions, and troubleshoot issues with FDE systems like helping with forgotten passwords. So FDE is key. Systems with their entire hard drives encrypted are resilient against data theft. They'll prevent an attacker from stealing potentially confidential information from a hard drive that's been stolen or lost. Without also knowing the encryption password or having access to the encryption key, the data on the hard drive is just meaningless gibberish. This is a very important security mechanism to deploy for more mobile devices, like laptops, cell phones, and tablets. But it's also recommended for desktops and servers, too, since disk encryption not only provides confidentiality, but also integrity. This means that an attacker with physical access to a system can't replace system files with malicious ones or install malware. Having the disk fully encrypted protects from data theft and unauthorized tampering, even if an attacker has physical access to the disk. But in order for a system to boot if it has an FDE setup, there are some critical files that must be accessible. They need to be available before the primary disk can be unlocked and the boot process can continue. Because of this, all FDE setups have an unencrypted partition on the disk which holds these critical boot files. Examples include things like the kernel and bootloader, that are critical to booting the operating system. These files are actually vulnerable to being replaced with modified, potentially malicious files by an attacker with physical access. While it's possible to compromise a machine this way, it would take a sophisticated and determined attacker to do it. There's also protection against this attack in the form of the Secure Boot Protocol, which is part of the UEFI specification. Secure Boot uses public key cryptography to secure these encrypted elements of the boot process. It does this by integrated code signing and verification of the boot files. Initially, Secure Boot is configured with what's called a platform key, which is the public key corresponding to the private key used to sign the boot files. This platform key is written to firmware and is used at boot time to verify the signature of the boot files. Only files correctly signed and trusted will be allowed to execute. This way, a secure boot protects against physical tampering with the unencrypted boot partition. There are first-party full disk encryption solutions from Microsoft and Apple, called BitLocker and FileVault 2, respectively. There are also a bunch of third-party and open-source solutions. On Linux, the dmcrypt package is super popular. There are also solutions from PGP, TrueCrypt, Veracrypt, and lots of others. Check out the supplementary readings for a detailed list of FDE tools. Just pick your poison, or antidote, I should say. Full disk encryption schemes rely on a secret key for actual encryption and decryption operations. They typically password protect access to this key, and in some cases, the actual encryption key is used to derive a user key, which is then used to encrypt the master key. If the encryption key needs to be changed, the user key can be swapped out, 
without requiring a full decryption and re-encryption of the data being protected. This would be necessary if the master encryption key needs to be changed. Password protecting the key works by requiring the user enter a passphrase to unlock the encryption key. It can then be used to access the protected contents on the disk. In many cases, this might be the same as the user account password to keep things simple and to reduce the number of passwords to memorize. When you implement a full disk encryption solution at scale, it's super important to think about how to handle cases where passwords are forgotten. This is another convenience trade-off when using FDE. If the passphrase is forgotten, then the contents of the disk aren't recoverable. Yikes! This is why lots of enterprise disk encryption solutions have a key escrow functionality. Key escrow allows the encryption key to be securely stored for later retrieval by an authorized party. So if someone forgets the passphrase to unlock their encrypted disk for their laptop, the system's administrators are able to retrieve the escrow key or recovery passphrase to unlock the disk. It's usually a separate key or passphrase that can unlock the disk in addition to the user-defined one. This allows for recovery if a password is forgotten. The recovery key is used to unlock the disk and boot the system fully. You should compare full disk encryption against file-based encryption. That's where only some files or folders are encrypted and not the entire disk. This is usually implemented as home directory encryption. It serves a slightly different purpose compared to FDE. Home directory or file-based encryption only guarantees confidentiality and integrity of files protected by encryption. These setups usually don't encrypt system files because there are often compromises between security and usability. When the whole disk isn't encrypted, it's possible to remotely reboot a machine without being locked out. If you reboot a full disk encrypted machine, the disk unlock password must be entered before the machine finishes booting and is reachable over the network again. So while file-based encryption is a little more convenient, it's less protected against physical attacks. An attacker could modify or replace core system files and compromise the machine to gain access to the encrypted data. This is a good example of why understanding threats and the risks these threats represent is an important part in designing a security architecture and choosing the right defenses. In our next lesson, we'll cover application hardening. I'll see you there. While some parts of software features are exposed, a lot of attacks depend on exploiting bugs in software. This triggers obscure and unintended behavior, which can lead to a compromise of the system running the vulnerable software. These types of vulnerabilities can be fixed through software patches and updates, which correct the bugs that the attackers exploit. As an IT support specialist, it's critical that you make sure that you install software updates and security patches in a timely way in order to defend your company's systems and networks. Software updates don't just improve software products by adding new features and improving performance and stability. They also address security vulnerabilities. There are some software bugs that are present in the core functionality of the software in question. This means that the vulnerability can't be mitigated by disabling the vulnerable service. Not good. An example of this was the Heartbleed vulnerability a bug in the open source TLS library OpenSSL. This was discovered and widely publicized in April of 2014. The bug showed up in how the library handled TLS heartbeat messages. they are special messages that allow one party in a TLS session to signal to the other party that they'd like the session to be kept alive. This works by sending a TLS heartbeat request message, a packet that has a text string and the length of the string. The receiving end is supposed to reply with the same text string in response. So, if the heartbeat request message contains the text, I'm still alive, and the length of 15, the receiving end would reply back with the same text, I'm still alive. But, the bug in the OpenSSL library was that the replying side would allocate memory space according to the value in the received packet. This was based on the specified length of the string, like it's defined in the packet not based on the actual length of the string. The value was not verified. This meant 
that an attacker could send a malformed heartbeat request message with a much larger length specified than what was allowed. The reply would contain the original text message, but would also include bits of memory from the replying system. So, an attacker could send a malformed heartbeat request message containing the text, I'm still alive, but with a length of 500. Because the length value wasn't verified, this means that the response back would be, I'm still alive, followed by the next 485 characters in memory. So it was possible for an attacker to read up to 64 kilobytes of a target's memory. This memory was likely used before by OpenSSL Library, so it might contain sensitive information regarding other TLS sessions. This bug meant that it was feasible for an attacker to recover the private keys used to protect TLS sessions. This would allow them to decrypt TLS-protected sessions and recover details, like login credentials. This is a great example of a mistake in the code leading to a very high-profile software vulnerability. It could only be fixed through a software update or switching to a different TLS library entirely. While the heartbeat functionality is enabled by default, it's possible to disable it in the OpenSSL library. But it wasn't a simple argument to pass to an application. Disabling this functionality required compiling the library with a flag that was specified to disable heartbeats. Then you had to replace the installed version with the custom compiled one. That's not something most people will do. This was also a library widely used by both server applications and client applications. This means that it might not be possible to replace the OpenSSL library with a customized version or a different library. The only way to address the vulnerability in client software that implemented OpenSSL was to wait for a patch from the software vendor. What a mess. Here's the bad news. With software continuing to grow more complex over time, these types of bugs are likely to become more commonplace. Attackers will be looking for exactly this type of vulnerability. The best protection is to have a good system and policy in place for your company. The system should be checking for, distributing, and verifying software updates for software deployment. This is a complex problem when considering a large organization with many machines to manage that run a variety of software products. This is where management tools can help make this task more approachable for you. Solutions like Microsoft's SCCM or Puppet Lab's Puppet and Factor tools allow administrators to get an overview of what software is installed across their fleet of managed systems. This lets a security team analyze what specific software and versions are installed to better understand the risk of vulnerable software in the fleet. When updates are released and pushed to the fleet, these reporting tools can help make sure that the updates have been applied. SCCM even has the ability to force install updates after a specified deadline is passed. Patching isn't just necessary for software, but also operating systems and firmware that run on infrastructure devices. Every device has code running on it that might have software bugs that could lead to security vulnerabilities, from routers, switches, phones, even printers. Operating system vendors usually push security-related patches pretty quickly when an issue is discovered. They'll usually release security fixes out of cycle from typical OS upgrades to ensure a timely fix because of the security implications. But for embedded devices like networking equipment or printers, this might not be typical. Critical infrastructure devices should be approached carefully when you apply updates. There's always the risk that a software update will introduce a new bug that might affect the functionality of a device, or if the update process itself would go wrong and cause an outage. I hope you can see the importance of applying software patches and firmware updates in a timely fashion. It would be pretty embarrassing if you wind up being compromised by a vulnerability that could have been easily fixed with a software update. As you can see, application software can represent a pretty large attack surface. This is especially true when it comes to a large fleet of systems used throughout an organization. So it's important to have some kind of application policies in place. These policies serve two purposes. Not only do they define boundaries of what applications are permitted or not, but they also help educate folks on how to use software more securely. 
we've seen the risks that software can pose because of security vulnerabilities. It makes sense to have a policy around applying software updates in a timely way. A common recommendation, or even a requirement, is to only support or require the latest version of a piece of software. From the IT support perspective, this is important because software updates would often fix issues that someone may be encountering. But from the security side of things, making sure the latest version of the software will ensure that all security patches have been applied and the most secure version is in use. This should be clearly called out in a policy. People tend to be pretty lazy about applying updates to software that they use a lot. Lots of times, applying an update requires restarting the application, which can feel inconvenient and disruptive to users. It's generally a good idea to disallow risky classes of software by policy. Things like file sharing software and piracy related software tend to be closely associated with malware infections. They usually don't have a business use either. Let's not even talk about the legal implications of this type of software. Understanding what your users need to do their jobs will help shape your approach to software policies and guidelines. If there's a common use case for a certain type of software, it would be helpful to select a specific software implementation and require the use of that solution. This lets you evaluate the most secure solution and benefit from a more uniform software installation. Remember, the name of the game is to minimize attack surfaces. Each piece of software that accomplishes the same thing represents a different set of potential attack surfaces that could have a vulnerability lurking inside. Helping your users accomplish tasks by recommending or supporting specific software makes for a more secure environment. It also helps users by giving them clear solutions to accomplish tasks. If you want to employ a binary whitelisting solution, it's also important to define a policy around what type of software can be whitelisted. So it's probably unnecessary to have video games whitelisted, unless your company is a video game studio, of course. These policies usually require some kind of business use case or justification to avoid a lot of one-off personal software requests. Another class of software that you might want to have policies defined for are browser extensions or add-ons. Since a lot of workflows live exclusively within the web browser now, they represent a potential vector for malware that often gets overlooked. Extensions that require full access to websites visited can be risky, since the extension developer has the power to modify pages visited. Some extensions may even send user input to a remote server. This could potentially leak confidential information. Clearly defining classifications of risky extensions and add-ons will help protect your systems and provide guidance to your users. But policies are usually not enough to arm users with the information they need to make informed choices. Their decisions can impact the security of your organization. That's where education and training comes into play, which we'll discuss in the next module. We went over a lot of really dense information on security in these lessons. Take time to review some of the videos so that it really sinks in. OK, awesome work. Now, it's time for a project that will test what you've learned about the system hardening. Then, if you can believe it, you'll move on to the last lesson of the last course of this program. Woohoo! Congratulations! You've reached the last chunk of the last course of this program. You are totally ready to lock down every single operation of your organization and make it airtight, right? Not quite. If you're responsible for an organization of users, there's a delicate balance between security and user productivity. We've seen this balance in action when we dove into the different security tools and systems together. Before you start to design a security architecture, you need to define exactly what you like it to accomplish. This will depend on what your company thinks is most important. It will probably have a way it wants different data to be handled and stored. You also need to know if your company has any legal requirements when it comes to security. If your company handles credit card payments, then you have to follow the PCI DSS, or Payment Card Industry Data Security Standard, depending on local laws. We'll take a closer look at PCI DSS, which is a great example of clearly defined security goals. 
PCI DSS is broken into six broad objectives, each with some requirements. The first objective is to build and maintain a secure network and systems. This includes the requirements to install and maintain a firewall configuration to protect cardholder data, and to not use vendor supply defaults for system passwords and other security parameters. As you can tell, the requirements are related to the objective. The objective is the end goal, or what we'd like to achieve, and the requirements are the actions that can help achieve that goal. PCI DSS goes into more detailed actions for each requirement. It provides more specific guidance around what a firewall configuration should control. For example, a secure firewall configuration should restrict connections between untrusted networks and any systems in the cardholder data environment. That's a little generic, but it does give us some guidance on how to meet the requirements. The second objective category is to protect cardholder data. In this objective, the first requirement is to protect stored cardholder data. The second is to encrypt the transmission of cardholder data across open public networks. I want to call out again how the broad objective is to protect sensitive data that's stored in systems within our control. The requirements give us specific guidelines on how to get this done. The specifics of these requirements help clarify some of the points, like what constitutes an open network. They also recommend using strong cryptography and offer some examples. But not all requirements are technical in nature. Let's look at the requirement to protect stored cardholder data, for example. It has requirements for data retention policies to make sure that sensitive payment information isn't stored beyond the time it's required. Once payment is authorized, authentication data shouldn't be needed anymore, and it should be securely deleted. This highlights the fact that good security defenses aren't just technical in nature. They're also procedural and policy-based. The third objective is to maintain a vulnerability management program. The first requirement is to protect all systems against malware and regularly update antivirus software or programs. The second is to develop and maintain secure systems and applications. You'll find more detailed implementation procedures within these requirements. They'll cover things like ensuring all systems have antivirus software installed and making sure this software is kept up to date. They also require that scans are run regularly and logs are maintained. There are also requirements for ensuring systems and software are protected against known vulnerabilities by applying security patches at least one month from the release of a security patch. Use of third-party security vulnerability databases is also listed to help identify known vulnerabilities within managed systems. The fourth objective is to implement strong access control measures. This objective has three requirements. The first is to restrict access to cardholder data by business need to know. The second is to identify and authenticate access to system components. And the third is to restrict physical access to cardholder data. This highlights the importance of good access control measures, along with good data access policies. The first objective, restricting access to data by business need to know, means that any sensitive data should be directed to data access policies to make sure that customer data isn't misused. Part of this requirement is to enforce password authentication for system access and two-factor authentication for remote access. That's the minimum requirement. Another important piece highlighted by the PCI DSS requirements is access control for physical access. This is a critical security aspect to keep in mind since we need to protect systems and data from both physical theft and virtual attacks. The fifth objective is to regularly monitor and test networks. The first requirement is to track and monitor all access to network resources and cardholder data. The second is to regularly test security systems and processes. The requirement for network monitoring and testing is another essential part of a good security plan. This refers to things like setting up and configuring intrusion detection systems and conducting vulnerability scans of the network, which we'll cover a bit more later. Testing defenses is another super important part of this. Just having the systems in place isn't enough. It's really helpful to test defense systems regularly to make sure that they provide the protection that you want. It also ensures that the alerting systems are functional. 
But don't worry, we'll dive deeper into this a little bit later when we cover penetration testing. The sixth and final objective is to maintain an information security policy. It only has one requirement, to maintain a policy that addresses information security for all personnel. This requirement addresses why we need to have well-established security policies. They help govern and regulate user behavior when it comes to information security aspects. It's important to call out that this requirement mentions that the policy should be for all personnel. The responsibility of information security isn't only on the security teams. Every member of an organization is responsible for information security. Well-designed security policies address the most common questions or use cases that users would have based on the specific details of the organization. Everyone that uses systems on your organization's network is able to get around security. They might not mean to, but they can reduce the overall security with their actions and practices. That's why having well thought out security policies in place also need to be easy to find and easy to read. We'll cover more details about user education and getting users involved in the overall security plan in another upcoming video of this course. We've covered security risk assessment a little bit in the last lesson, but there's lots more to talk about. Security is all about determining risks or exposure, understanding the likelihood of attacks, and designing defenses around these risks to minimize the impact of an attack. This thought process is actually something that everyone uses in their daily life, whether they know it or not. Think of when you cross a busy intersection, you assess the probability of being hit by an oncoming car, and minimize that risk by choosing the right time to cross the road. Security risk assessment starts with threat modeling. First, we identify likely threats to our systems. Then, we assign them priorities that correspond to severity and probability. We do this by brainstorming from the perspective of an outside attacker, putting ourselves in a hacker's shoes. It helps to start by figuring out what high-value targets an attacker may want to go after. From there, you can start to look at possible attack vectors that could be used to gain access to high-value assets. High-value data usually includes account information like usernames and passwords. Typically, any kind of user data is considered high-value, especially if payment processing is involved. Another part of risk measurement is understanding what vulnerabilities are on your systems and network. One way to find these out is to perform regular vulnerability scanning. There are lots of open source and commercial solutions that you can use. They can be configured to perform scheduled, automated scans of designated systems or networks to look for vulnerabilities. Then they generate a report. Some of these tools are Nessus, OpenVOS, and Qualys, which I've linked to in the next reading. Let me break down what vulnerability scanners do. Heads up, this might be a little dense, so feel free to go over it again. Vulnerability scanners are services that run on your system within your control that conduct periodic scans of configured networks. The service then conducts scans to find and discover hosts on the network. Once hosts are found, either through a ping sweep or port scanning, more detailed scans are run against discovered hosts. Scans upon scans upon scans. A port scan of either common ports or all possible valid ports is conducted against discovered hosts to determine what services are listening. These services are then probed to try to discover more info about the type of service and what version is listening on the relevant port. This information can then be checked against databases of known vulnerabilities. If a vulnerable version of a service is discovered, the scanner will add it to its report. Once the scan is finished, the discovered vulnerabilities and hosts are compiled in a report. That way, an analyst can quickly and easily see where the problem areas are on the network. Found vulnerabilities are prioritized according to severity and other categorization. Severity takes into account a number of things, like how likely the vulnerability is to be exploited. It also considers the type of access the vulnerability would provide to an attacker and whether or not it can be exploited remotely or not. Vulnerabilities in the report will have links to detailed and disclosed information about the vulnerability. In some cases, it will also have recommendations on how to get rid of it. 
Vulnerability scanners will detect lots of things, ranging from misconfigured services that represent potential risks to detecting the presence of backdoors in systems. It's important to call out that vulnerability scanning can only detect known and disclosed vulnerabilities and insecure configurations. That's why it's important for you to have an automated vulnerability scan conducted regularly. You'll also need to keep the vulnerability database up to date to make sure new vulnerabilities are detected quickly. But vulnerability scanning isn't the only way to put your defenses to the test. Conducting regular penetration tests is also really encouraged to test your defenses even more. These tests will also ensure detection and alerting systems are working properly. Penetration testing is the practice of attempting to break into a system or network to verify the systems in place. Think of this as playing the role of a bad guy for educational purposes. This exercise isn't designed to see if you have the acting chops. It's intended to make you think like an attacker and use the same tools and techniques they would use. This way, you can test your systems to make sure they protect you like they're supposed to. The results of the penetration testing reports will also show you where weak points or blind spots exist. These tests help improve defenses and guide future security projects. They can be conducted by members of your in-house security team. If your internal team doesn't have the resources for this exercise, you can hire a third-party company that offers penetration testing as a service. You can even do both. That would help give you more perspectives on your defense systems, and you'll get a more comprehensive test this way. When you're supporting systems that handle customer data, it's super important to protect it from unauthorized and inappropriate access. It's not just to defend against external threats. It also protects the data against misuse by employees. This type of behavior would fall under your company's privacy policies. Privacy policies oversee the access and use of sensitive data. They also define what appropriate and authorized use is and what provisions or restrictions are in place when it comes to how the data is used. Keep in mind that people might not consider the security implications of their actions. So both privacy and data access policies are important to guiding and informing people how to maintain security while handling sensitive data. Having defined and well-established privacy policies is an important part of good privacy practices. But you also need a way to enforce these policies. Periodic audits on cases where sensitive data was accessed can get you there. This was enabled by our logging and monitoring systems. Auditing data access logs is super important. It helps us ensure that sensitive data is only accessed by people who are authorized to access it and that they use it for the right reasons. It's good practice to apply the principle of least privilege here by not allowing access to this type of data by default you should require anyone that needs access to first make an access request with a justification for getting the data. But it can't just be vague or a generic request for access. They should be required to specify what data they need access to. Usually, this type of request would also have a time limit that should be called out in the request. That way, you can ensure that data access is only permitted for legitimate business reasons, which reduces the likelihood of inappropriate data access or usage. By logging each data access request and actual data access, we can also correlate requests with usage. Any access that doesn't have a corresponding request should be flagged as a high priority potential breach that needs to be investigated as soon as possible. Company policies act as our guidelines and informational resources on how and how not to access and handle data. They're equally important here. Policies will range from sensitive data handling to public communications. Data handling policies should cover the details of how different data is classified. What makes some data sensitive as opposed to non-sensitive? What's considered confidential data? Well, once different data classes are defined, you should create guidelines around how to handle these different types of data. If something is considered sensitive or confidential, you'd probably have stipulations that this data shouldn't be stored on media that's easily lost or stolen, like USB sticks or portable hard drives. They're also commonly used without any encryption at all. Imagine if one of your employees lost an unencrypted portable hard drive full of customer information. Disaster. That's exactly the situation a data access policy tries to avoid. 
it might also make sense to include laptops and mobile devices, like phones and tablets, in the removable media classification, since these devices are easily lost or stolen. Even though they're more commonly encrypted these days, the loss and theft rate is much higher. You may not like users storing sensitive data on removable media, but sometimes you're out of luck. There may be an occasion where that's the only solution to accomplish a task. If this is the case, it would help to have recommendations on how to handle this situation in a secure way. So you could offer an appropriate encryption solution and provide instructions and support on its use. You've got to involve your users when it comes to security. It's super important and might seem obvious, but it's usually overlooked. You can build the world's best security systems, but they won't protect you if the users are going to be practicing unsafe security. If a user writes their password on a Post-it note, sticks it to their laptop, then leaves the laptop unlocked and unattended at a cafe, you could have a disaster on your hands. But making sure that your users take reasonable security precautions takes effort and can be really tricky. You have to make sure your users' habits and actions involve having clear and reasonable security policies. But there's more that you can do to help ensure that your users are diligent about maintaining security. Let's assume that your employees are acting with good intent and that leaks and disclosures are unintentional and mostly due to improper handling of sensitive data. Leaks and disclosures can be avoided by understanding what employees need to do to accomplish their jobs. You also need to make sure that they have the right tools to get their work done without compromising security. If an employee needs to share a confidential file with an external partner and it's too big to email, they may want to upload it to a third-party file sharing website that they have a personal account with. This is risky business. You should never upload confidential information onto a third-party service that hasn't been evaluated by your company. If sharing big files with external parties is common behavior for your employees, it's best to find a solution that meets the needs of your users and the security guidelines. By providing a sanctioned and approved mechanism for this file sharing activity, users are less likely to expose the organization to unnecessary risk. We covered password security when we discussed password authentication earlier, but there's more to talk about when it comes to users and passwords. I hate to say it, but generally speaking, users can be lazy about security stuff. They don't like to memorize long, complicated passwords, but this is super important to keeping your company safe. So how do we resolve this conflict? If we require 20 character passwords that have to be changed every three months, our users will almost definitely write them down. This compromises the security that our complex password policy is supposed to provide. It's important to understand what threats password policies are supposed to protect against. That way, you can try to find a better balance between security and usability. A long and complex password requirement is designed to protect against brute force attacks, either against authentication systems or if a hashed password database is stolen. Since direct brute force attacks against authentication infrastructure should be easily detected and blocked by intrusion prevention systems, they can be considered pretty low risk. But the theft of a password database would be a super serious breach. We do have lots of additional layers of security in place to prevent a critical compromise like that from happening in the first place. So the two attacks that complex passwords are primarily designed to protect against are fairly low risk. Now, we can relax the password requirements a bit and not ask for overly long passwords. We can even adjust the mandatory password rotation time period Password reuse is another common user behavior. People don't want a bunch of passwords to memorize. Lots of users find it easier to use the same password for both their personal email account and their work account. But this undermines the security of their work password. If an online service is compromised and the password database is leaked, they're in trouble. The passwords in that database will find their way into password files used for cracking passwords and brute force attacks. Once a password isn't a secret, it shouldn't be used anymore. The chances of a bad actor being able to use the password are too high. That's why it's important to make sure employees use new and unique passwords and don't reuse them from other services. It's also important to have a password change system check against old passwords. 
This will prevent users from changing their password back to a previously used, potentially compromised password. A much greater risk in the workplace that users should be educated on is credential theft from phishing emails. Phishing emails are pretty effective. They take advantage of people's inclination to open emails without looking at them too closely. If an email that seems authentic actually leads to a fake login page, users can blindly enter their credentials into the fake site and disclose their credentials to an attacker. While having two-factor authentication helps protect against this type of attack, OTP-based two-factor solutions would still provide usable credentials to an attacker. Plus, the attacker still has a password, which is really not good, even in a two-factor environment. If someone entered their password into a phishing site or even suspects they did, it's important to change their password as soon as possible. If you can, your organization should try to detect these types of password disclosures using tools like Password Alert, which I've linked to in the next reading. This is a Chrome extension from Google that can detect when you enter your password into a site that's not a Google page. Being able to detect when a password is entered into a potentially untrustworthy site lets an organization detect potential phishing compromises. But you can also combat phishing attacks with good spam filtering combined with good user education. You can help influence good user behavior by offering security training, which we'll discuss in another video. Next up, we'll do a quick rundown of the benefits and trade-offs of third-party security. I'll see you there. Sometimes, you need to rely on third-party solutions or service providers because you might not be able to do everything in-house. This is especially true if you work as an IT support specialist in a small shop. In some cases, you'll have to trust that third party with a lot of potentially sensitive data or access. So how do you make sure that you aren't opening yourself up to a ton of unnecessary risk? When you contract services from a third party, you're trusting them to protect your data and any credentials involved. If they have subpar security, you're undermining your security defenses by potentially opening a new avenue of attack. It's important to hire trustworthy and reputable vendors whenever you can. You also need to manage the engagements in a controlled way. This involves conducting a vendor risk review or security assessment. In typical vendor security assessments, you ask vendors to complete a questionnaire that covers different aspects of their security policies, procedures, and defenses. The questionnaire is designed to determine whether or not they've implemented good security designs in their organization. For software services or hardware vendors, you might also ask to test the software or hardware. That way, you can evaluate it for potential security vulnerabilities or concerns before deciding to contract their services. It's important to understand how well protected your business partners are before deciding to work with them. If they have poor security practices, your organization's security could be at risk. If you contract services from a company that will be handling data on your behalf, the security of your data is in the hands of this third party, it's important to understand how safe your data will be with them. Sometimes, vendors will perform tasks for you, so they'll have access to your network and systems. In these cases, it's also important to understand how well secured the third party is. A compromise of their infrastructure could lead to a breach of your systems. While the questionnaire model is a quick way to assess a third party, it's not ideal. It depends on self-reporting of practices, which is pretty unreliable. Without a way to verify or prove what's stated in the questionnaire, you have to trust that the company is answering honestly. Why you'd hope that a company you're doing business with would be honest is best to verify. If you can, ask for a third-party security assessment report. Some of the information on the questionnaire can be verified, like third-party security audit results and penetration testing reports. In the case of third-party software, you might be able to conduct some basic vulnerability assessments and tests to ensure the product has some reasonable security. There are lots of companies that will evaluate vendors for you for a price, but Google recently made their vendor security assessment questionnaires available for free. I've provided a link to these questionnaires just after this video. This is a great starting point to design your own vendor security assessment questionnaire or you can just use these as is. 
If the third-party service involves the installation of any infrastructure equipment on site, pay close attention to how they're doing it. You have to make sure this equipment's managed in a way that doesn't negatively affect overall security. Let's say the vendor company requires remote access to the infrastructure device to perform maintenance. If that's the case, then make appropriate adjustments to firewall rules to restrict this access. That way, you'll make sure that it can't be used as an entry point into your network. Additional monitoring would also be recommended for this third-party device, since it represents a new potential attack surface in your network. If the vendor lets you, evaluate the hardware in a lab environment first. There, you can run in-depth vulnerability assessments and penetration testing of the hardware and make sure there aren't any obvious vulnerabilities in the product. Report your findings to the vendor and ask that they address any issues you discover. The more trained up you and your colleagues are on security, the better. It's impossible to have good security practices at your company if employees and users haven't received good trainings and resources. This will boost a healthy company culture and overall attitude towards security. A working environment that encourages people to speak up when they feel something isn't right is critical. It encourages them to do the right thing. To help create this context, it's important for employees to have a way that they can ask questions when they come up. This could be a mailing list where users can ask questions about security concerns or to report things they suspect are security risks. Having the designated communication channel where people can feel comfortable asking questions and getting clear answers back is super important. Helping others keep security in mind will help decrease the security burdens you'll have as an IT support specialist. It will also make the overall security of the organization better. Creating a culture that makes security a priority isn't easy. You have to reinforce and reward behaviors that boost the security of your organization. Think of the small things we do every day when we use our computers, just entering your password to log in or locking your screen when you walk away from your computer is helpful. Hopefully, you're careful about entering your password on websites and check the address of the site you're authenticating against. If you aren't, Try it out to avoid entering your password into a fake website. When you're working on your laptop in a public space, like a library or coffee shop, do you lock your screen when you leave to use the restroom or get another caffeine fix? If not, you absolutely should be. Hopefully you aren't leaving your computer unattended in public in the first place. That's a really bad idea. These are the types of small things that security training should address. You also need to justify why these are good behaviors to adopt. In some cases, the company culture can turn screen locking into a sort of game. When colleagues forget to lock their screen, other team members can play harmless pranks on them. The last time I forgot to lock my computer, my colleague changed the default language to Turkish. It reminded me to always lock my screen. Because anyone with access to the machine can impersonate you and get access to any resources you're logged into. But building a culture that embraces security principles isn't always enough. There are some things that all employees should know. This is when an occasional mandatory security training course can help. This could be a short video or informational presentation followed by a quiz to see if your employees understood the key concepts covered in the training. The quiz can also increase the chances of information being retained. Making employees retake the training every once a year or so ensures that everyone's up to date on their training. You can also cover new concepts or updated policies when needed. This type of training should cover the most common attack types and how to avoid falling victim to them. This includes things like phishing emails and best practices around password use. These trainings often include scenarios that can help test the user's understanding of a particular topic. Training courses like these are the last in the line of defenses that you and your company need to have in place to make sure that you're as safe as possible for as long as possible. We try our best to protect our systems and networks, but it's pretty likely that some sort of incident will happen. This could be anything from a full system compromise and data theft to someone accidentally leaking a memo. Regardless of the nature of the incident, 
proper incident handling is important to understanding what exactly happened and how it happened and how to avoid it from happening again. The very first step of handling an incident is to detect it in the first place. Hopefully, our intrusion detection systems caught the telltale signs of an ongoing attack and alerted us to the threat. Incidents can be brought to your attention in other ways too. An employee may have noticed something suspicious and reported it to the security team for investigation. Or maybe they leaked information that ended up in the news. However you found out about the incident, the next step is to analyze it and determine the effects and scope of damage. Was it a data leak or information disclosure? If so, what information got out? How bad is it? Were systems compromised? What systems? And what level of access did they manage to get? Is it a malware infection? What systems were infected? Some attacks are really obvious with very clear signs of an intrusion, like a defaced web page or unusual processes consuming all resources in the system. Others may be way more subtle and almost impossible to detect, like a small change to a single system configuration file. This is why having good monitoring in place is so important, along with understanding your baseline. Once you figure out what normal traffic looks like on your network and what services you expect to see, outliers will be easier to detect. This is important because every false lead that the incident response team has to investigate means time and resources wasted. This has the potential to allow real intrusions to go undetected and uninvestigated longer. During detection and scoping, correlating data from different systems can reveal a much bigger picture of what's happened. It might show how an intruder gained access. For example, you could see a connection event logged by the firewall from a suspicious IP address. Searching for other events related to this IP address may reveal login attempts in the authentication logs for a system. This would provide insight into where the attacker is coming from and what they attempted to do on the network. The authentication logs would also indicate whether or not they were able to successfully log into an account. If so, this lets you know what account is compromised. Once the scope of the incident is determined, the next step is containment. You need to contain the breach to prevent further damage. For system compromises and malware infection, this is a pretty time-sensitive step. You don't want the malware or attacker to use one compromised machine to pivot to other machines inside your network. This could broaden the incident scope and cause even more damage. Containment strategies will vary depending on the nature of the incident. If an account was compromised, change the password immediately. If the owner is unable to change the password right away, then lock the account. Also, revoke any long-lived authentication tokens, since the attacker may have one of those too. If it's a malware infection, can our anti-malware software quarantine or remove the infection? If not, the infected machine needs to be removed from the network as soon as possible to prevent lateral movement around the network. To do this, you can adjust network-based firewall rules to effectively quarantine the machine. You can also move the machine to a separate VLAN used for security quarantining purposes. This would be a VLAN with strict restrictions and filtering applied to prevent further infection of other systems and networks. It's important during this phase that efforts are made to avoid the destruction of any logs or forensic evidence. Attackers will usually try to cover their tracks by modifying logs and deleting files, especially when they suspect they've been caught. They'll take measures to make sure they keep their access to compromised systems. This could involve installing a backdoor or some kind of remote access malware. Another step to watch out for is creating a new user account that they can use to authenticate with in the future. With effective logging configurations and systems in place, these activities would show up in audit logs. So this type of access should be detected during an incident investigation. Then actions can be taken to remove access. I hope I'm not scaring you with all these scenarios, but it's better to be safe than sorry. Another part of incident analysis is determining severity, impact, and recoverability of the incident. Severity includes factors like what and how many systems were compromised and how the breach affects business functions. An incident that's compromised a bunch of machines in the network would be more severe than one where a single web server was hacked, for example. You can imagine that the effort required to fix a large-scale compromise would negatively affect the ability to do normal work. So the impact of an incident is also an important issue to consider. 
if the organization only had one web server and it was compromised, it might be considered a much higher severity breach. It would probably have a direct, externally visible impact on the business. Data exfiltration is the unauthorized transfer of data from a computer. It's also a very important concern when a security incident happens. Hackers may try to steal data for a number of reasons. They may want to steal account information to provide access later. They may target business data to publish online to cause financial loss or damage to the organization's reputation. In some cases, the attacker may just want to cause damage and destruction, which might involve deleting or corrupting data. What actions have been taken will affect the recoverability of the incident. The recoverability is how complicated and time-consuming the recovery effort will be. An incident that can be recovered with a simple restoration from backup by following documented procedures would be considered easily recovered from. But an incident where an attacker deleted large amounts of customer information and wrecked havoc across lots of critical infrastructure systems would be way more difficult to recover from. It might not be possible to recover from it at all. In some cases, depending on backup systems and configurations, some data may be lost forever and can't be restored. Backups won't contain any changes or new data that were made after the last backup run. Once a threat's been detected and contained, it has to be removed or remediated. When it comes to malware infection, this means removing the malware from affected systems. But in some cases, this may not be possible, so the affected systems have to be restored to a known good configuration. This can be done by rebuilding the machine or restoring from backup. Take care when removing malware from systems, because some malware is designed to be very persistent which means it's resistant to being removed. But before we can start the recovery, we have to contain the incident. This might involve shutting down affected systems to prevent further damage or spread of an infection. On the flip side of that, affected systems may just have network access removed to cut off any communication with the compromised system. Again, the motivating factor here would be to prevent the spread of any infection or to remove remote access to the system. The containment strategy varies depending on the nature of the affected system. Let's say a critical piece of networking infrastructure was compromised. A quick shutdown may not work since it would impact other business operations. On top of that, removing networking access might trigger fail-safes and attack software or malware. Let's say a piece of malware is designed to periodically check into a command and control server. Severing network communications with the infected host might cause the malware to trigger a self-destruct function in an attempt to destroy evidence. Forensic analysis may need to be done to analyze the attack. This is especially true when it comes to a malware infection. In the case of forensic analysis, affected machines might be investigated very closely to determine exactly what the attacker did. This is usually done by taking an image of the disk, essentially making a virtual copy of the hard drive. This lets the investigator analyze the contents of the disk without the risk of modifying or altering the original files. If that happened, it would compromise the integrity of any forensic evidence. Usually, evidence gathering is also part of the incident response process. This provides evidence to law enforcement if the organization wants to pursue legal action against the attackers. Forensic evidence is super useful for providing details of the attack to the security community. It allows other security teams to be aware of new threats and lets them better defend themselves. It's also very important that you get members from your legal team involved in any incident handling plans. Because an incident can have legal implications for the company, a lawyer should be available to consult and advise on the legal aspects of the investigation. It's crucial in order to avoid complications or issues of liability. Members of the public relations team should also get involved since these incidents can have an impact on a company's reputation. There's another part of the cleanup and recovery phase I should call out. We'll need to use information from the analysis to prevent any further intrusions or infections. First, we determine the entry point to figure out how the attacker got in or what vulnerability the malware exploited. This needs to be done at the same time as the cleanup. If you remove the malware infection without also addressing the underlying vulnerability, systems could become reinfected right after you clean them up. 
As you learned in the System Administration and IT Infrastructure Services course, postmortems can be a great way to document incidents. The learnings from postmortems can be used to prevent those incidents from happening again. If a critical system has been compromised, remediation can be complicated because of downtime during remediation and recovery. Logs have to be audited to determine exactly what the attacker did while they had access to the system. They'll also tell you what data the attacker accessed. Systems must be scrutinized to ensure no backdoors have been installed or malware planted on the system. Depending on the severity of the compromise or infection, it might be necessary to rebuild the system from the ground up. Cleanup would typically involve restoring from a backup point to a known good configuration. Infected or corrupted system files could be restored from known good copies. Sometimes, cleanup can be very simple and quick. I hope that's what you find more often than not. If a website was defaced, the attacker may have simply uploaded their defaced HTML file and pointed the web server at the new file. A configuration file change and deletion of the attacker's HTML file would undo those changes. Even so, efforts need to be made to determine how the attacker got access. That vulnerability should be closed to prevent any future attacks. When all traces of the attack have been removed and discovered, and the known vulnerabilities have been closed, you can move on to the last step. That's when systems need to be thoroughly tested to make sure proper functionality has been restored. Usually, affected systems would also remain under close watch, sometimes with additional detailed monitoring and logging enabled. This is to watch for any additional signs of an intrusion in case something was missed during the cleanup. It's also possible that the attacker will attempt to attack the same target again, there's a very high chance that they use the same or similar attack methodology on other targets in your network. It's important to incorporate the lessons you've learned from any incident into your overall security defenses. Update firewall rules and ACLs if an exposure was discovered in the course of the investigation. Create new definitions and rules for intrusion detection systems that can watch for the signs of the same attack again. Stay vigilant and prepared to protect your system from attacks. Remember that at some point, some sort of security breach will happen. Just stay calm and execute your plan to counterattack the breach.